speed. You'll be hooked from, I guarantee you, from the first couple of paragraphs. But the, the, the book is one of the greatest, most imaginative books of the uh, digital age. And so much that's in it has been appropriated in things like Ready Player One, the novel and the film. And, and it's, I, I cannot recommend that book highly enough. It's very, very interesting. Snow Crash, Neil Stevenson, everybody should read it. Big praise. Big. Um, I like um, One Fish, Two Fish, Red Fish, Blue Fish. <laughs> That's what I like. <laughs> Inspiration. Well, that has much more resonance in all of I our enjoy, lives. Well, yeah, I enjoy its more surrealist elements, honestly, but the variety as well as the subject matter. And I think that it has an educational value that, of course, everyone recognizes, but I think it sort of transcends the level that I think a lot of people... Uh, find it in um, and w once you move of course from one fish two fish to like um, fox and socks for more you know f for more advanced readers mm -hmm. you get a sense of appreciation of you know where you started it what's really to come next where you fox are now and socks that, um, it really was because you know fox typically challenge. you know you don't typically wear socks and so it bucks you know that sort of trend uh, it was very it's very very progressive for its time yeah uh, it, it was it, yeah it it's, really, it's like stravinsky and rite of spring it was very i mean we look places, back on it now yeah. and it's you know a great classic but at the time it was very divisive um, but is the british publisher uh rewriting it to make it more acceptable for today's audiences they're making it woke like, we why, why have, would uh, you even imply that a fox I'm not even sure wear socks? Yes, they're going, asking the question is you know will they even allow risque. him to wear socks in the new adaptation i don't i wouldn't even I, I doubt they would stop him. Seen as Not possible cruelty, apparently, by extremists. I don't know. I, I'd find it all ridiculous. I think a fox should be allowed to wear socks if that is his preference. Or I think her so too. preference. Yeah, uh, yeah and even if he doesn't support that sort of thing, you should be able to support his freedom to do that, to make that sort of choice. That's your thing. In any case, hello, everybody. Welcome to EFAP episode Hi, 229. I did get 229. That right, right. I screw that up a lot. <laughs> I'm like, oh no, I don't got the number right. Gosh. I'm just going to nod my head and say yes. Hell yeah, we're absolutely mm. on board. Um, yes. Today we're doing something a little bit different. Have we ever done a jump back to an older classic and talked about it on Eve? Uh, um, I feel that we have, but I can't we tell have, you which right? it was. Yeah, help us out. Have we ever done this? <laughs> like you guys might know. Chat, are um, we insane? Let us know. Easy. Someone said yes. Hmm. Yeah, maybe. Um. Yeah, we we decided we'd shake it up, do something a little bit different. You know, check out something. It's like an EFAP review episode. Yeah, kinda. I'm hoping we can uh, we can delve just as deep here as we would in the other thing. Misspelled world. Did I? I no, I'm not. We're not covering Jurassic World. No. <laughs> no, thank you. There may be no. some mention of the franchise. I can't imagine. Did you spell it like the rapper Juice World? Where no. you omit the O? Oh, world. Like like becoming Scottish or something. Um, would you rather go to Jurassic Park or would you rather go to Juice World? <laughs> um, Juice World, because I don't want to die. Well, I guess it depends on which Jurassic Park we're going to at what time. Well, the Jurassic World one falls apart too, so is there ever a functioning Jurassic Park? Like, well, that would be boring, so I'll be doing that. Uh, we are joined today by the wonderful Robert Meyer Burnett. Welcome to the... Uh, I have to say, first of all, Mahler, thank you for inviting me. And second of all, I've never been... I, I apparently have had a Discord account, which I sort of forgot about, but I've never, <laughs> I've never been on this uh, platform before. Well... So um, I, I'm... I'm I'm being, uh, what is Getting it? What you call it? I'm zone. a Discord virgin. I'm being de virginized by you gentlemen. It's a bit I don't of know chaos. what that says about me. We're injecting a little chaos on this stream, right? It's going to be relevant later. But, um, oh my God. Yeah, for those who are following like open bars, real BBCs here and there, uh, you'll know that me and Robert have had a couple of interactions in the past that I've always enjoyed talking to you about all kinds of movies, TV, culture, history, all that stuff. And I was thinking, well, like, I'm a, I'm a Mahler fanboy, to be ah. honest. I, uh -oh. I, I mean, I've, I've watched your videos at length. And actually, your video, you can't say you've watched your videos at length. To watch your videos is to enjoy the length, I guess yeah. I would say. I guess you'd have to. Um, and uh, no, I've, I, I find your analysis of storytelling uh, quite enlightening. And, I, you know, if, if I was teaching a, 
a college course on storytelling, which I've never done. But if I did, I would recommend people, especially those who are Star Wars fans, to watch your videos. As a matter of fact, I wouldn't even have to teach. I would just say, just watch Mahler's videos. There'll be a test on Friday. <laughs> That's incredibly high praise. Because <laughs> um, even I feel like uh, I, I miss out on a lot of aspects of filmmaking, which is part of why I enjoy having guests like yourself to um, bring in insights that I wouldn't even think to address, like a lot of the nature of the creation behind uh, each of these films or what the culture was like at the time, or what, uh, what the history of a lot of the creators are. These are all like super interesting to think about in, in terms of how we engage with a particular project. Because of course, for my, I would say my whole life, I've I've engaged with Jurassic Park strictly as a film series, but of course it's an adaptation and uh, there would have been all kinds of trials and tribulations to create, um, certainly the first one. I'm not gonna say there's no trials for creating the newest ones, but sometimes you wonder, at least in the script department, if they spent more than a day on it, you never They know. were found guilty of sucking Oof. Well, I don't know if you guys watched, it's on Disney Plus, but there is a great documentary on ILM, Industrial Light and Magic. Oh, yeah, and I've they, heard of it. They, they, it yeah. they get into um, the technology. I mean, it really, you have James Cameron to thank for pushing ILM um, in the late 80s when he was making The Abyss, the pseudopod sequence, the water probe that goes into the, the underwater drilling platform uh that led to the t-1000 and uh, judgment day and terminator 2 judgment day led to the ability to create the dinosaurs in uh jurassic park and it, it it's an astonishing um as far as if, if you're a fan of the evolution of visual effects you know the the very first character cg character in a movie full-on character was actually ilm did it in young Sherlock Holmes, there's a um, a, a, a knight, a stained glass knight that jumps off a window and interacts with a character, and that was the first considered the first CG character in a feature film, and that was not very long before this. And getting to they were because they were originally going to do it stop motion. You know, Phil Tippett was going to do stop motion dinosaurs, and his team was still retained, but. I think one of the most shocking in my life, I'll never forget, I, I saw Jurassic Park opening weekend and the moment, you know, where, where Sam Neill takes his glasses off and looks at the Brachiosaur taking, eating the leaves off the tree is still to this day, I, I'm, I'm thinking about it right now, one of the most, I think, astonishing moments in cinema history. I because, often um, cite it as awe-inspiring as an example, like, because uh, we don't oh get my many God. of them anymore. I mean, I had grown up watching, you know, The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, black and white, stop motion, Ray Harryhausen, Dinosaurs, Valley of the Guanji. Um, it was so, man, I think back to, I was at the Galaxy Theater in, on Hollywood Boulevard when I saw Jurassic Park. And I got to tell you guys, man, I, seeing that shot, I felt like Sam Neill. I mean, it was such a perfect the camera on his face as he stands up and takes his glasses off. It was just one of those moments why we go to the cinema. Yeah. And that and that reverse angle when you see it rear up and take the leaves off the tree. I mean, my God, man. There it's a very movie movie. Yeah, that's why we go to the movies. Yeah, the, no, this is one of the quintessential examples I would give for movies using their power. Like this is uh one of them. It's one of the best ones ever. Pretty much been obsessed with it since I was a kid. I've always loved it. And it forever generates my hatred for every other attempt that they bring into the franchise. Though I'm more concerned with talking about how good this is and not how bad they are. But like I said, it'll probably pop up here and there. Uh, oh, but it's such a great it's such a great moment. I mean, even you know what's so great? It, it, even before that, when you see the the um the dinosaurs in the distance around the lake. You yeah. know, and 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 you see the the children in the air, the 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 diffraction of the sun. That is an unbelievable effect shot. And if it, it, it it's when they're seeing it from a distance, it it looks. I mean, I'm always talking about verisimilitude. It is absolutely real. And when you see that, it's like, oh my god. You know, if it, it, it's it's it. What the genius of that is is like we were saying earlier before we went live is that Spielberg shot it at our level. So whenever you see the dinosaurs, it's how we as human beings would see them if they were real. 
and uh-huh. and that that goes with you. I mean, maybe not when they're the Raptors are chasing you, but at the the first part of the movie, it brings us, it puts us in the position of the characters, and, and they, it's it's so beautifully done. They still do make the Raptors quite imposing. Like I think that's the impression, right? It's just that it's so the majesty is so beyond what we could really understand to be next. Yeah. It has to try and simulate what it would feel like to be next to one of these creatures in real life, which is uh. You know, movies try all the time. It's, it's all about illusion, which is kind of interesting, right? Because what um, Hammond's character is motivated by, like that's what this movie is in our world. But there's more to say on that when you consider it in universe. It's uh, it's seriously one of the most like uh, it's a special movie. How else do I put it? Like because um, like you were just saying how they may have gone with stop motion as much as like no shade to stop motion, but I'm so absolutely thrilled that they did not because the animatronics are out of this world good in this film. Might be well, some of the most impressive I've seen. And the, uh, Holds up very well. Visual effects. It's an, it's really impressive for a film that came out in 1993. Like that's a that film has aged incredibly well. Yes. Oh yeah. There, there are so many, so many of the sequences with the dinosaurs look fantastic. With the integration of like the real world animatronics and the visual effects, it's so seamless. And um, I mean, in, in terms of like the shooting style, right? Of always trying to look up at the dinosaurs, like trying to get you sort of uh grounded with the characters it's it's um that film was filled with a lot of just intentionality and care in, in terms of like all aspects of the filmmaking um like you know ex- ex- uh, extending to the script as well it's just an incredibly tight film well, it's so iconic too because you, you were just yes. talking about that scene with the brachiosaur and then it's like when the raptors first we see them opening like cl- opening doors basically yeah, that becomes yeah. like a Huge thing. Obviously, the impact sounds on the the glass of water, the puddle in the on the floor. These are just things that everyone remembers. Um, and what a phenomenal job they do of building everything up before the first T Rex scene. It's, which, it's uh, kind of crazy how fast that film flies by. It's two hours long, and it feels like it races by. And at the same yeah. time, you don't feel like you missed out on anything. Like how it ratchets up to. You know, like it's hour long, like crazy shenanigans, um, like slowly setting it up, building up the tension, and then uh, really leveraging it for so many great moments. And this is um, one of the many films I would cite that uh, almost like in this golden age of uh, CG is becoming more and more of a thing, but they're all implementing it instead of just relying on it. Well, because um, Terminator 2 uses a lot of practical effects for the T-1000 as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, to practical effects combined with the visual effects. Partially because I believe when they were making Terminator 2, they weren't actually sure while making it how they were going to achieve it. Like, they right. planned it out, they were figuring it out, but it was so new and groundbreaking that there was kind of this fear of, can we even do this? Like, do we have the technology, you know? Is this possible? Um and I imagine it would have been the same with Jurassic Park as well. This, like, persistent, hmm, you know? Like, how are we going to do this? Um, I could No, it's, that. and that ILM documentary that's on Disney Plus goes into that. You know, they really didn't know. And, and, uh, and like you said, a combination of, there's some great practical effects. I mean, they had uh, full-scale dinosaur heads. The, the, I, mm. You know what I really love is, it's a it's a subtle thing, but when they find the downed triceratops, you know the sick triceratops, yeah, and yeah. and you know it's breathing, and mm-hmm. I mean that's a it's hard. I worked in 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 makeup effects, and it's hard special effects makeup to do that to create. I mean you the leathery skin, you know, and and it's absolutely convincing. And it's you, incredibly you, convincing. It's, like you are, you really buy into the the yeah the, man. The, are alive they're imbued with life because it's such an important part of the story is really accepting that the dinosaurs are living creatures with their own you know objectives and and sort of sets of behavior um it's 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 really impressive like on all accounts like from a production standpoint this this film is like pretty mind-blowing and it's 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 interesting to say to this day because it's like yeah it's uh like, even as you watch the film now, you just can't help but be impressed by all of the care that went into creating these animatronics and realizing the visual effects and, like, the efforts made to integrate all of these things seamlessly to where even when you're watching it now, you're like, was that, is that real? Like, is that, or is that, like, an animatronic or was that, you know, CG? There's a couple of shots we'll go into more depth as we go chronologically, but yeah, there's 
the it's just staggering all of the production elements for this film especially uh i feel the script i love the script in this film i was about to say I was about very to say good very focused and very be... deliberate no the lines are wasted is... it seems it's uh, th yeah this is this is an incredibly expeditious film in terms of there's no scene where i think eh, i could have cut that it really isn't like every scene is essential and builds uh builds either like tension or character it's all the more noticeable today when you have movies coming out that are two hours plus long, and I feel like they just, they drag. just, they just crawl and drag forwards, and you have entire like acts of movies where just you feel like nothing's happening and nothing's being accomplished, and we're just dragging our feet. Um, entire scenes where you just wonder what was the purpose of that entire scene or this entire conversation. I feel like we've learned nothing. Like, there's no direction in terms of this scene needs to do this, this scene needs to do this. We don't need to be wasting people's time. Because how, how long is Jurassic Park? Um, two hours. That's two hours, hours yeah. long. Park, it is, yeah, it's two hours and seven minutes. But it feels like it flies by because there's so many things happening. Every scene has a point. You're always, there's always something to look at. There's always something to be listening to. There's always a conversation between characters who are opposing um, or there's this there's this buildup of tension and you're just waiting for it to sort of something to happen and, and you're kind of on the edge of your seat because of it. So you never feel like it's dragging. Um, and even the end feels kind of not abrupt, but, you know, what? you know, at the end, you're like, wow, they didn't have some final monologue into the camera. They didn't have some uh, some attempt to leave you with, uh, you know, you know, with, you know, that's the point just staring at your face. But. Well, Once it's, it's done, it almost like itself, hits you right? like that. It's done. Um, I think um, what imp what when you talk about like the writing, what really elevates this film so much is the characters and that they're all so distinct. Nobody feels the same as each other. You know, Grant, Malcolm, Hammond, like they're not the same people. They mm -hmm. all have their own idiosyncrasies and beliefs and and um and strengths and weaknesses. A lot mm -hmm. of work is done to make sure that every line that comes out of all of these people is very representative of their core values, core characteristics, and uh, exactly. Oh, it's just how wonderful. many movies? How many movies have a premise where you have a bunch of people like trapped on a whatever, and there's a spooky chasing them, and you just hate all the characters, yeah, and you don't like them, and mm -hmm. you don't really know how they're different from each other, and they're all interchangeable, and so you just don't care. Just the fact that you don't have characters to care about and root for can ruin tension that that uh, that otherwise might have been really good because well, you're worried the, about uh, these people and what might happen to them. The characters are the grounding element because it, I like Jurassic Park is 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 such a quintessential example of like a big summer blockbuster. But like Jurassic Park is a very focused, small uh, scale story. It's just about this. It's about you know, people in a park, characters. and the park also exactly. has dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, and a lot of what enables you to buy into the tension and really, and like, you know, the fear, because I mean, the, the sense of fear in like several of the scenes is palpable. It's, um, and, and exhilaration, you know, like all of that stems from having an investment in the characters. And it's an investment that gets built very effectively and deliberately over the course of the first hour of the movie. And then, you know, continues to get developed even as all of the, the crazy dinosaur stuff is happening. Well, um, since we're already coming up to 20 minutes, we should probably get started on actually breaking this thing down from start to finish, because <laughs> we're going to be here for a while, I'd imagine. And I'm excited to talk about all the things in this film. Um, what an opening, by the way. Well, so I've talked about this so many times, but it seems to be... This isn't true in every single case, but a lot of what I consider to be the greatest movies of all time... The first scene is super important for uh, several reasons, but one of the main ones is that it's going to be the whole story in microcosm. It's going to be making a very distinct point. It's going to be a hook, and it's going to be uh, you know, something that kicks everything off, so to speak. And I feel like this is one that qualifies quite a bit. Like, what what is happening in our opening? And it's like, oh, well, it's the park, you know, getting up to probably some kind of regular uh, operation, being moving of a dinosaur from one place to another. And you have um, shit tons of men, loads of technology, and all kinds of orders and security and weapons everywhere. And um, they're just trying to move a Velociraptor into an enclosure. That is it. Right. And the way that this is built and shot, it's, uh, it's, it's, like, it's like a horror movie. And the score. Yes. Yeah. Which we John can't play, you guys, but, but trust you haven't us. Heard the, 
Yeah, you haven't heard the theme yet. No, it's great. Um, the score is Jay very doing it once again. I feel like everybody's had to have heard the uh, the theme. Everyone's so heard it, even if they don't know so what it's from. It. Everyone's yeah. heard it. Well, it's I mean, the, the the great thing about John Williams is is one of the things he's not necessarily known for is his horror scores. Like he scored Brian De Palma's The Fury. He scored John Badham's Dracula, and he he's a great when it came to suspense and and uh, there's you hear some of it in a lot of his his Spielberg scores. Like there's a lot of great stuff in E.T. when you first see the extraterrestrials in the beginning of the movie gathering plants and things like that. There's really ominous music. But what he does in the beginning of this, man, it 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 sets the tone right away. And you don't even see a full-on shot of a dinosaur. I mean, you know what it is. I mean, you're here to see Jurassic Park, but the way they hide it and I think- draw you in and the way it's shot... It's I had, just um, awesome. I had remembered it as there were no shots of the dinosaur. It was only on the rewatch that so I was like, ah, oh, there is one like that, yeah. that's kind of clean enough. And I think obviously it's Spielberg having the close up of uh, of Muldoon and then the Velociraptor, like this lock of man versus nature, which yeah. is uh, entirely what I believe this scene is is pretty much about. Look at the amount of man made tech that's here. Even like the the tint of blue around here, which comes across to me as you know, like green versus blue is a lot of what it can be for tech versus nature, depending on your choices, of course. I like to look into these things when it's a movie this good, and um, yeah, like what is the big thing that fucks all of this up is they underestimate the Velociraptor's strength. Pretty much that. Yes, is. and then of course it, the the Velociraptor's fundamental inability to understand like what they're even trying to do. Like, he doesn't know, like, oh, yeah, this is them putting me... Like, it's it's an animal, right? Who didn't yeah. live with humans. Uh, and it's just this fundamental clash of, like, these creatures that didn't coexist and shouldn't coexist, really. Well, yeah, there's there's no... Uh, that's the whole chaos element. There's so much that you could never possibly be prepared for or understand. Um, that's what the warning well, of this do film is. To control them? Yeah, like, the, 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 the... Expecting that you can control them, like, it's just an illusion... And uh, yeah, this is obviously one of the big first examples of how ill-prepared this park is. It, uh, you'll have Hammond yeah. telling you throughout, no, it's fine, it's good, it's great, everything's paid for, it's all good, 100%, it's going to work. And it's just like we keep seeing <laughs> all of these aspects failing, which is really important to allow the plot line to happen, the fact that this is an ill-prepared state of, of park. But at the same time, it's uh, it's not something they've put zero money or effort into. It's just uh, the all amount... Right, the sheer the level of power point. you need to be able to outclass mm-hmm. the power that you're generating is uh, big old themes in this film. Yep. Um, and yeah, like I said, it's good for a hook because you. <laughs> it's kind of funny looking back on it, like because uh, now the the problem with the newer films is they think like one Velociraptor is boring, one T Rex is boring. We need we need the hyper genetically I... altered super mutant dinosaur that can fly, <laughs> go invisible, evade uh, X rays and stuff. Of... It's kind of interesting how much you can trace that with other franchises running at the same time, like with Terminator. Bigger, T- bigger, T- bigger, T-800 more. We can't just have a T-800. It's got to be like a hyper, like it's got its own magnetic field and everything, and it can like fly and shit. You know, and then we like got time travel, better. and then we got get different. It up. And you see like that the, with um, the... Predator as well. The new cool Predator. Yeah, he was bulletproof. Exactly. He was super big, tall, strong, invisible, running around wild, killing people, everybody in the forest, and everyone's just shooting their guns and exploding everything. And it's like feel like you didn't grasp at all what made these films so popular, but all right. It's something that you can't help but recognize over and over when you're watching this movie is how small scale and intimate a lot of these tense encounters are. It's literally just a velociraptor in a kitchen with some kids. And you're like, oh shit, it's just it's just like one or two. Or it's a single T-Rex fucking around with a couple Ford Explorers. You know, like, and yet it's it's terrifying. It's really scary and and it's got a lot of tension there's not these insane explosions going off these massive dinosaur stampedes exploding volcanoes a million like pterodactyls flying around grabbing people it's just too much you're just like i just don't my brain just can't believe this it's so much happening but a velociraptor and chasing me in a kitchen i can imagine that i can believe that that's why it's so scary nice and straightforward nice and terrifying as uh, Thunder just referenced, yeah, the 1,000 Star Destroyer Death Stars. It's like, what? Yeah, that's a pretty good example. That might just, be the best that's... example because um, that sounds like a joke. 
It's yeah, a you know what these are. What if there were a thousand of them? Ooh, oh, yeah. aren't it's you not scared? Even, it's, it's not even as creative as like trying to create new crazy dinosaurs. It's just copy paste like the thing that you remember, you know, from the old better films. There's something to be said about the comparison between like is more necessarily scarier. And I think it depends on how you frame a scenario. Um, like, like we said, you know, this, that there's a velociraptor in a kitchen chasing two kids. Like, that's, that's terrifying. It's closed off. There's a very understandable level of threat. The kids are very vulnerable and they have to escape. And then if you shift that to, well, what if there was a thousand velociraptors across a whole city? And you're just like, I just, my brain is well, just, I it's think, like, um, that. I'm just thinking now about why. So you think about something like Saving Private Ryan, well, you know, another Spielberg film, Saving Private Ryan, like, you know, the Omaha Beach, that's like a big, that's a big battle. There's like thousands of men there. Um, it, 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 it's, it's, it's bigger than like any of the individuals who were participating in that battle can like fully, you know, capture the scope of. Um, because they're just focused on what they need to do to get off of the beach, you know, like, that's the focus. And then bringing you into, you know, that battle with a very, it's, you know, ground level. We don't have any big sweeping shots of the whole battlefield, because we're very focused on the characters yeah, that we're following. the soldiers, yeah, and, and how they deal and with think, it and what's I happening to them. The same, uh, with, like, you know, if we're looking at, like, Jurassic Park, all of the encounters are very intimate, because it's always from, like, the perspective of, like, one or two, you know, human beings who are completely and utterly outmatched in terms of strength, um, rather than, like, some big grand spectacle of, you know, like, a thousand pterodactyls flying around, like, from a bird's eye view, or kind of, like, how much can we ground you in this situation with these characters? It was like Robert was saying, right, in terms of the deliberate uh, use of camera, of always generally looking up at the dinosaurs to reinforce yeah. their scale, but it's also to really, like, ground you with those characters. It's Yeah, as someone in chat said, it's personal. It yeah. feels how, more personal. How do you think, because um, it's sort of like, how do you think Starship Troopers pulls that off? Do you get the same feeling with that movie? Because you have so many, so many enemies, so many bad things that are coming towards That's you. That's a good example. Because um, that film is very intense. Yes. It feels very um, intense when you're there with the characters, even though you get plenty of like big sweeping shots. Um, it always, yeah, it, it always seems to be like the anchor of this scene or these scenes are the human characters in it and how exactly. they're reacting to it. Mm -hmm. And much and like in Jurassic in... Park, when you're hyper focused on these very relatable characters, I think that that is what allows you to have these potentially massive threats out there and you can still accept the tension of the moment. Like, I will say as well, uh, Starship is another film where I'm blown away by how good the bugs look throughout. Yeah. Uh, both yeah. CG and practical. I, I, yeah, I was going to say, like Jurassic Park, the co combination of practical effects and CG. You know, it's funny, um, that film was, I just recently watched the 4K disc of that. And it's amazing how well the visual effects hold up. Yeah. And yeah. Be be because, you know, there's, people talk about whether, like a lot of people say, oh, I hated the CG. Visual effects are all about the design of the shot itself. And whenever you have a, 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 a visual effect that is entirely computer generated, a lot of people, and you see this a lot in the early days of, of CG, especially in, in uh, space battles, there's all kinds of, because they can put a virtual camera anywhere, there's all kinds of movement that we know, like, like this, this is a weird concept to think about, but we understand the audience when we're watching a movie that there's a camera there. Like we don't maybe recognize it as we're watching the film, but in the back of our minds, we know that it had to be filmed. Yeah. And, and when you have visual effects that clearly a uh, 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 break the bonds of a virtual camera. Like the thing about Jurassic Park is, whenever they're shooting dinosaurs, there's not some gigantic sweeping virtual camera coming down from God's point of view and sweeping across the landscape with dinosaurs, you know, and that shatters the reality of it all. And so, even when you're dealing with visual effects, you have to put a camera in a place where it's believable. I'm and one of the things up, that's actually, what's that? Cuz I'm glad you brought this up cuz I find it an interesting topic of um attempting to basically make the camera movement seem more 
real than what you could do with visual effects which is you know if it's a full visual effect shot you can do whatever you want framing yes um, exactly and but you still have to make it feel real i mean great visual effects should be seamless like you shouldn't notice them and a lot of the time we get and and as much as i love peter jackson's lord of the rings i'm reminded of there's a shot when uh, Saruman says on Isengard, you know, he says, to war! And the, the camera pulls back over all the, the orcs, the assembled orcs. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, that shot bothers me because it breaks verisimilitude. You could never get, even though it's a virtual camera shot, you could never get a real camera to do that. I mean, now with drones, maybe you could. But at the Definitely time... you could with drones now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean... I mean, you could. Maybe with a crane... But, <laughs> But the problem is it's still a visual effects shot, you know, and you would have to have the you'd have to have a bunch of extras, you know, a thousand extras so the camera could come down off that. And we know it's a visual effect shot. And Lord of the Rings, it pushes the boundaries because at the time, you know, I, I, I forgive it. But but um, in Jurassic Park, there's not one visual effect shot that betrays its CG origins. Because the way the shot is designed is so, it's designed from our point of view, like this was how we would see it if we were in that environment. And that's something that I think a lot of the time filmmakers forget. And and they they use visual effects to create fake moments of excitement or they try. And, but we know, the audience knows that there's no there's no way a real camera could do that. So those visual effects don't always work. But in Jurassic Park, the design of each shot is done in such a way that we as the audience, this is how we would see it if we were there. And it adds to the movie. And it's a, it's it's something no one really thinks about. But if you watch that film, it's every single effect shot is brilliantly designed. And when you get further into the franchise, especially when you get to Jurassic World, no one cares. You know, there's all these these grandiose shots, and it's it's like that. No one would ever be able to shoot that, and yeah, I mean, and it's part of the reason it the reality of it. And and this is a this is something I in my life I'm obsessed with. I'm obsessed with the verisimilitude of fantasy films, and and making it feel real. Verisimilitude is the quality of being real, meaning that. I believe what I'm watching could actually happen. And the Marvel Cinematic Universe used to do that, for instance. If you go back and watch Iron Man, the first Iron Man, very much so, and you get to Quantum Mania, and there's no reality at all. You know, when, you, when you're in the quantum realm, there's nothing in it that you remotely believe. And so that shatters the, the way a movie works on you subconsciously or when you're not... Um, when you're not understanding why you love a movie so much, it's because you are tricked into belief. Because movies are all made up. You know, you're watching something that is completely contrived. Allegedly. <laughs> but well, Right. But when it's done well, you believe, man. And the great fantasy films that we all love, like whether you watch like Mad Max, The Road Warrior or Fury Road, Yes, there's CG assists in those sequences, but man, you know that they were driving real cars. And those dudes on those sticks were going oh, back and when forth you're at the point for real. Where you can't actually tell if it was a special effect or like they did it for real. That's when you're in golden territory for films. That's and it, man. And, and Jurassic it. Park never breaks that ever. It's, uh, Jurassic and Park is probably the second, well, one of the most uh, examples I would ever use for the implementation of CG, which is so cool because it's 93. You'd be like, surely it's going to be something recent if it's because CG just keeps getting better. And it's like, no, <laughs> not even close. No, because, because it's not the CG, it's the design of the shot, you know, and, and the design of the shot from the audience's perspective. I mean, you show somebody a, an incredible cityscape where here's Coruscant. With all these cars flying through it, and they're all going in a row. No one's no one's peeling off, going down an off ramp in the sky. And you're looking at it going, okay, that looks beautiful, but that's not what it would really look like. <laughs> you know, you're it there it's too it's too uniform. And so even the skies on uh, across Coruscant, I'm like, I don't believe that. That's but that not doesn't what a have real... anything to do with like the shot. 
in the the camera position. That's just um, where the where the yeah. That's just whether or not you believe that they would are, yeah. create traffic that way. Because I'm with that's you. Just, it's just like uh, that seems like a waste of sky. Of, yeah, like, and it's Part the whole of the conception of the. It's the conception of that shot. It's it's like for instance, and I don't mean to harp on it, but in Rise of Skywalker, hyperspace skipping. You know they already established what if you bounce too close to a supernova that would end your trip real quick the idea that you could come out of hyperspace in the gravity well of a planet much less in the middle of a city is uh, you immediately you've shattered all verisimilitude well, yeah, you, several you, times you, in uh, seconds and, uh, and, and, yeah, and, and i think and, as well they don't even know where they're ending up they're just hoping yeah the, and and when you watch when you watch the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park and, and there was a con and that's where direction comes in you know that's where Spielberg, who who Spielberg is one of the great geniuses in terms of knowing where to put a camera, and and even though he'll do like there's a one of my favorite shots in a movie is in Jaws, and it's a shot inside Quint's office, and and it it's a it's it doesn't even make any sense, but it's a shot where the camera moves up and it goes through one of the jaws of a shark that he has hanging on the wall. And you see the orca going off the boat, going out into the ocean to, to to destroy the shark. It's a beautiful shot. It's completely contrived, but everything you need to know about Jaws is in that one image. And and you buy it because Spielberg knows the man is a virtuoso when it came to placing a camera and making you believe. He said famously. In Jaws, he goes, people are like, you know, uh, Stephen, if you shoot a compressed air tank, it doesn't explode. And Spielberg's like, you know what? I'm going to have them. They're going to believe. <laughs> and they're, by the end of the movie, they're going to believe what I tell them. And they will believe when Roy Scheider shoots that compressed air tank that it would explode spectacularly and blow up the shark. And he was right. And he does it in Jurassic Park. He makes you believe every single camera angle in that movie makes you believe that dinosaurs are real. Even when it's just, you know, you're, you're literally going through Basil Exposition when you're going through John Hammond's uh, film explaining Jurassic Park, you know, you believe, man. And so many filmmakers today don't have that talent because they rely too much. Everything is pre -vised. And and you don't have um, the sure hand, the sure directorial hand, because so many people are involved now. You'll go to an effects company. They'll design your entire effects sequence for you, but they're designing it from their perspective, you know, which is the, which is the effects perspective. But they're not thinking about it in terms of the audience's perspective. They're like, let's make a cool shot. It's going to be awesome. Well, I thought it was... Uh... I think there's... Interesting to highlight the uh, the interest in keeping the, the angles of a particular style throughout to maintain a feeling of how like how the dinosaurs relate to us. But you know, I would go as, as far as saying it's it's literally them being fans of Jurassic Park as viewers, right? The future creators of of the Jurassic Park series that leads them to want to be like what you know what worked about this film it's like well it's just the majesty of dinosaurs they're so amazing right. right and then they're like okay so how do we do it? it's like well get the cg guys to whip up the best looking dinosaur ever i'll take it from there and just you just film them as you are like a animal in real life with your phone You're like how cool is this look at this thing and then of course they'll be like well now we need the big shot of seeing everything and then huge music swelling and the enormous i forget the name of the dinosaur but like it just it always sits with me in the opening of jurassic world when the the big water one is like on showcase and it's just it might be yeah and it, and it um is it mosasaurus i can't remember but it could be maybe someone it's... in chat might and um you know it, it it's showcasing it eating and the whole audience is just fucking cheering and i just remember thinking like man you didn't you didn't you didn't get it <laughs> like you, know, you didn't get it at all because that film is such a like uh soulless version of the first film in terms of like, what what is the story? It's a park with dinosaurs in it that's working kinda, and then it all goes wrong, and people are screaming, and dinosaurs are like slasher villains, right? And you're like, no, yeah, that's it's not like the they, point. it's like yeah, they didn't take quite the right lessons from it. Um, yeah. In the way that we see with Star Wars, where you know we always have to see lightsabers, and there always has to be that's the, the it's not really it, like it, it 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 wants to focus on the aesthetics and a general vibe. 
instead of going back to the foundational steps of well what made that thing a classic what what made these things very memorable well maybe we don't have to worry about i mean there weren't like memorable likable interesting characters in jurassic park let's just make big dinosaur shots of a big park you know they they just totally Something skipped over the, the, the meat of it jurassic world well, yeah I, mean, I just i just hate a bunch of dumb boring assholes and I just don't care about what happens to them, or I'm actively rooting for them to be consumed. <laughs> yeah, well, like you the just, you've just, yeah, uh, I'm just like, oh, just like fucking, uh, die. But you just quantified uh, the difference between great genre cinema and mediocre genre cinema, and it it comes down to intent. And I think you just said it. Um, it's a it's a park with a bunch of dinosaurs, but if you don't have a strong storytelling point of view which is what a great director yeah, that's the brings. setting it's not the story that's right oh. that's right and and every you know i look at some of my favorite directors working today like david fincher you know the man's he's a clinician in the way that his shots are set up if you ever watch there's a great video on youtube about how he shoots and how every shot is composed and even when the camera pans it has to be a perfect pan and i think spielberg's a little bit more loose when he shoots, but if you, he just inherently understands from a, a, a design standpoint in his mind. Um, I think he's got a little bit more jazzy as he's gotten older, you know, cause he wants to shoot things faster and he has a crew that knows what he wants, but the composition of the shots in Jurassic park are so thoughtful. And they're so, and and the collection of that thoughtfulness in a movie is what makes it. I I I I don't mean to be so I don't know spiritual, but that's what penetrates your soul as a viewer, you know. And 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 the reason why Jurassic Park had such power was the view we believed it, man. <laughs> like like even even the beginning when the helicopter lands on. Isla uh, Nublar, Nublar, Isla Nublar, you know, and you hear the, the Jurassic Park theme in its full glory as, as Ian Malcolm and, and everybody's like it landing. Uh, you're, you're the audience, it, it, the grandeur of that is so, you're, you're like, of course, this is where dinosaurs live. <laughs> Even though they shot it in Hawaii, it's, it's, they found the perfect place with the waterfalls and everything. And, and, and Spielberg knew he's like, this is the we, we need to convince people that this island is where dinosaurs would live. And when you hear this John Williams music and you see that helicopter land, you're like, of course, man, of course, this is where dinosaurs live. You believe it because he knew he knew that when this helicopter lands, it's just landing. It's not like there's, you know, petrodactyls or whatever flying around before the helicopter lands. It's just a helicopter landing to that grandiose theme. But you believe like, yep. This is the island where dinosaurs live. Because Spielberg knew. He knows how to make you believe. Well, no, definitely. It's, it's like at that point, it's generating such a... It's like we're about to go on an adventure sort of thing. Even though it's like, kind well, of, yeah. the context is a bunch of people are coming to review whether or not this park is safe and viable. Which sounds so much more boring when you put it that way. Like I know, I know, right? But he makes you believe, man. You're there, like, yes, we're 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 basically uh, in 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 here. We have I, uh, uh, OSHA, which is is the the people that make sure movie sets are safe. Boring job, but that's all they're doing. I need you to come check out my new park. Even I think the audience it's... is like, no, For... it's gonna go awry. For a movie that is so. Especially in memory, you, you remember a lot of the grandiose shots and the, you know, the intensity of a lot of it. It's very restrained. Um, I think there's a good uh, there's a good amount of wisdom in what to show, what not to show, and when to show it. Um, <laughs> even rewatching it, it kind of surprised me how it was constructed in terms of when we see dinosaurs, how we see them, and yeah. the gaps that exist between you seeing them. But there's never this impression that we have to hurry back up and get to seeing the dinosaurs or, or that any tension has been um, removed uh, because you can't see them. Uh, when uh, Laura Dern and uh, Muldoon, Animal Man, um, when, the, when they are going to check on where Arnold is uh, with a power, they have a whole sequence where she runs and the music is like da 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 da, and she just just runs into a you know the, this the, the compound 
there's no dinosaurs or anything, just a woman running through the jungle for a bit and into a door. But it has this tension because you've been told what velociraptors are capable of, the person who respects them the most. Yeah, yeah, right here, exactly. The the person who seems to respect and fear them the most is the one who's really telling her to, you know, you need to run. Uh, there's this implication that they are out there and they could attack at any moment. And there's no dinosaurs whatsoever. You, you don't see them. You don't even hear them. As far as you know, they're, they might not even be there. But there's still an immense amount of tension there. Um, and they could have had, you know, if this was the modern movie, they'd have four of the damn things coming out of the woods, nipping at her heels, and she barely is able to get inside the door before they all crash around. And they'd they come they out of the sky, out of the ground. And, <laughs> and then they come in, there's helicopters, and they got parachutes on, and it would just be it'd just be crazy. And that, not, that necessarily doesn't mean it would be bad. You could do that scene really excellently, even with being very explicit about how they're being chased. But this film doesn't do that. It takes the other route where they're not even present, but there's still tension. And it does seem... Well, I think the, Go ahead. the, the tension comes from the sense that there is a presence there. There's a presence because you know that there are dinosaurs on that island. Yeah. Like, you know that you can't already, see them. There's also, you know there's also, like, the tension in the way that the characters... That the characters kind of feel like they're around somewhere, right? Like, yeah. it's like the characters' reactions to the information that comes to them is super important in terms of, you know, essentially uh, evoking the same feeling in you, provided it's all built up effectively, which in this case, you know, in this film, is the case all the time, basically. If all these grounded, believable characters are constantly on edge and well, worried and seen, acting um... as if dinosaurs could get them at any moment, then even if you don't see them, you are right there with them, and you think, oh yeah, dinosaurs could get them at any moment. So I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm worried for them. There's anxiety in the air. Yeah. Um, Muldoon and Alan basically like keep beefing up the raptors throughout the film with their descriptions, and then there's like yeah. several big sequences with just the raptors. It's it's so simple and yet so effective in in terms of how you can do all this kind of thing. Some of the the best films that involve monsters, you don't see them for a while. They're uh, that's right. So it's all that tension building, all the suspense, and then the payoff. It's just tried and true. And yet, uh, a lot of people take from that, like, oh, well, the best part is the monster part, so just do more monster parts. Uh, you wonder how much of, like, filmmaking now is, oh, well, everybody will talk about that big potent moment in a film, or, you know, whatever handful yeah, of Yeah, this is our big scene. This moment. will be our big well, thing. It'll be on all the posters. You wonder sometimes if people forget, yeah, but, like, there's so much work that was, there was so much groundwork that was laid beforehand that it, that feeds into that scene. Like, that moment on its own, yeah, it's cool, but, like, it's all of the material that was building that moment up before the film that's super relevant and important. It's, like, in, in being so fixated on, if you look at, you know, like, Jurassic World, right, these big epic moments that you forget about all of the character work and the tension building that facilitates that moment, the moments in Jurassic Park being as cool as they are. Because, yeah, the Velociraptors are built up over the course of, like, an hour and a half. Of just like gradually building up and receiving information on them, and most importantly, the perspectives of characters like Muldoon, who is very familiar with this animal, and like even he's nervous about them, you know, and he's the super trained uh, expert. Like it all just feeds into he, making um, those moments awesome. He has a line where he says something like, "I've hunted just about everything capable of hunting us." Something yeah. like that, just yeah. like the the absolute familiarity. <laughs> Funny enough, because I really like Muldoon for how little we get of him. Ah, yeah, His, he's, um, he's awesome. His literal, like, the first line we get from him in a, you know, outside of the intro where he's shouting shoot her is, uh, they should all be destroyed, or something like that. Yeah. Like, that's, that's, well, that's him. He's just like, really, well, that's what should happen. His character is used as the villain in all sorts of other kinds of stuff, right? He is the char the, the hunter, or the, the warden kind of character. Um, he's the bad guy. He hunts them for, you know, for the Sports. joy of hunting. Fun, yeah. And he's kind of got bloodlust to him. He's like, um, as I, I mentioned when we were watching it, he's like um, Clayton and Tarzan. But well, he's enough, not just you know an evil asshole. Reference or he's... is perfect, Rags, is uh, the guy in Fallen Kingdom. There is a hunter just like him in Tooth that. Man? Who's, yeah, he just takes, yeah. rips tooths out of teeth, sorry, <laughs> tooths out of dinosaurs. And then he gets his comeuppance. He's just an asshole hunter. But Muldoon, very different. Well, a lot I of forget the name of the guy in um, Rescuers Down Under. Someone in chat will have to remind me of the name who's got Joanna as the. I remember Joanna's name, but I don't remember. I don't remember his name. But he's got 
Like, you see this guy, and modern stuff has kind of poisoned you to thinking, oh, that guy's the villain. I can tell because I've seen movies, and that's obviously going to be the bad guy. When he's just, like, actually super responsible and respectful of all these creatures, really. Well, I think one of the things with Muldoon that helps him is that even, like, with through everything, you get the sense that he has reverence for them. Like, that he respects them. He he knows what they, like, he respects their power. Yeah. Um... He doesn't he doesn't treat them lightly like they're just little, you know, like um caged toys or something. Like he knows that they're animals and he knows that they're intelligent, and then of course it leads to it leads to that payoff. Well he um, just um I've always felt he's like symbolic from the start to middle to end of man directly versus like what is man capable of versus of, like the nature of a velociraptor and he loses. Uh, yeah. and he's outclassed for the very reason that Alan lays out in his first scene. Uh, which makes it all the more terrifying when people who aren't experienced hunters have to deal with velociraptors that the experienced hunter got outclassed by them. Just uh, reinforces just how tense and scary that encounter is at the end. And I love as well, it's such an iconic line, clever girl, but it's such a, a recognition from him as like, you, you, yeah, you're you good. Like... <laughs> by the way, can we talk about Spielberg's knack for casting? Yeah, sure. That yeah, actor, yeah. and his name eludes me. But uh, again, his name is Bob Peck. Okay, in terms of verisimilitude, when you cast an actor, um, and he looks the part, that guy looks like. I mean, you believe, you believe in that guy, and um, he says, "Clever girl, you think, man, like he's gonna survive." Yeah, that guy knows what's up. <laughs> you know, and it's, it's he's got that British face, that accent, and in America, we believe that anyone with a British accent is smarter than we are. <laughs> Mostly say true. That Mostly you guys true. <laughs> might laugh, might laugh, but actually, I should say, uh, 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 I, I look. There's so many different great British accents. I don't when I watch like a Guy Ritchie movie, perhaps. Those British accents are different than the ones I'm talking about. But Americans, we're used to that. And when you when you see a British hunter dressed, you know, as if he's in India, it, it, colonial, in the during the colonial days, we believe that those guys knew what was up. And, yeah, because he's a, he's and a when game he warden says, from Kenya, right? Yeah, totally. And when he says, clever girl, it's like, that's a one-liner that Arnold would say. No, well, it's a, it's amazing a, that he in, can deliver that in a way that makes you respect him just about when he's lost and about to die. It's like nice. Totally. Totally. And 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 when he does, because you again, this is Spielberg's genius. You believe, man, that he's gonna prevail. <laughs> and when he doesn't, it's like, oh fuck. Yeah, and then you of know, course it, the rap is going after you harder. a wounded woman and uh, kids after taking out the the guy who's probably best suited to take them on is is raises the tension further and further. It raises yes, and and again, you know, not to belabor the point, but that's why Spielberg is an effing genius. Oh yeah, he knew everyone knew what they were doing when they were making this. Yeah. Um, so why don't we talk about the next scene? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Making great time. All right, let's do it. Um, so yeah, the the to me the, the first scene is like a big old uh, as I said hook and a, a figure focus on thematically what we're going to be dealing with. Next scene is almost strictly plot. You still get character in all of these because obviously that's where the information's coming from, but it's like lawyer arrives on what is a really like dinky and strange method without an uh, welcoming from Hammond cuz uh it just represents how much he's not favored. This is um this is the lower end of the, the 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 character in terms of value. Nobody likes the lawyer. <laughs> he's uh, he's kind of annoying. He's very focused on money. He's kind of an idiot too. He has many lines that relate to him. Just man being like he just doesn't understand much of anything. Um, Out of his element here. Absolutely, but obviously he represents a very important part of the film. And um, yeah, they basically just explain the the park is being built and a lot of insurance guys and other investors are not sure they they might want to axe the program because it just seems too uh, unruly sort of thing. They need reassurances from experts. You're going to have to grab uh, some. One of them that has been suggested as a more trendy one to get a um, an approval from is is Ian Malcolm. And then he's like, uh, he's looking for some others more classic uh, types being the archaeologists that are currently under um, Ammon's uh, sort of 
money right now. He's funding their um, current expedition, right? He said he... And, and, and he's going to look to do it further if they agree to this. Because I guess Hammond at this point is quite rich, but Jurassic Park is still going to cost you a shit ton. Yeah. And um, yeah, so this is just making clear that um, that is going to be why everything is happening. It's very straightforward. Mm -hmm. These are the kind of things you would expect would happen. And uh, to be honest with you, it wouldn't be long before there would be a hell of a lot of government intervention with the more knowledge of this place getting uh, further and further well known. Um, yeah, and ending with a big old shot of the mosquito in amber. Yeah, the... which uh, is nice in terms of the level of symbolism, ain't it? Every time, yeah. yeah. And then next scene already, it's just like we're, we're what going... What bloodsuckers? And uh, Alan and Ellie are just uh, organizing well, this is just their architectural dig. It's just let's sort of set up expectations in your mind about these two characters, because it's all just character, right? Them yeah. at the dig site. Who are these people? Um, and, and of course, you know, brought forth through the performance as well, you just get a really clear sense of these as individuals, you know, rather than just uh, people who have been plopped into, like, a dinosaur movie. Well, what's Alan's first line? I hate computers. Um, <laughs> yeah. There's a couple of references in this film to him being almost incompatible with technology. And uh, I've always seen it as a, a symbolic, again, of him uh, being more in tune with nature well, than tech. Because he mentions um, he mentions that when they're using the computer to basically like map out the area so that they can find all of the bones. I think he said something along the lines of like, well, what's the fun in that, basically? The fun comes from digging around. Like, what's the point of digging anymore? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What's the fun in that? And as he points to it, it uh, goes staticky. And I think she says, like, he's... Uh, Dr. Grant isn't machine compatible. And, mm. yeah, just uh, the continuing themes of the excess technology or new advancements in technology and man versus nature. The, the Grant, throughout this film, seems to be the primary character that respects and understands everything that's happening on a more fundamental level and uh what's ethical what we shouldn't be doing but doesn't necessarily like start up big old debates about it he's just um he's always acting in the interest of trying to make sure everything works out because like you know that that comes into full clear when uh they're talking in the um when they're having lunch he's like the last one to give his opinion well yeah he's uh i mean he's um at bro appeals to him is like you know come on like surely you you know you, you know what's up right this is all great, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a Grant's lot like, to talk yeah, about. I don't know that. that scene is uh, rich thematically. Well, uh, yeah, because like the next thing that significance that happens is uh, Alan Grant terrifying a child uh, in the best way possible. Instantly makes him my favorite character. <laughs> He's Alan Grant stocks instantly rise. Well, it's, uh, it is great because yeah, what seven, eight minutes in, and uh, this is the big setup for what dealing with a raptor is like. And uh, this film, because I don't know how accurate uh, it would be necessarily to uh, what we know about raptors compared to other dinosaurs, but this film kind of makes raptors seem like the most threatening dinosaur that's ever existed. Like, uh, and which we don't is um, fuck with kind them. of interesting, right? Because with T Rex, everybody knows what the T Rex is. Uh, it kind of like speaks for itself. Um, whereas building up Velociraptors, yeah, it seems like this film kind of that was a goal was to build them up to to the point that they're the final set piece. The T-Rex is kind of the first set piece of the movie. Yeah. Um, and a lot of it comes from the Velociraptors uh, the, sort of building up their intelligence and their coordination. Um, so yeah, they, they do a good job at sort of displaying different kinds of danger. The T-Rex yeah, exactly. isn't the same kind of dangerous as a Velociraptor is, but they're both very dangerous. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Dr. Grant destroys kid with facts and logic. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> Debate one. Because, yeah, the kid is basically like, ha, ah, they sound like chickens and idiots. They it looks old. like a chicken. Yeah, and then Grant is like, like wow. you know what's so neat about them? And th th he throws in the line, by the way, you may expect that they're like T-Rexes, where if you stay still, you'll be okay. Um, so that's just going to be helpful for later when that's re-implemented. But uh, he says, no, they'll be staring at you, and you'll be staring at it, and then you'll be attacked. But not from the front, from the sides. They, uh... They hunt together, they use coordinated attack patterns, and oh, it isn't just, uh, they eat not you from alive. The front, from the side. Not from the front, from the side. And then what happens? 
what happens to your boy Muldoon. That's the thing, you could you, you know? could uh, mix the two scenes together. and uh... There's a lot of setup and payoff in this film. They build up so many things that come back uh, to, to be leveraged in the story later on. It's really good stuff. Uh, and yeah, and then they have the little chat about kids. He's uh, on a more character, like, fundamental level. He goes through a little arc in this about dealing with children, finds them all to be rather annoying, and yet is probably one of the best carers of the children in the whole movie compared yeah. to most characters. <laughs> when push comes to shove, you know, he, he leaps into the fray and he does what he thinks is right, or he, do, he does his best, you know? Probably best summarized by that moment where um, she falls over, he picks her up by the hand to be like, oh, are you okay? And then she is, and then she won't let go of his hand. He's like, nah, <laughs> get off. Just like a... Uh, he's he's probably What's the better nice father that he realizes, uh, potentially. It's a nice little art to have running for him throughout the film. And it's, it's not very complicated either. Like, none of it is particularly complicated, but it's effective. Well, and it, um, I think it's sort of uh, representative as well of this this taking care of what we're supposed like what we're dealing with in front of us to, you know having some kind of deliberate consideration of everything we're doing meanwhile of course like humanity is ushering in this whole new species and they're doing it in the most clunky and uh sort of disrespectful way and it's causing significant problems meanwhile like i said he's thrust into a position to take care of two kids and he does wonderfully with it mm -hmm. um so yeah, uh, a helicopter arrives and like fucks up the whole dig site, which to me is just again like, haha, technology coming in and <laughs> just fucking with everything that comes across as more natural. I think they take every opportunity they can to have that comparison throughout the film. And, but also, uh, what I love about about this is it sets up the idea that paleontology, you know, that's that's all we have. <laughs> and and when I was growing up. As a kid, you know, I love books about dinosaurs, and you realize these poor guys, the men and women that are are delving into the past of our great planet, all they have is fossils. They have nothing, you know, and and it's setting up that great moment we talked about earlier on, uh, when when he finally sees the dinosaur. But this scene, it's like this is where he spent his life. This guy, this poor dude, and his girlfriend. They just are digging in the dust. <laughs> and one helicopter lands and all of their reverence for history can be disrupted. All of their work yeah. can literally be swept away with a gust of wind. <laughs> and and it, 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 it kills me every time I watch this scene because I'm like, wow, man, these people, they've gone to college. You know, they spent their lives in the service of digging into the ground and they find one little fossil with their little brushes. And I was like, oh my God. Look what we have! It's such and, a, and uh, just for the helicopter to come in with a complete disregard for like the damage. Totally, the yeah. The <laughs> with the scientific like... method out the window. Well, and, it, and yeah. it's it's a great way to like all this guy cares about. Even though he's a lawyer, the the actual scenario of his arrival at this site, it 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 says so many things about capitalism, about the respect of history. You know, <laughs> like like he's like. Who cares about paleontology when we've got Jurassic Park? Well, that's the thing, right? Because uh, Hammond, you know. Hammond would probably say he definitely respects this dig. He's paying for it and all that stuff, but he doesn't um, treat it properly, which is representative no. of his park. It's like it's like it's there, but not there fully. He doesn't fully understand what he's dealing with. What is this place, and why should you be giving it more care? And he's just like, well, it's you know, it's where they dig up the bones, and then they, that, well, that's it, how they find out about the dinosaurs. Kind of the same as uh, like when people are like, oh, that animal, that wild animal, oh, I want to pet him and squeeze him and everything. It's like, why don't you just leave it alone? <laughs> you know, like, why don't you just respect it from a distance? It's kind of like that. Like, yeah, the considerate thing to do would be land further away and walk here, but <laughs> oh well. And uh, yeah, you have the sufficient outrage from uh, Alan and Ellie, but then they both realize, oh, this is the guy who's funding us, right? And, uh, yeah, oh, uh, and their immediate pivot in their demeanor. <laughs> I really love uh, Richard Attenborough throughout this film, by the way. He's so oh, joyful. Yeah. And, uh, he's so charming. Yeah, he's so much fun and everything, but this just that underlying, like, he knows all of this is holding together with just strings. And uh, he's so desperate to get it to the world. He's so desperate to give people the experiences he wants to see. His enjoyment almost comes directly from other people being, like, in awe of the stuff that he can show them. Um, Kind of reminds me of Prestige, actually. 
Yeah, it was the look on their faces. And uh, yeah, it's a really he's very very unique in, in the whole storyline for his point of view that's that's what he's motivated by but at the same time he'll have a crossover with lots of different characters at lots of different times because uh, that's the thing right like everyone's core values are different but they'll all intersect at different points it creates for really good banter bouncing and because uh, like this would be a good example right those two are outraged at what he's done to the dig until they find out he's funding it and then they're like no we're not going to come to your crazy whatever the hell this is and he's like i'll give you lots of money and they're like Okay. Fund your dig for the next <laughs> like, three years. Like, yeah, that'll be uh Money is a, it's a thing. Does do I the motivation? I keep digging. I need money. Still, probably wouldn't be enough if they knew what they were getting into with the whole getting eaten by uh, raptors and stuff. But yeah, that's the part not. you didn't mention. And yeah, uh, that's that. It's all sorted. And it's like, so Jesus Christ, we're moving so fast. Like we've already accomplished so much in terms of. We've established our main heroes, the main plot line, thrust for everything happening, what's going to be there, and setting up exactly how this is all going to go already. Plenty of clues. It's like, so what's next? It's like, well, kind of the villain setup scene, which is also very quick. <laughs> for uh, good old Mr. Nedry, Dennis Nedry, played by the wonderful Wayne Knight, who I know from this rat race. Uh, he was in Seinfeld as well, right? Don't forget his great yeah. turn as one of the people in basic instinct oh yeah he is in that. He, he's 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 questioning Catherine tremell he says you ever tie him up his name he plays mr corelli he's like sweating in me <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> dodson dodson so we good. got dodson here so the, 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 we were talking to me and rags when we were rewatching this about how memeable this film is and how it's uh really evolved well into sort of modern culture. There's so many funny, there's like genuinely funny, and then it can be turned into so many different uh, applications for making really good jokes and stuff. It's, um, it's The meme factor for a film is a thing, and science will study it years from now, I'm sure. Yeah, um, this idea of this film came out so long ago, and yet so many of its scenes are not just iconic, but at least in terms of internet culture, they've been able to just persist through memes, which... I don't know. There's something. I don't. Maybe there's something there because it's not often that really. I mean, how often is it that really bad movies that people don't care about get memed a lot? Um, yeah, it happens, but uh, it happens. Like but, the Room was you know, one of the biggest meme movies ever, right? Um, yeah. But, but I think all, the that's... the interesting comparison we were thinking about is the meme factor for the prequels versus the sequels. Yes. Uh, prequels. The sequels are... don't get memed. No. Because no one like. Like everyone's su a lot of people are super defensive about them, and no one likes them, or so few people like them relatively. So, you know, I don't know. It's something to I I, I don't know. I don't, it's, I don't it's, know. What the it, there's something is, there. there might be we'll something find there. out what it means in the future, probably. All right, it's, we're too probably we're in the era. The era has to be complete before we can look back or something. I'm not totally just making this up as I go. But hey, the, uh, the this is just setting up, and it's really quick. He works for Hammond. He's uh, he doesn't feel he's being paid enough. With what is done with such a really great line, right? Like he looks down at the bill being delivered, and he's like, "Don't cheap out on me now, Dodson. That was Hammond's mistake." Like, yep. Nice. Well, we know why done. he's here. Yeah, that's what I mean. It's so simple, so quick. That's his motivation. And they even show us like the technology he's got to steal the thing, and his role is going to be enough to get in. It's done in like a minute. And you even have Wayne Knight making an absolutely bizarre noise. Uh, to this day, I've, 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 I remember jokes about how he sounds like a velociraptor. Um, let's see if I can play it for everybody. He's a predator who preys on other people. His sustenance comes from others. He's great. I don't even know what the through line would be there, but maybe there's something. I don't know. It's cool to compartmentalize inside. That squeal he does. <laughs> yeah, I just played it for the stream. There you go. It's... uh. I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's 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 such a weird noise, but they uh just Wayne Knight being very very happy and excited, which is uh, cool. I think the <laughs> angle here is that he's just like, oh, I'm like an I'm like a 007 type thing here. I look at my technology; it's all secret and cool, and it still works. Like all excited um, when he's going to be the biggest reason everything falls apart. Yep. Greed. I always thought it was the can. I was certain it was him because uh, it doesn't make that noise later when he opens it up. I don't think. I love that squeal he does, yeah. But yes, you could say uh, the the greed of um, of of Dennis is why at the core everything falls apart because um, this film definitely has things to say about capitalism, but it's like a super 
unregulated and focused view on making money is obviously going to lead you to making extreme unethical mistakes. There's a reason why right. everything needs focus, understanding, wisdom, regulation. You need to understand what you're fucking doing before you do all of what they do, which uh, gives us results like they do. And yeah, uh, then we get Ian Malcolm introduced, and it's like, this is the last thing we got to do before we can basically start the film. Um, let's just set him up. And how great, how great is Jeff Goldblum? Oh, he's fantastic. Oh, he's fantastic. Yep. <laughs> I mean, I know he's been memed to death. Everyone's seen all that. But his performance and the classic line that he has in this movie, you know, just Which because. Which one? Well, yeah, right. His <laughs> actually the the it, it doesn't even happen yet but but he's so great and his flirting with Laura Dern I mean perfection yeah so I, was, uh, I and, was saying it almost feels like it wouldn't make it into newer movies him just being so uh over it no he'd be a toxic with male her, fiddling with her hair yeah, well, yeah I mean, that's not a lot one of the first things he says to her is like you would know all about attraction wouldn't you like Dr. Uh, it, but it's so great because you know this is what yeah. This is this is this is classic movie banter. Yeah. This is what people used to do. They used to flirt with one another, and and it wasn't. It, it, I guess maybe it's my movie. It's my movie goer privilege showing, but I mean, come on. This is classic character building. This is fun. The audience understands it. I mean, we live in a culture now where you can't even talk to somebody without somebody going. Um, I didn't appreciate the adjectives you used. What about those adverbs? Can you change them out? But, you know, Ian Malcolm's like, uh, he's Lando Calrissian. You truly belong with us here amongst the clouds. Yes. Yeah, he's, he's, yes. Yeah, he's super charming. And he's, he's as much as, it's so Rest cool to see a character. He's that, rock and roll, man. Well, yeah, he gets called a rock star, right? Like he's, uh, I love how he's so interested in just uh, seeing if he can get him with Ellie. But at the same time, he's probably the most passionate and well worded sort of criticism of this whole part comes from him. Uh, it's, you know, he's, he's, he's more than like one note. He's got a lot going on. And yeah, uh, I don't know that uh, it could have been nailed as well as with um, Goldblum. He's he's great as him. And as a result, they continue to bring them back in the hopes that they can, you know, him and Alan. And uh, well, they It'll all be come the back magic again. And, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's because we'll that's what made the film good. More. Just having those actors, not about what they're saying or how they deliver it. It's just having them. I suppose it's nice that they don't all get murdered or something. I don't actually know. I haven't seen the new one. I assume they don't die, though. I assume it's terrible and awful and horrible. Is and that? Yes. Oh, it, really it, 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 there. It, it will hurt your soul. Mm. Oh, that's It nice. really will. I think that's one that everyone and, wants and, us to see in our audience. It's like, go watch Dominion and tell about how bad it is. It's, like... uh, it, it, it's... Here's the thing. I mean, I've worked in the entertainment business for 34 years, and and... A while I've worked at the indie level, you know, I've never had great commercial success. I I did I did buy the script for Agent Cody Banks, and I I I I'm the only single card credited producer on that film. And I watched <laughs> I watched a script that was written as Ferris Bueller meets James Bond, and when it 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 could have been a huge successful movie. And they decided after the studio bought it, you know what? We should make it for tweens, for eight to twelve year olds. And we're like, well, w w the the whole point is it's Ferris Bueller meets James Bond, and we'd already sold the script, so we couldn't do anything about it. Damn. And it was like we developed this property to be what it was. This and you guys are changing it and dumbing it down and making it for children when it should have been and i watched it happen so I, i've watched this process from inside occur and when you watch jurassic park dominion jurassic world dominion uh, it to me it, it, it's everything wrong with corporate um corporate ip stewardship in that they they a, a corporation should never and anybody who works for a corporation should never be in a position to define storytelling and the jurassic world franchise is a product of corporations defining storytelling um and i was just gonna say quick malcolm's speech in this about 
what they've done here is so applicable to the modern oh. storytelling industries it's unreal oh my god and and, oh, yeah. and it's, it's it, like... and applicable to the franchise yeah yeah you you directly. watch like, ian malcolm it, it's a cautionary tale about what not to do i mean they didn't know there was going to be six jurassic park films but he's it flat out he says it flat out and uh no one heeded his warning not in this movie and not in the subsequent five other films. No, that he, his character gets, like, chewed up and used over and over again to sell the future movies. It's unreal how much this uh, that line has aged, like, well, every best thing ever. I was going to say why, and I was like, something better than that. Something that makes that line, or makes that speech go on forever. It's uh, it's applicable on so many levels. It's amazing. Um, we'll yeah. probably talk about that more so when we get there, but... Do you think that Jurassic Park is the most, like, ironic of all of the terrible, you know, essentially IPs that have been ruined? What do you mean, because most... of what the film's about? Yeah, because what the film's about and the things that the characters sort of specifically say, how accurate it could be, you know. It's gotta be one um... of them. It's up there. Mm. <laughs> Today, Muller invented better wine. It's like wine, but better. Yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and it ages even better than wine, because it's better wine. Oh, nice. Now, there's the the thing that's very much worth highlighting here is that they're all without the seatbelts for now because it's safe. And then when they're going to be landing, he says it's going to be rocky. It always is. So everybody belt up. And uh, Alan's belt is not... He hasn't got the, the male and female sides of the connectors. Everyone else does. And, uh, you know, uh, Hammond is like, you know, Alan, come on. By the time you put it on, we'll be landed. Like, uh, Which I think is a good representation of the lack of safety sort of things that relate to the park and the fact that they're ill-prepared, because they're all fussing over it, they don't seem to be able to figure it out, which, it's like, it's a belt, how could this be hard? Is it like a big mistake or whatever? But um, there's a lot of that throughout the film. But it's also pretty clear when you start to think about it, what it represents. The old, you can't create a belt out of uh, female-female, right? And then it's like, well, what if you tie them together instead of sinking them in? That'll work well enough for what I need. And it's like, oh man, yeah, you find a way, huh? When you're in, when you when you need something done, when something's got to happen, and um, start to think about later on in the film where uh, Doctor Wu explains that all the animals have been engineered to remain female, to so they they deny them the uh, sort of development into male, and so you have no worries about any um, any offspring, and then of course. Uh, Ian Malcolm says, well, uh, you know, he has, a, we'll, we'll go over it, but he's got, he's got a pretty good speech in that scene about how this is an insane level of power you hope to control and you won't be able to, and that life finds a way. No, 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 he says life uh, finds that, that, a way. That uh, is very important, I will It's agree. so <laughs> weird. Life, uh... Life, uh, <laughs> finds a way. Well, this is a weird, one of the first things he says, I think, is like, uh, so you guys dig up bones... The, he sort of like agrees that he goes, ah, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> <laughs> like what? <laughs> it's so funny because yeah, um, uh, obviously Sam Neill is playing an absolute very normal straight man type character in Alan, and uh, he like you can tell he's got a lot of just issues with uh, Ian as the sort of first half of the film is going. Finds him frustrating because they're such mm -hmm. different people. Um. Yeah, which leads to some landing, which I kind of went over. And uh, the car ride begins, and we get a reestablishment from the lawyer that, hey, if this place doesn't pass, then, uh, you know, we're going to be shutting you down, which I think is the most interesting, right? I think Hammond points this out. The one that seems to be most against him at the beginning is the lawyer, while everyone else is sort of, like, on board for the adventure. But by the time we actually get through the initial tours, the uh, old teams flip. The lawyer is 100% on board, and everyone else is like, uh, I don't know about this. Seems like you're holding on to much more than you can necessarily bear which brings us to the brachiosaur scene one that um the famous brachiosaur yes the scene. 20 minute mark and they're they're now showing you uh showing off to you what you're going to be gaining from watching this film right and uh what a, what a good idea to start with a very huge but still the more uh you know what I, I say harmless but um a herbivore which uh, there's something about the way that they approach doing the build-up in this film of what dinosaurs they show at what scenes, uh, in what order, I guess. Because um, 
there's so many things you if we had a completely neutral state what do you want to nail with dinosaurs like well we gotta have the t-rex like yeah yeah yeah, we'll have that it's like raptors being the like super fast and scary and vicious uh dinosaurs like yeah we want to have them it's like what else like well you're gonna want to showcase the majesty of the life itself right it's not you don't need them to be killers to be interesting and that's one of the things i think that's just completely gone from any of the newer iterations of jurassic franchise wasn't really about the fact that they kill you. That makes for really interesting sort of storytelling tension and stuff. But a part of this was supposed to be that dinosaurs are so incredible and amazing because they're, they're life uh, that did exist once upon a time and nature itself is enough to marvel at. And to capture that is honestly difficult. And I'm impressed that he managed to do it so well, Spielberg. But it's not in, you know too much of a surprise being that he's made so many incredible films as well. Also, we lost Robert. Yeah. We did. He's gone he'll be back but uh yeah i don't know what do you think of the seed lads this because it's, it is uh, it's... i i think one of the things that's worth praising is the way that like uh when it rears up and uh grant puts his arms out there's a good direction in terms of what the actors are doing obviously there's nothing there for them when they're acting it out so good direction between what um like they, they needs to be an understanding this is what your character's doing, this is what you're reacting to, so it helps make the thing that's added in post and CGI more believable. Because, much like we were talking about earlier with like the Velociraptors in the jungle, if all the characters are acting very realistically and believably as to their environment, then it sells the environment in much the same way that how good it looks does. Um, when Thanos was made, you know, we had the big Thanos head that was up tall, which was, yeah. of course, very goofy at the time, but it's so that they knew where to look to Thanos' face. Um, and in a lot of other scenes that aren't directed well or in other, other productions, you have the special effects of either um, force perspective or stuff that's added in CGI, things of that nature. And the real people in the scene, they're not looking where they need to be looking. They're not looking at the eye level of the character that's being put into the movie. And so there's that big disconnect. It's like, why are you looking at Like, you're supposed to have this... The, the, this fairy or this something, whatever it is that's in CGI, but your eyes clearly are not following this character. There's some, something along the way the communication was broken. I mean, it was... So that helps a lot in this scene. To I was going to say, it's it. lucky that uh, Robert got to talk about it because uh, he'll be back. He's just... Yeah. <laughs> but, like, he's going to be out for this one, but, but luckily already, he talked about it earlier. He talked about a lot of it. It's, um... It's, this scene is iconic. Like, this. <laughs> There's no other way to describe it. Real well, there's plenty of other ways to describe it, but it's iconic. I think the one thing this film can benefit from that it's very rare to benefit from is that uh, the insane thing that we're seeing, it was a thing. It's not made up. Like, uh, right, at least like, not wholesale made up. There was, yeah, dinosaurs existed. What they look like is kind of, kind of hard to say sometimes. I think, like, our perspective on dinosaurs and what they look like has changed a lot. Uh, over recent years, it seems. Mm -hmm. But I mean, yeah, you have a sense of what a dinosaur is, and just getting to see one walk around, and it's the it's it's how they build up to the reveal, right? Of I mean, not only in this scene, but like the twenty five thirty minutes building up to this moment. But like just having it be focusing on the characters' reactions to the dinosaur at first without seeing it, and then the big wide pan over to reveal the dinosaur. It's just the perfect way to do it. Well, and it's so it's cool because. Samuel sells it perfectly that this is a man who's known about this stuff for so long and he he can't believe and he's actually seeing it. seeing it. No way this is real. Yeah. Just like, it's dinosaur, you know? Like, he can barely even utter the words. Yeah, and uh, you see, they are absolutely stunned and in awe from the fact that they're able to experience this at all. And then I love the fact that we have the direct comparison of right up to the lawyer and he's like, we're gonna make so much money. <laughs> the... Focus the values so uh, clearly in tow. It doesn't matter how overt something like that would be, because that is exactly what he would be thinking about. Because it's just true. And you know what? And an Highlights something so immediate... fucking annoying. There's a line in the newer ones where it's like, people got bored of dinosaurs. We had to genetically engineer new things, because, you know, dinosaurs is just, meh, eventually. It's like, fuck off. <laughs> like, zoos are still functional and beneficial. Like, they... The idea that dinosaurs, like, you've got a worldwide audience that have to come to you to see that. Something that you can't see anywhere else. The idea that people got bored of looking at dinosaurs, especially when there's so many dinosaurs you can even create and showcase. 
Yeah, I think the number of species that we're at now, that I think we know of, is it's in the thousands now, right? It's just um, prob I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, that there's an incredible amount of variety, and even if it's just, it's I mean, the I, the fact that they that have this attitude of. is a testament to the failure of their own creativity and a failure to recognize what made dinosaurs so terrifying and awe-inspiring in the first Jurassic Park movie. Like, if you can't make dinosaurs work with people in a movie, then you're just a failure. I, 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 I think it was just a, an actual worry from the higher-ups that when they make their new Jurassic Park films, they need to go further than T-Rexes, because that's boring now. Like, a complete misunderstanding of how any of this works. And so they actually put it into the narrative for why it happened. Because like, people are bored of them. It's like, I don't believe you, and I'll never believe you. <laughs> it's never going to happen. I can't imagine I'll ever get... I'm not even bored of seeing Jurassic Park multiple I'm not times. Bored of watching, exactly. Yeah, I'm not bored of seeing, you know, like, animatronic and CG dinosaurs. <laughs> imagine they were real, walking around. That would be... Ah, uh, uh, the idea... Yeah, just... It's just annoying. Um, it's just another element of... This is why it would be interesting to make a series of videos probably about Jurassic Park and how it just broke apart gradually. Because uh, there's so many different ways that, that I think is so clear on how they misunderstood. Or maybe they didn't even care. Maybe they did understand, but they were like, well, no, this will be the way to make more money, though. And, I mean, that film made one and a half billion dollars, so... It seems to me it is very difficult to fully respect the story of Jurassic Park and make a sequel. It almost seems, uh... like, incompatible. You definitely just, you know, watching The Lost World, it's like... Why though? You know, well, it's just like of, this film ends. This film has an it end. end. It's done. Its story is but told. It's yep. got to keep going. We got to find a reason to keep because it made too much money. It's like Mando. You know? It'll just keep going until well, it mean, doesn't make money. Jurassic Park yeah. was at the time of its release the highest grossing film of all time, um, which is so it's cool. Really not. Uh, well, and it's, uh, the, the fun little factoids in terms of like that E.T. was because it was Jaws was not uh, no. Jaws, I think, got number one, like it was the highest grossing film when it came out in 1975, and then Star Wars beat it a couple of years later, and then Steel uh, Spielberg Spielberg <laughs> comes back um, for E.T. in 1982, and then he holds that record for another 11 years until Jurassic Park, his own movie, beats it out, and then we see the same thing happen where Titanic comes number one. And then it's like another, you know, 11, 12 years. And then Avatar, also James Cameron, ends up being number one. It's kind of interesting how long those two have uh, have had that top spot, like, individually. Well, yeah, and at this point, to producers, it's like, you guys just have a magic power. This is not something that necessarily is easily recreated. Because I would even concede that about James Cameron to some extent. I don't know. Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, the, the thing is, James Cameron just earned props kind of forever just for, like, the um, the incredible films that he made before. It's just a shame that I don't I don't really get what his goal is with Avatar. Well, people want it mentioned, but I, I think we've said it a couple times. Yes, the music. The music is making a lot of these scenes that much more significant and memorable. Ah, uh, yes. It's, it's iconic. And it helps that they're in all of these, I mean, like, real, I can't believe I'm saying this, but they're in real, real places. Yeah, they're out in an actual place. field. They're out in an actual, like, the woods, you know? And, and, and it just seems like an obvious thing to do. And nowadays, with all the green screens and everything, you just like it when people go out and film in places. Because if you go out to the place, you don't have to, like, CGI a place or green screen a place. You can just go out there and stand in the dirt. And it looks like real dirt. Uh, that is awesome. Like, who's the composer? Just like, oh, you know, John Williams. <laughs> <laughs> Just John Williams. Um, and then, yeah, we get to see all of the other dinosaurs as well, right? We turn around and you see them like in their own ecosystem. And it, yeah, it's like Grant says, you know, they're moving in herds. Like, it, it's, in. it's fun to see him essentially have... Uh, you know, speculation and, and, and things that you can only, you know, speculate on because you've just got the bones and everything to get to see their behavior, you know, in front of him. It's just all so very cool, isn't it? Well, and, uh, uh, so Alan is like, you know, the natural question after seeing all that is like, how? How is this possible? And then you have this delivery from um, Attenborough that's like, I'll show you. Like, he's very... Yeah. um. 
he's so genuine, I believe. He he I think any normal person would easily be like, well, I'm not going to show you anything about how it's created patents and uh, specific sort of that's like seeing how the sausage is made. We're not going to let you do that. You can you can see all the results well, yeah, of a controlled environment. Um, but he's genuinely invested in being like, look at what we've achieved. Look at this. Isn't this amazing? And I mean, you see it again in the 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 scene in the boardroom where you know the lawyers like, dude, we got to chart. Like people will pay, like they they will pay to a lot of money to go see this. And he's like, well, no, everybody in the world should have the right to see these animals. Yep. Like his, even though he is misguided, there is a real earnestness and um and and a good intent behind what he's doing compared to yeah, just like the greed of the corporate side of just well, this is gonna make us so much fucking money. Um, it's, it's cool because the film presents, it, it, it presents like a gambit of different perspectives. There's not just the fundamentally correct and incorrect perspective. There's like the dimensions to the correctness or incorrectness of the perspectives. He's a showman. Not yeah, a even here when he, yeah. Yeah. Even here he's like, you know, say hello. And he's, he's, he's got his lines and he's saying, oh, they're going to add the music in later and it'll be really nice and everything. You know, he really enjoys the spectacle and making people, yeah. you know, enjoy things and. And he's pretty consistent throughout uh, about that until the end when he's like, yeah, maybe I, uh, yeah. You know what? Maybe this yeah, wasn't maybe great. the best idea. Well, like even him interacting with his video self is just something he clearly put thought into. Yeah. was excited to show people like that alone. is just like, yeah, he, he loves entertaining people. And uh, it's just a really good idea to have as the creator of the park being that was his motivation instead of just a money man sort of the, uh, speak. But I'm also glad that they I'll have the money that. man in it. I say I hate the DNA mascot. They should have gone with a different design. It's Gamut Fringy. Oh, you like that, huh? I bet that really blows your mind. <laughs> well, well, now I know. <laughs> um, so uh, before I give my POV on it, what's uh, what's the beef with the DNA man? I just don't like the way he's looking. I for, first off, you'll notice that in some of these, depending on the background that the DNA character is in front of. His mouth and features can be extremely hard to distinguish because he doesn't have like a body to him that can separate him from the background. Um, I don't. Uh, I just. I just don't like the. Don't like the design here of all the little circles and stuff. I just never. So the like reason it. I like oh, him I... so much is because yeah. I. I take this whole scene to be such a representative of the problem. It's such a goofy and fun like. Um, oh, Mr. I, DNA, I that's where you come. Uh, well, to be fair, I mean, I'm talking about his design this... as well. Okay. So he's he's like, uh, everything he delivers is all so fun and peppy. He's a series of circles that are all different colors. He's kind of like a clown, like of a cartoon. And, and, and we're treating this all like it's a big uh, festival, showcase, fair, fun thing, when what he's describing is literally the power of a god. Like, what they've done is insane. They can create life at will. And uh, they can uh, take it from like all of history, uh, which is what I, I think they could have done that with uh, another design. But mine is just one in terms of like artistically the uh, kind of the way that it kind of blends into the background in some of the scenes where I don't think that was intentional because the mouth doesn't have like a he doesn't have like a head. So depending on you know, like the background, the, the mouth just sort of disappears. Uh, that's just all I, I would just change it up to something different. Well, it's going to be a rushed project, so you could definitely see it as having in-world uh, reasons for why it's not as uh, efficient as possible. Maybe, you maybe. were just highlighting how he uh, he wants to reassure them it's going to look better and be... Well, it's going to be better by the end. Okay. Oh, you sound, sound like you're aggressively agreeing. <laughs> no, 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 I, I get it. That, that's a, that is a reasonable thing, because it is not finished. They don't even have the final music and everything. And maybe this is DNA Man, you know, 1.0. Maybe in future they'll be like, oh, let's uh, change the design a little bit and, you know, work on things. Because, yeah, uh, you know, it's impressive, but uh, you, you obviously have Malcolm just getting further and further interested in staring at this thing. Like, yeah, he leans forward and looking. Yeah, well, so I, I, I like it because it is, um, you know, the whole time he's been sort of a goofster, like he's a very chill, so, you know, he's like a very chill guy. But then as he's starting to be fed, I mean, you mentioned it before, Mola, like he comes across as the, he is the first and the harshest in terms of his uh, flat rejection of the notion of Jurassic Park. Yeah, it's I... like it begins here <laughs> when the science actually begins and he begins to understand like, wait, this is how it's actually sort of happening. Yeah, which is almost disturbing when you can think about 
many of its applications, which is the same for all technological advancements. That's like a warning you always have. It's, I think Crichton has written several stories that regard that specifically. I'm pretty sure Westworld is going to be another... Plenty of crossover themes between this and Jurassic Park. Uh, Westworld and Jurassic Park. Um, so Robert said he would be back in a few minutes. I don't know what's happened. I don't know if his power's gone out or anything, but of course uh, he can jump in whenever. <laughs> I just don't know what else to do yeah, other than continue yeah. talking about Jurassic Park. I suppose we have to. Um, so yeah, uh, they say like the geneticists will take over where the DNA strands are incomplete uh, from what they draw out of mosquitoes that are fossilized within amber and then they fill in with uh, frog DNA. Which to me, yep. I have no idea how viable that would be in science, but to me it, it stretches over into this is our sci-fi take. Like, uh, I'll believe it. I'll, it's not yeah. unbelievable. I'll, I'll buy into it. You could buy it. it. You know? so, um, well, it, 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 would this film be considered sci-fi? Uh, uh, yeah, it's definitely science fiction. We can't make dinosaurs. Uh, it's just, it, technically, it, it, yeah, technically, yes. I don't know if people I was going to say, I think, I was going to say, on paper, I think yes, but a lot of people associate, I think, Jurassic Park with more action adventure almost. Um, well, I mean, I'd say that science fiction, action, and adventure aren't like incompatible. They're almost like different ones, right? Like, if you were thinking about what uh, d types of genres exist in film, it's like you can have, you know, like an action adventure that's a fantasy or science fiction. Um, yeah. I think that, um, Someone said it's too soft, I'm guessing, when they're talking about, like, the elements of science in it. Um, but I'm not sure if that would be, because it's, like, soft and hard science fiction as genres. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not, I, I have no idea where this would sit. Well, uh, yeah, we can't make wanna... dinosaurs yet. Well, yet is kind of the relevant part about science fiction compared to fantasy, is there is a level of, you're trying to present it as plausible, s s to some degree, rather than outright magic. Um... Even if the technology might be infeasible, or we later discover that it's impossible or something. You know, like, um... And so I imagine Jurassic Park would... Jurassic Park would surely be science fiction. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I figured that that wasn't even up for debate. And and I guess it's, um... And, and it partially just stems from, I guess, as well, the, the desire to, to, to some extent, provide explanations for, uh... For, for you know for how it works is what the whole scene with them in the laboratory is is or, or this whole sequence in general is okay let's you know we've presented the information of dinosaurs are here let's make some effort to explain how it all works um and it's all relevant too right because it's all like reinforcing and building up um the uh what we what we see later the main example of that would be the nature of the breeding of like yeah no we all of them are female. Uh, we we have the eggs here. Like we want to control this environment. We want to um, we're going to control the population on this island. Only to later find out that th they have been breeding on the island itself. That like all of the, the efforts that they've made to try and control them have just not. It's just not working. Like it's not working as intended. That's kind of like that vibe throughout the the whole scene um, of of just a watching what they've done with a level of awe, but just a sort of question mark above it all, like, hmm, hmm, not too sure about that. It's, um, I, I, yeah. uh, I'm just thinking about, like, what else I would want to draw from, uh, from that scene. Well, I mean, it's it's also the instance where it's explaining, like, with the mosquitoes, right? And we saw it in the opening scene of the film. It feels it feels very symbolic, right? Of like um, the mosquito trapped in time as it was, and then just you know using the science to extract that material that's been trapped in time instead of just appreciating it for what it is now. Like the same with the fossils, to then draw it out, you know, draw it out, kind of like in a way that feels like hmm. Uh, hmm, you know, and then and then uh, start to breed dinosaurs from it. These Ravicon gloves here, the VR, yeah, the the it's funny to look back. It's like we did this with VR, and you look uh, at it and you're like, oh yeah. Well, there there is kind of that. Like it's it's kind of charming at this point. Like a lot of the technology back then of like, oh man, it's super advanced. These computers, and you look at us it, like, dude, it's so early mid nineties computers. <laughs> like, yeah. 
It's so it's so all the odd. monitors and the 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 way that all wow. the files and everything look and the, yeah, the hacker the the stuff yeah. on the, when they're when they're sorting through to like get all of the the systems back online how it's all presented with these like three D, uh, it's like presented with all of this three D um like like screens and stuff instead of just lines of you know code or text. It's charming, but you know. Um, and also, uh, like the line uh, where where he says here, "No, we have no animatronics here." You know, like it's that's kind of like a, a like a fun meta line. You know, the anima, you know, like the, the puppets and animatronics sort of work in this film. It's it's done so well that you don't even think that they are, and you're being sold in almost like two different ways that these aren't really. You know, you're not really uh, looking at animatronics and in, in universe saying, "No, no, no, there's no animatronics here," but it, but it works. You know. Something I find interesting about that that we see so much in the film, and we we see it here, like uh, I mean, it, here it's it's pretty sharp. Of uh, they're in the lab and they watch the new dinosaurs, you know, hatching from the eggs, and all of the scientists like can't help but you know be like in awe of this, like they love it, and particularly like um, it's it's just uh, it's just so fascinating, right? It's like the scientific interest. Uh, like pulls them into it but then you know it contrasts sharply with when they're in the boardroom and e even with for how cool it all is and how much they they really love witnessing it just the uh the need to push back that like this probably isn't a good idea it's kind of like interesting to present though like I, I, I guess it's more so that it comes after the velociraptors can't resist comparing uh so like this is like roller coaster showcasing in the form of a ride their god powers, which uh, is having obviously different reactions from different people. But uh, by the way, very happy they included all of this. They could not have. Uh, what um, the desire to make it seem more like a theme park? That and the uh, the information on how it all comes together. They could have just skipped it. They could have been like, yeah, we cracked it. They science, have, science, yeah, science we use science it. stuff, you know. Yeah. The, the, but it it just helps add to its believability. It's like, yeah, this all seems like you know. It it doesn't break the bounds of reason. I could buy into this concept, and um, so that means you know makes the fact that there's dinosaurs running around in this park like a believable thing. But like this to me as well, it feels so applicable to the whole because we're going to get to his speech soon about how what he says uh, Malcolm applies yep. to our feelings about modern IP, so to speak. But this feels like Hammond is like it, it's it's unfair because Hammond's much more um, I would say ethical than Disney in terms of. Not necessarily ethical. His characteristics are much more noble, in terms of he wants what he wants is much more uh, desirable as a trait than just to make money, so to so to speak. Yeah, he yeah. wants the yeah. world to enjoy and experience dinosaurs as they were. Um, it's just sort of a failure to realize, yeah, that's a the thing they were and they're not anymore. And and you have all these fun and colorful and interesting things. It's like replace it all with just you know Mando's on his ship swinging around. And he's got Baby Yoda uh -huh. and the Boba uh -huh. Fett's there, and he's flying around. And Luke and Kenobi are all there with their lightsabers swinging around. He's like, isn't this great? Yeah. Look at it all. Isn't that wonderful? And you're just like, hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and then you're like, how do you do this? And instead of all the side stuff you see here, it's all of the uh, the AI stuff to make respeech it to yeah. quickly do CG to uh, they have Tatooine as a set. They're like, we've used this as an astonishing twenty eight times. I bet you didn't know. And you're like. No. <laughs> we are getting our money's worth off of this one. Yep. Yeah. Like, it's so effective, so efficient. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I find it uh, fascinating. Um, someone said uh, I would actually disagree with the, with the plot of Jurassic World. People would totally start creating hybrid dinosaurs due to boredom. I would like a correction. I don't deny that there's a chance they would create hybrid bo uh, dinosaurs, but nobody's getting bored fucking bored of dinosaurs. It's not happening. Especially when there's so much variety. Like, people don't get bored of real animals. Zoos, yeah. If I feel like that's, that's such an easy comparison. Dinosaurs are going to be so much more incredible than your average, like, otter. But at the same time, otters are really fucking cool to see. Yeah, yeah otters are great. And so, Seals and yeah, the idea that... Uh, 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 so fast, too. Like, uh, we're already getting bored. Isn't this, uh, this only yeah, been functional for, for so years. long in that film, right? Jurassic, the Jurassic yeah. World Park. Not that long. <sighs> Yeah, um, you I mean, you'd be fine. Guess... You you the, that place would be stocked to the brim, uh, for so so long. People all around the world would want to come see. Yep. 
yeah, they don't have anything to worry about there in terms of interest and attendance. Like, if we had a park run in for maybe a hundred years, I might entertain the idea that it's become incredibly normal. Uh, but, like I said, if we just talk about zoos are still going just fine. They don't need to hybridize a lion with a eagle to make enticing animals to see at the zoo. Sponsored by Verizon, wasn't it? Something like that. <laughs> but yeah, uh, then we get a scene that's just another one that's iconic and it ends up being shown and referenced. It's actually in the thumbnail. The birth of a velociraptor. Mm. And uh, it, you can't help but compare Hammond in this moment to like what feels like God. In terms of like, this is a creation that I have managed to produce almost fully. And here it is. And and what I love about it so much is his attitude. It's just filled with wonder and excitement. Yeah. Um, it's so kind of adorable. And uh, that it, there's so many different tones to go through. Right? If you're designing this scene, you're like, you want to capture that because that is very much in line with his character. But then by the time we hit the end of the scene, if you remember the shot, you have uh, Wu telling Grunt it's a velociraptor and his fucking expression... Like you bred raptors? Like, what? Like are you insane sort of thing? And then he just looks down, and he himself is holding in his hands a velociraptor alive. Yeah. Like, ah, oh, so great. Well, it's, it's uh, the, the contrast of, you know, at first the awe, right, for these animals, but then even for as much as, you know, the, the scientists, like, really are just enamored with them, it's just, you know, every now and then it's just, oh, but wait, like, you shouldn't be doing this. <laughs> like, that just keeps coming back, you know? It's and, like uh, a back and forth. I quite love the visual, by the way, of the automated robotic arm caring for the eggs. Yeah. Seems uh, pretty appropriate. It's like, hmm, that's pretty cold, isn't it? It's, um, it's, it's I don't know, there's, there's a lot to be drawn from it, I think, of, like, uh, the nature of how we have built it like tools the use of tools one of the most impressive things our species does and we've gotten to the point where we can now generate life ourselves with our tools uh, and it's the tools that are like ensuring the care through automation of course which is going to be the mm -hmm. big downfall of the park yeah um and it's the yeah just the impressiveness of how it looks it looks really darn good and it's all just like puppetry and that's all practical yep uh, and, and they wouldn't so good. do that anymore they wouldn't do it anymore. Yeah, it'd be fake, and it would look to varying degrees of fake. And, and just, there, there's an appreciation that you have with it. Do you well, remember? It's just with... Oh, go for it. Um, actually, wait, you go first, because I'll set up what I'm talking about. I was just going to say, it's kind of lame that you can do it with a little puppet, but then it's just like, but nah, what, nah. Why would we do that? <laughs> so that moment where it's it's hatching has always been, so it always struck me as just an excellent scene. And uh, I remember when I was like, I'm going to give this whole uh, whole Jurassic World thing, I'm going to give it a chance, all right? Because I'm nice, and I'm, I'm putting it on screen. But this is the hatching scene that happens immediately in that film. It's like the first thing you see. And I remember thinking to myself, like, man, this fucking sucks. <laughs> like, we're, <laughs> we're, we've, we've, we've regressed. It's gone so far back. It's like, and it again just strikes me immediately as like, look! It's the thing. It's the hatching dinosaurs. You like this, and it's all CG. It's like, yeah. And, yeah, uh, that's a... Yeah, no. That's the thing, sterile. That's what I almost just said. Where is Robert? Yeah. I'm, I'm hoping he's going to come back at any moment. I am not sure. Oh, wow. Oh, oh. There he is. <laughs> nice uh, nice timing there. Uh, oh, oh. There he I, is. I, I, I'm sorry. Right. I had to jump on and, and make an appearance and be humiliated. Wait, on, on the Spanish... On a Spanish-speaking show on my channel... They 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 do a, a, a they 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 show me a title of a Spanish a Spanish title of a movie and I have to guess what it is. Oh, okay. And um, uh, it was I thought it was I even said Jurassic Park, but it was the Spanish title for Slither, and I didn't get it. I see. But now now All I'm right. back. Yeah. So um, it, but I was thinking Jurassic Park. I was like, oh, okay, why not? You well, know, you so now I'm here. Missed out on a couple scenes. But we're all right. We're still relatively early on. I was just showing the wonderful audience how much we adore the hatching scene in Jurassic Park and how well executed it is. Not oh, only for it's the way it's so shot, good. the characters, what it can mean, what you can draw from it and stuff. But I then was like, 
just reminds me of how much I was immediately put off when I was watching Jurassic World that their opening scene is a CG hatching. And I was just like, yeah. I mean, again, another great practical effect. You know, I mean, Stan Winston Studios, a peak, uh, it's so good. And you believe it. It's all about believability. So well done. <clears throat> oh, sorry. Uh, okay, I'm going to get rid of Jurassic World unless I end up fucking referencing it later. I don't know. I seem to be doing that a lot. <laughs> I clearly love it. I think one of my memories of watching it was with my, uh, with my sister. And I was so, like, just in a poo-poo mood throughout it. Because I already, um, I don't know what the feelings are in Jurassic Park 3. A lot of people feel 50-50 uh, on that, I think. But at least, um, I always had less hatred for that movie just because of the fact that it's got a very specific goal to not at all be like this, uh, or Last Will or anything. It's just a, it's like a rescue movie, and that's about it. Um, yeah, I mean, look, I don't, I don't hate The Lost World, and I don't hate Jurassic Park 3. Because I think that there's something in every man's DNA that loves dinosaurs. Like, perhaps perhaps that from 65 million years ago, it's part of our, you know, whatever the human DNA thing is, we have to love dinosaurs. So I'll watch anything that gives me dinosaurs eating people. Or flying dinosaurs. Or we talking velociraptor, maybe? Yeah, whatever. <laughs> I'll watch it. If there's If there's a... If there's a dinosaur, I mean, even Whoopi Goldberg's movie that uh, when she was in it with partnered up with the dinosaur, I will watch that. And um, so I don't hate Jurassic World and I don't hate Jurassic Park 3, but they're not good movies. Do you hate the sequels? Well, yeah, the, the Jurassic <laughs> well, World yeah. movies. I, 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 the thing is, here's the thing. I, I again... I I find them to be uh what I what I hate about them is they're just, it's they're just they're not necessary. And and I do appreciate they've made, you know, a billion dollars, a billion plus. It's great that they're they employ people and it's great that they make a lot of money for the studio. But at the end of the day, you know, if I had made Jurassic World Dominion, I would have said it a hundred years later. And and the world would have been the 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 danger that that Hammond created actually was the demise of mankind, and the reason it's called Dominion is because okay. the world was was destroyed. And that's, um, uh, that's an idea, I guess. Why? Well, I, <laughs> I guess that's not but, the route I'd take. But I mean, but if you if you think about it, you, you've brought back an ecosystem that that was ex that went extinct. And it's an ecosystem that shouldn't exist. And it would have been interesting to see a hundred years later what would have happened to the earth. Um, and, you know, use it as a metaphor for global warming, use it as a metaphor for the decline of Western civilization, whatever. But what would have happened if life finds a way? Um, it's not just the dinosaurs, it's the ecosystem that comes along with them. Oh, we and, would have shot them with bullets, and they so would have that's died. the thing for me. Uh, the reason it's why I, the problem. I can believe Jurassic Park is that there's several civilian level people, and they don't have access, great access to weaponry. But this is why I hate the whole like we're going to get dinosaurs in the military. It's like no, you're not. That's not happening. <laughs> well, no, yeah. no, but 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 here's the thing: you can't, you can't like like you can't kill every dinosaur the same way you can't kill every you can't kill every bit of wildlife. You, you saying like they all... kill every land dinosaur? The thing is, is that um, when when we didn't intend to do it, we've hunted a lot of animals to the point that they nearly became extinct with worse technology, and we weren't. Yeah, like, but okay, okay, it. hang on a second. We're talking about a fantasy film franchise. All right, we, we talk about how it. guns. Would... If... No, we don't. We absolutely don't have to do that. Well, we have Come to on. find a way that works, bit. right? Oh. So yeah, what I would want to do is you got to find maybe generate characters who want that to happen, and so they facilitate it in some way. Yeah, however, however it's however it's done. I mean, the reality of it, it it's have to work not hard like hard to do it. Yes, but here's the thing: what if? Here's how I would do it. What if the unintended? Uh, we talk about dinosaurs, but what about 
sub microscopic. What about a virus? You know, well, oh yeah. If you want to, sure. uh, if you want to wipe out me. humanity yeah. and bring in yeah. dinosaurs, yeah, that's another way you could do it. You know, and and, and, on, and the thing you know, is, the the unintended consequence of bringing back these large creatures is the microbes that live on them. I mean, yeah, it's a stretch. No, I, but, I, 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 I'm much more in favor of that idea that we bring back dinosaurs. We also bring back an ancient disease that wipes. That's what they yeah, like yeah. The uh, But you're also well, bringing so. back, uh, but a whole, you know, there's a, there's a, um, there's a, a phenomenal series of science fiction novels uh, written by David Gerald, who was a Star Trek writer. And I'm kind of obsessed with these books. And the series is called The War Against the Ktor. And the premise of this series is the Earth is invaded by an alien ecosystem that begins at the equatorian level and it spreads outward and it is a it, it might be we don't know what, we don't know how it got here it might have been on a meteor or whatever and this ecosystem is is millions of years more advanced than the earth's ecosystem and it it is slowly uh taking over the planet and uh, it, it's a fascinating series of books. But the thing is, he never finished it. He's only written four books. Ecosystems don't really get more advanced, per se, um, as well, they just... Because like, evolution's but, not like a race to a No, but, but, but imagine if you had all of a, 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 a different planet. It's not that it's a race, but it's a different ecosystem from a different planet, like a spore that is 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 much more it 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 i mean hey it's still a science fiction novel it digs in and from it starts with a virus the ecosystem we don't even know it's here it's a sub microscopic virus that wipes out uh, a large swath of yeah, humanity yeah things here don't have immunities to it yeah we don't it, it's hmm. the same thing and and that's what happens it, when i say it's an older ecosystem it it it's it's it, it it was developed on a different planet with different environmental conditions, and we are not equipped to um, fight against it. It's and, like a color out of space or annihilation. Yeah, but very like much good so. versions very, of those movies. Yes, <laughs> and the the books are incredible. They're so great, and and that's kind of maybe that's why because I've read these books like four times all the way through. Um, that's what I was thinking about with Jurassic Park. It's not just the dinosaurs they brought back, and it, this is a stretch. But you know the whole that's how you do it ecosystem. Well, yeah, uh, Sattler if, does like, if... mention it. She she talks about how um, we have no idea what to expect by bringing back not just them, but the world that they thrive in can be brought back with them at least to some degree because they bring back fauna, right, of different kinds. They're not right, even and, just and using the tech to bring back dinosaurs. They bring back all kinds of things. And, and one of the things I've always thought about, like the environment, um, our environment. You know, if you think about it, all of the creatures on our planet evolved over millions of years together. So there's a reason no. why. Well, some no. of it, yeah. No, yeah, some of them are together, but a lot of them are independent of each other. Like you have like Australian things of that nature. Well, that's okay. why you have like invasive species. Well, but you'd still have they, they they all have to live within its atmosphere, and it, there's a lot yes. of consistencies through it. Yeah, 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 that, yeah, yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. So, but yeah. yeah, but what what I what I mean is that all of these things that exist. I mean, yeah, there are places where one species never had to fight off another species or whatever. But if you go from the submicroscopic level all the way to our atmosphere, you know, um, we don't understand how migrating species in Africa might affect uh, Asian, the atmosphere in, in uh, Mongolia, for instance. We don't even have the technology to even conceive of how that might work because our entire biosphere is, and like you, know, you said, Mahler, it's the same atmosphere. We don't even know if there's something going on on our planet atmospherically that touches everybody that breathes it human beings we go 40 feet below sea level we die in the ocean we go 10,000 feet up a mountain and we need air to breathe we'll die our own planet only allows us to exist in a certain bit of it so 
what does that mean globally and uh, entirely? And the whole thing about Jurassic Park, one of the things I loved about it as a science fiction novel, and one of the things I love about Michael Crichton's work, um, you know, the thing about Michael Crichton who wrote Jurassic Park is he was a he he wrote and directed Westworld, the nineteen seventy three movie that the TV series was based on. He wrote that and directed that movie. And and people forget that Michael Crichton was a writer director. He was a filmmaker. And uh, he he wrote and directed the Great Train Robbery, and um, uh, he he Jurassic Park was a later. I mean, he created the TV series ER, and so he was a man of science. He Disclosure that was a movie with Michael Douglas and Demi Moore. He wrote that book. So Michael Crichton, who who created this franchise, was an incredibly diverse and. Um, interesting storyteller and he was a doctor in real life so um i don't Did know you say that earth is barely habitable <laughs> well in a way it kind of is depending on who you are or where you live okay and and i think the dinosaurs um one of the things that look there's nothing cooler than dinosaurs in a city and i will like like and and i've always said there is nothing that is isn't made better than the application of ninjas or dinosaurs. <laughs> I mean, pretty fun. Uh, really uh, I mean, cool. and and That's but cool. but, but but like imagine we all love Godzilla and kaiju destroying, but but dinosaurs. One of the great things about Jurassic Park, not to jump ahead, but the raptors in a room, in a structure when dinosaurs. One of the most iconic images in cinema history is the banner falling over the T-Rex. Well, yeah, and that's, yeah, because uh, that's often the image thought of with your, Jurassic Park. Uh, yeah, and it's because the like incongruous really... nature of a T-Rex in a in a in a in a building is that, that I mean that that's it, man. And that I think that's the great appeal of the franchise. But I didn't mean to derail the conversation. I, mean, I apologize. No, it, it, there's an element that's true um, that I think I was talking about it when we were watching the movie uh, the other day, and I'd referenced it before. But a lot of the times, what makes something terrifying and immersive is where it is. Uh, we find places of safety, places that are familiar to us. Um, and if yeah. you put monsters into those sorts of places, they become scarier because that's not where they belong. Monsters are in the woods. They're in the caves. They're in other Man, under the bed, dude. Yeah, they're under the bed. Yeah, but but when you take these things and you put them into extremely familiar environments where they're extra out of place, it brings along with it this implication of you know immersion and believability, and it makes us very uncomfortable. Um, Hundred percent. By the way, so you... yeah, when you have dinosaurs running around in a kitchen chasing kids, he's like, oh, kids, I know what those are. A kitchen. I've been there. Like, oh, that's you know, I can kind of imagine this really, really happening. Well, it's it's interesting Oops. to consider because a dinosaur doesn't have a conception of what these places are. We do. We know what a building is, yeah. but like a dinosaur doesn't. It's just an environment that they're just trying place, to figure yeah. out. Uh, you, but you nailed it. I mean, that that's exactly... I mean, I think you just defined the entire horror genre. Oh, my God. And uh, how it works. You know, one of my favorite movies of all time and one of my... Certainly my favorite horror film of all time is The Exorcist. Because on one hand, it's incredibly goofy. You know, the idea that the devils come up from hell to possess the, the soul of a young girl. Well, S Zack Snyder specifically told me that uh, devils come from above. Ah, that is, that is a lot <laughs> that's of a, There we go. That's a, well, that's a thing. But I mean, <laughs> a, a, but that movie makes you believe, just like any great movie, any great fantasy film, whether it's horror, science fiction, fantasy, it has to make us believe. And the great thing about Jurassic Park is throughout this film, it like when you're watching these little eggs hatching and these little hatchlings come out, the 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 great thing about it is we're all going, oh, they're so cute. I mean, we have that whole puppy instinct, and I have eight uh, week old puppies in my house. I mean, you have wait, that. Wait, 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 wait. Just a second. Just to be clear. You have eight week old, week old puppies, puppies or eight week old puppies? I have 
eight puppies that were born a week ago. I oh, saw okay. images of them. They look cute. I'm just trying to picture this in my head as you tell your story. Yeah. Yes, and and but 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 that's when you see these <laughs> these these dinosaurs being born, they're like our our instinct of of wanting to protect and wanting to love and wanting to hold them and pet them. It's so great. The scene, the movie makes us it suddenly makes us the viewer going these dinosaurs are we love them it's a no, it's a it, it's almost like a non-malicious kind of entitlement totally <laughs> yeah it's and, like and I don't, what a great w very well put like so we run with that, that angle for the the sort of opening but the scene does end on an ominous ominous look and tone well like, yeah you know what these things become right like yeah killers it's just like um what was his name rex uh damn it from the simpsons rex uh well the the investigator like you know baby alligators might seem cute but they grow up like <laughs> it's that oh damn, all the baby his... visions of it's rex cult i don't know if you ever was saw like... um tiger king but oh, like, like... Rex cult was from, uh... one of the yeah. bigger ways they were able to sell a lot was the the baby lions and stuff baby tigers they're all like the the ones everyone loves to play with is super cute, but there's just like an age. They'll they'll be like a, it's not even for very long before they become lethal. You got to get them away, basically. Uh, right. But, yeah, yeah, if you're gonna, there. yeah, if you're gonna be a caretaker of those animals, there's very specific ways that you interact with them so that they won't just maul you in the face the second they get. They have to, well, you have to behave in certain ways, and you have to make sure that they see you as a certain thing. It's it's complicated and it's dangerous. Well, I, I, it's um, when you see like alligator or crocodile, people who work with them, a lot of what they'll, you know, say is like, they're not my friend, you know, like, like, and, and the animal doesn't consider me a friend. Um, th like, it's, it's kind of, you know, when people sort of, oh, the animal loves me. It's like, uh, careful, <laughs> like, you know, like you not all careful. animals are the like, same. Dogs, not all animals dogs are the dog that you've had since you know? uh, it was a puppy. So be cats, careful. Cats will be big old fans of you for sure. But it's like, yeah, an alligator. Yeah. <laughs> careful. Yeah. And, not uh, quite the same. Yeah. Uh, Hammond then wants them to like, go have lunch and talk about the wonders of the park. But, uh, Alan's like yeah. pushing to see the feeding and to find out as much as he can about these and then Muldoon turning up and saying like they should be destroyed, they're lethal at age blah blah and uh uh you know, Hammond's like, ah he's a he's a bit of an alarmist, you know. It's yeah, it's just it's a, that kind of guy. It's, 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 don't worry about it. Like it's, it's nothing to panic about. And um I just like the 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 feeding uh sort of straps and stuff, they get it's torn to rustling. shreds. Yeah, the rustling leaves, and you're just left oh, on good. all of the it's... characters' reactions to it, but you don't get to see it because you don't need to see it. It's it's scarier that you don't, and that, you yeah. see the effect it has on the environment and the people watching. And then yeah, it lifts up and it's covered in blood and destroyed, which uh, is a double whammy, right? In terms of just look at the ferocious power, but simultaneously they're not prepared properly. That is obviously not the best way to feed them if it's going to result in your technology getting destroyed every time. So yeah. this is still clearly a new process for them. It's a, a level of um, I don't know if I'd say inefficiency, but uh, it, it ain't. This is ain't Mark One yet. feeding delivery system. <laughs> it could well, be Mark yeah, Three at this point. Um, this is not working out. It's just, uh, and it's it's something that gets mentioned, you know, later on when they they at the uh, Tyrannosaurus um, enclosure, and then they just put the goat there. It's like T Rex doesn't want to just be like fed a goat like on a on a slab. Right, like the animals have behavior, and the way that they treat and take care of these animals clashes very heavily with their behavior because they don't really understand their behavior. They're like yeah. animals that humans have never interacted with before. It's like the notion that you could meaningfully affect control over these animals when you barely even understand how they behave. You know, it's like bound for disaster, really. Yeah, because uh, like we already have that problem with animals today. They're not taken care of well in a lot of like the worst zoos. Yeah. Um, so imagine mm -hmm. doing it with something as the the power the in dinosaurs. dinosaurs. Yeah, exactly. Who, uh, I do love this scene with them talking to each other in the boardroom. It's so great. It's really efficient. Everyone is yes. within character, and they raise some really great and very. Uh, Deep thought points about how everything's going. I just like the uh, the inversion, right? The lawyer guy when he comes is like, you know, the investors they're worried. Like, if one thing's wrong, they're going to pull your funding. And then as soon as he sees all the dinosaurs, it's like, so this is awesome. We're going to be merchandising this. We're going to charge like ten thousand yeah, dollars per ticket. Seeing dollar bills. It's, it's flipped, right? The enthusiasm of uh, all of the scientists 
it's now you know it's it's very muted and it's all just focused on hmm you probably shouldn't be doing this and the fact that yeah malcolm is the one who was like the most fervent in saying you shouldn't be doing this when originally he had the most like lackadaisical sort of chill attitude about you know coming here um yeah it's, it's just it, interesting it, right there's it's a reason dynamic of uh, why he's yeah. the because they treat him as the he's the trendy one they're bringing in to get like approval because he's probably good yeah. in his field but this is us seeing that he's good in his field he is good in his field because he and he said it you know in the scene with the uh the the velociraptors hatching you know the the life finds a way like you the illusion of control that you think that you have here is is uh it's ridiculous and and i think he says like the lack of respect essentially for like the powers that you're playing with here are staggering like it's it's actually offensive to him how little regard they're showing for what they're doing, um, and then of course it culminates in in that classic line: "You were so concerned with whether or not you could that you didn't stop to think whether or not you should." Classic. I love that line. It's so good. Well, it's funny. Another classic. Um, you know? I really enjoy the line, but his 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 speech is uh, which I repurposed for talking about the state of the <laughs> MCU, <laughs> and I think it was the Black Widow video. Um, so he says, like, don't you see the danger? Genetic power is the most awesome power this world has ever seen, and you wield it like a kid with his dad's gun, which is something mm -hmm. a lot of people will reference with anything going forward. It's just a really great way to explain what you're doing. Like, because children are oftentimes, they're not ill-intended with the gun necessarily, but they just run around because guns are cool toys, and it's like, that yeah, is I'm not of, uh, the respect you need. There was a, there was a line, I remember, in Assassin's Creed 3, um, where, uh, like Connor, he's just assassinated this guy, and um, he it basically the, the the guy believes that like Connor, the main character, is is idealistic and just doesn't understand the world. And he says, "You you may wield you 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 wield your blade like a man, but your mouth like a child." Just the notion of yeah, you're very competent, but like your ideology is so like narrow and and um and underdeveloped. Like I don't have any respect for you. <laughs> kind of, it's uh reminds me of that. Just sort of the clashing of like, yeah, your means that you have here to achieve things is incredible, but you just haven't thought about it. You just haven't thought it through. Um, you're just not seeing the bigger picture almost. Yeah. Uh, he goes on to say the this power didn't require any discipline to attain it. You read what others yeah, have done. You took line. the next yeah. step. You didn't Oof, earn the knowledge yeah. yourselves. On that the hits hard. Giants. It does hit hard, especially when line. you repackage it for uh for media, <laughs> for Jurassic Park. Or Jurassic Park, the IP, well. yeah. You didn't yeah. you didn't have the discipline to acquire this IP. You didn't do all the work to get it to where it is. You don't even understand it. Well, is that not just a great representation of Jurassic World as a whole, <laughs> like a whole series? Yeah, you, well, so dude. Crazy, what he says, you stood on the shoulders of geniuses, being Spielberg and yeah. all of the army of amazing people that made this film. And then to accomplish yeah. something as fast as you could, they rolled out Jurassic World as soon as they would realize they had that and then, potential. And before you knew yeah. what you had, you patented it, packaged it, and slapped it on a plastic lunchbox, and now you're selling it, selling it, selling I mean, it, selling yeah, it. yeah, merchandising and all of the, the attempts, box office gross of Jurassic Park, Jurassic World as a franchise. Man, and you could just apply it to so many things. You could apply it to all of the franchises that have been run into the fucking dirt. Yeah, like, obviously the people last, saying Star Wars, Star Wars is a... Fantastic Wars, example. Terminator, Alien, Predator. Yeah, all of these classics. You know, seventies, eighties, and nineties. <laughs> Science fiction. Why? Action why do you think? Why do you think it is that these franchises? Obviously, I understand keeping an IP going, but why do you think IPs are? I I would dare say that perhaps the Mad Max franchise, because the creator of that franchise has stuck with it. George, George Miller, Miller has been involved with all of them. But why, why is it that the incentive to make to to make IP to continue a franchise is to make money, and yet they're not as good as the original, and and it's a law of diminishing returns, and all we do is see. These great franchises that you would think are no brainer brainers to continue. Why why are they not? Why are they not done well? What what is like Jurassic Park is not exactly um the most difficult franchise in the world to understand. And yet when it goes on, we don't get greatness. 
in them. Whereas if you look at a franchise like the Mad Max franchise, I mean, some people, when when uh, Beyond Thunderdome came out in, in, in 85, people were disappointed by it. And I understand it, it wasn't the road warrior because that was amazing. Uh, Mad Max 2 was amazing. However, it was, if you look at it as far as it goes and you get to Fury Road, still respected. But the Jurassic um, Park franchise, even after the first film, is the law of diminishing returns. So I think they just don't really know uh, what it is that was great about the thing that they're copying. Um, it's uh, it's like when you're looking at a great piece of art and you don't it, it, you just sort of see what it is. It's like oh, it's a bunch of people on a ceiling and all these guys in robes and oh, look at that guy. Da, 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 da. But you don't really understand you know, underneath what the stories are about or the effort that went into it or the thought process behind making it. They're not copying a thing's quote-unquote soul in a way. They're just the thing as it in its most superficial sense. Uh, they're trying to copy I, uh, what people think they're of. They're not copying the process that made it. They're copying, like, the results. Yeah. Which is almost... There's no they're substance in it. Skipping to the finish line yeah. in a sense. Why? They're, all the, they're painting the finish line. They're not painting the, you know, the dash there. I um I'm now thinking about vid video games often get sequels. There are a lot yeah. of video long running video game franchises that have been running for like 30 plus years that still feel new and fresh and are of high quality, like Mario or Legend of Zelda. Um or like why why is cuz video games get sequels all the time. I think that video games like, if you were to present to me the premise of, do you want a sequel to a film or a sequel to a video game? Like, which do you think is going to have the better result? I generally defer to a video game because, like, finding an excuse to keep a story going is a lot harder than we have a game here that has mechanics that we can, like, expand upon and further develop. Um, and then attach like, a story to finding, it. Uh, yeah, and, and, you, and, you know, some games aren't very focused on story. Other games are, and they find a way to make it work. But if you're, like, trying to continue Jurassic Park, it's like... That's kind of challenging because this this film ends so conclusively that finding a reason to come back here and to keep telling this story beyond the simple incentive of making more money it's like that's kind of challenging like that that's really hard in some in some respect it could be harder than like creating the original story because now you've got material set in stone and you have to try and move on from there in a logical way that keeps the original story intact while creating something new that people enjoy. And if and and then you combine that with cynicism, you combine that with greed, a desire to push these things out of the door to make more money, and a lack of respect for the craft, and a failure to recognize what it was about the original work that was so great in the first place. I don't think it's any surprise that you get a lot of bad results. It's why good sequels to films are often like exceptional. They're rare, yeah. Like they're rare. Terminator 2 being better than the first Terminator. It's like that's how often does that happen? Well, hey, that's yeah. um, that's not Aliens something being everyone better agrees than on. Alien. A lot, of, a lot of people yeah, think Terminator One is better. To be oh, fair. well, sure, but like, but pe but basically, everybody universally agrees that Terminator Two is a great film. Yes, um, no. and that is uncommon. As far as I know, the same that's for Aliens. Uncommon. Yeah, for people mm -hmm. to look at a uh, at like a a film sequel and go, yeah, you know what, that was an improvement, and not not totally unnecessary, like as a project to even exist. Um, but the, the necessity is money, right? They want to make money and franchises are really good as a company because what would you rather bankroll as a studio? Something that may or may not latch on with an audience or a sequel to something that is proven to be popular, like Jurassic Park. I think the more interesting examples are going to be sequels at any point in the franchise, be it two to three, three to four, four to five, one to two, um, but that are made by a different creative team and are still good. That's very rare. Because mm. um, when you have Terminator 1 and 2, I think that makes a lot more sense. James Cameron's been, he's like attached and in, in doing a lot himself. But the idea they go from Ridley Scott to James Cameron, not to say that there's an implication of like a lack of talent moving from one to the other, just the fact that it's a different, uh, very, very different voice creating a sequel. And yet Alien and Aliens, people have fought over for a while, which one is better, which just tells you both of them are fucking great. Um, well, um, and then, of course, you've got examples where, because I just saw someone mention it in chat, Puss in Boots 2 is a hell of a lot better than the first Puss in Boots. That's yeah. like way, 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 way better. And that's very uh, and recent. I guess Wrath of Khan as well. Wrath of Khan is usually considered the best Star Trek movie, right? It, yeah. I yeah. As far as I know. Well, funny enough, yeah. I think Robert is one of the people that you, you very much like the uh, motion picture, right? 
Uh, well, here's here's the thing. That this is a long conversation, which, which yes. I did with the drinker for four hours. <laughs> um, and and by the way, can I just give a shout out to the critical drinker here? Um, no, I I can't. <laughs> okay, I yeah, won't. you can, you can, yeah. I, I'm a huge fan of his story analysis, and Mahler, you know, I'm a huge fan of yours as well. And I think one of the great. Don't worry, Fringy, uh, we'll get there one day. <laughs> I just don't know you guys. It's the first time. Nah, nah. But, okay. but, but, I, but I do I do have to say that that um it's weird because the 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 storytelling analysis is something I've been like great stories is something I've loved my whole life. And the analysis of what makes stories great are also something I've loved. And and the drinker and mauler are two people that have really delved into what makes a story good. And I think that I believe that storytelling is one of the most important things human beings can do since the days of when we're uh, putting cave paintings on walls to, to, to document today's hunt to where we're at now, understanding why stories are good is important. It means something as Richard Drive is saying, <laughs> close encounters. But um, so so story analysis to me is a very important thing to do. I completely agree. And uh, right? Because that's as a story analyzer, I agree. Well, I and, guess and, the implication is we're doing it beyond reasons of career. It's it's very much Oh, a, absolutely uh, beyond yeah, I, I, look, many uh, people say we are beyond reason. That is true. <laughs> it's true, and then they get pissed. But the thing about uh, analyze stories are are, are how we convey the truths of being human. And and what does it mean to be a human being that lives a finite life? And all stories are are in some way referencing that. And this Jurassic Park, the the the, the tale of Jurassic Park, written by originally Michael Crichton, like in the novel, like Ian Malcolm dies. Spoiler alert, in the book he dies. Um in the first book and i know but 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 this kind of storytelling analysis is meaningful in the sense that that jurassic park deals with a lot of of fears of technology fears of of hubris of of mankind thinking they're gods i mean there's so much going on in this tale that as much as it's hey it's a fun movie about dinosaurs coming back to life in a park but it does have a lot to say about us as people in a technologically advanced space. And what I it love like about it, it seems well, absolutely. Yeah, you know, and the ethics, the ethics, Ian Malcolm's idea, just because you can do a thing doesn't mean you should do a thing. And, uh, you know, now in the last, I mean, what's really interesting, isn't it fascinating in the last two months or three or four months, AI, whether it's Mid Journey or Chat GPT, that AI has just jumped on us, like it, in a way, it was designed to be released at a certain point, all at once. Because, it, 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 as a matter of fact, maybe all these companies are a little bit of collusion, if you want to believe in that sort of thing, and I do, because they did it for a reason, because they have to interject these things in culture. They can't. They 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 disrupt and and it's interesting, but. What I love about this movie is even though it subtly does this, it makes us ask the question that Ian Malcolm asks. But all through this, we I want to go to Jurassic Park. I do. I want to see real dinosaurs. And if they could do it, if they could bring them back, I would be the first person on that plane to Isla Nublar and be like, hey, man. But at the same time. I understand the danger. And I think that's why this movie works. Because we want to be there. Oh, yeah. The, and yet the, we this, know it's probably a bad idea. This film is fully implementing that, but it, it had the balls to uh, criticize it completely. Um, I know, and that's the great part. I just, you know what? I love this movie. I'm talking about it with you guys. I love this movie. It's very good movie. I want to go watch it right now. I've got, I've got the 3D... Blu-ray, and the 3D conversion is great. 
was gonna say, how does the how does the 3D play out? Is it? It's really good. I mean, it it it, it like 3D convert. It's too bad that in especially in the United States, 3D TV failed utterly. But the discs, the Titanic, Top Gun, Jurassic Park, incredible 3D conversions. And I have a lot of other 3D discs, but Jurassic Park really works in 3D. I mean, it's 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 pretty great. That's and now you make me want to go watch it again. But of course, I have to wear the glasses. I'm sure my glasses that I have to put new batteries in them because they're dead. But um, man, Gla- 3D glasses need batteries. Really? Yes. Yeah. How do the really? Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. I didn't know. I thought they'd. All right. They're, I guess they're I'm just active not active and on passive. Uh, yeah, they're they're because they they flicker. Okay. And uh, the if you have active or passive, mine are active. So yeah, my 3D glasses need batteries. Watch batteries. Yeah, they do. Um. Huh. Okay. So yeah, the scene. Uh, it, I like some of the Ellie mentions here. Is that they've got plants for the way that they look around different parts of this um, area, but that uh, one or several of them are poisonous. Um, presumably, if you eat them, and it's like uh, it's, it's another representation of how the approach to the show of it is not uh, considered enough at all to in, in, encompass safety. And um, you get Malcolm, you get her, you, you get uh, even the lawyer not providing the kind of support that Hammond is necessarily looking for, right? Because he's like, we're going to charge so much. And he's like, okay, fine, you know, Alan, you're the one that can uh, help me out here, right? You're the one that can see the value, you you understand, you know what's going on. But, uh Oh, I just love the libraries like dinosaurs and man were separated by 64 million years of evolution. They've just been thrown together. We have no idea what's going to happen. It's just like only it's foreboding. It's a really reasonable thing to say, you know? Yeah, that happens like, for fuck's sake! <laughs> like, yeah, talk about like, the nice cool bone things. Here. Yeah. You're an archaeologist, or you're a paleontologist, throw me a bone here. Yeah. Not bad. He didn't say that, unfortunately, though. He didn't, but Would've he could have. an excellent line. He it was on the director's yeah. cut commentary track yeah they wanted to but you know <laughs> legal yeah, reasons um did. the kids arrive and have it says now let's spend a little bit of time with our target audience it's like yeah because it makes sense that he wants to entertain everybody but i imagine there's a lot of fundamental enjoyment in bringing awe to children's eyes uh gonna be the kids i remember being one and loving dinosaurs man but it's funny because yeah. like just all ages though dinosaurs are amazing it is Honestly, kind of like as cool. we touched on it earlier, but it's like why? It's like I don't know. They like they just are. They're huge... big lizards with big teeth and claws, and they lived in a savage world, you know, the, where everything was wilderness far before civilization was even a a, a, a thought. You know, they have really cool it's names just a different too. world with different beasts. It's wild. Yeah, is cool dinosaur names and cool a cool categories. name because we think dinosaurs are cool, or was it a cool name always? Dinosaur. It sounds pretty unique. I don't think it's, it's, it's not like edgy like, the edgy or like anything. It's like how we talk about why does Sauron just sound like a villain name? It's like I don't know. It just does, and it sounds well, awesome. <laughs> that's what it is. Yeah. Uh, so dinosaurs from uh, uh, the Greek and then the modern Latin. It means terrible lizard. <laughs> wow. Dinos, <laughs> Dinos, and Sauros. Uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. All you Grecians can uh, let me know. But yeah, terrible lizard. Neat. Um, so yeah, you have uh, plenty of moments for Alan having trouble with the the kid oh. who's really interested in his work because he's so experienced. Like the fact that he's read his book and he's just like, okay, fine, leave me alone. Uh, and yeah, it's just funny that he's like, which car are you going into? Ushers him into another one and then just closes the door on him. It's like desperately trying to get away from kids. And you even have uh, Ellie sending the girl to, to hang out with him. Because they all just want to have fun. But he's actually a little bit more concerned with the existential crisis of being able to create life at will, especially in the regard to these horrifying monsters, you know? There's a little bit more going on for him. But still, you know, it's just something of a beat they keep uh, pushing forward in the film. Um, and then I think they introduce, yeah, we've got the storm coming. Which, uh, on a fundamental level, for writing... Um, some people highlight, like, aren't there a lot of coincidences? The fact that the storm is happening at the same time that Dennis is doing what he's doing at the same time that the tour's happening. I thought the tour was why Dennis had organized it to be now, because everyone's very distracted with their first ever visitors. Seems to make the most sense to me, and it also pushes it to the point where um, the park is getting ready for earlier launching. 
which means they probably got all of their genetic stuff in the bag, which means it's stealable for Dennis. So that timing makes sense to me, but the storm is like, yeah, that's 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 uh, incredibly inconvenient. But um, once you've uh, gotten past that, it obviously allows for a lot of extra things to happen. Um, the crate, yeah, it's not unreasonable, and and the storm does slowly arrive. Um, there are scenes where it's starting to rain just a little bit, and then the storm, you know, starts coming. And you know, we'd have to see how common storms are in that part of if we were really going to analyze it. You know, how common are storms in that part of the world? And you know, it's not like they're in a desert, so it's not terrible. Yeah, and like you said, they do actually know it's coming, and they prepare for it. Um, it's going to be alongside the sabotage from Dennis. It's going to be a big way to facilitate a lot of different payoffs. So that pushes you into the portion where things are going to start to fall apart. Significant. Uh-oh. Because you got... Uh, I quite like um, Hammond's on the little headset trying to show off everything about what they've got. They've paid like a, a special dude to get the voiceover in the cars. And see, that's like showcasing the park element of it, and they're all excited to see this thing it's being described, and they don't. It's like, oh. And I, to me, that's always been an in indication that it's like, yeah, see, it's still, fundamentally, it's kind of what Robert was saying earlier, there's still stuff that would appeal to us, no matter what philosophy we can come up with for why this is horrifying. You just mm. want to see the dinosaur doing dinosaur things. And what's cool as well is the one they're describing is the Dilophosaurus, I think, the one that yep. uh, they're like, oh, it'll spit, you know, venom or whatever it that people paralyze them, blind them, and then eat them without difficulty. Once again, foreshadowing for what's going to happen to an unfortunate person in this film. That guy is eaten. That is, um, irony. He would have been several meals for it's a true. Dilophosaurus. Maybe, maybe, I don't know how far, how much they need to eat, you know? I'm not familiar enough with either. Dilophosaurus diets. My bad, I know. Um, but yeah, they conclude the storm is going to be super dangerous in, com in uh, conjunction with everything else that's going to be happening. So it's like a warning we keep an eye on it. And at the same time, you have uh, their computer systems are not fully operational. So another downfall of this whole system is that they're relying a lot on automation. And uh, as as few people as possible, I think, which is the, the more explicit evidence that as much as Hammond keeps saying we spared no expense, it's like he's always looking to spend whatever the amount is necessary to get the thing done, but no more. He doesn't want to, like, go further than that. And so from his point of view, paying Dennis and the few other workers that are even here, hopefully they can... Because I think Dennis even has a line that says, like, you can run everything in the park with, like, three people because of how automated everything is. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously that all falls apart with, like, one click of a button and Storm's fucking with everything and... That reliance on technology allows the door to swing right open for nature to take its uh, response. And all of that's being argued over. Dennis not being paid enough. Hammond trying to uh, sort of justify it. And you even have Hammond with a line that I think we're supposed to think a lot about as the film goes over. But he says, I don't blame people for their mistakes, but I do ask that they pay for them. Uh-oh. Um, Paying for mistakes. Oh, my goodness. So, yeah, I can't help but imagine that's going to be on his mind in the last moments that we see him in the film. Um, and yeah, uh, they, they, they bickering gets like cut off by Muldoon, like warning them they're approaching the, uh, the Tyrannosaur paddock. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's done with such a like, he's so, he's so concerned to the point where you, you wonder if he actually thinks any of this is, is remotely safe. I think it's a matter of it should be, and <laughs> all things point toward it being, but you don't quite know exactly what's going to happen. And that's that chaos element they keep talking about. Um, Mola uses that line to fire people. It was a. Not, it's just not a bad line in general. Because, um, you know, it's trying to acknowledge that you don't want to hold people in some kind of perpetual prison for their mistakes, but you want uh, something to be rectified as a result. There's a well. It, it goes into a lot of lines here. There's a there's a deliberateness to the script. Everything that the characters say is it, it's all about making you know setups. It's all about this will mean this later on, and this will be paid off in this way. This was not. This is not what we call an accidental script. No, lots of purpose. I think by here, uh... the more you pay attention to this movie, the better it gets, and the more foreshadowing shadowing there is on the themes and their execution. Well, yeah, because. On a surface level, it's it's a fun dinosaur movie. 
Um, and even though it's, but even though it's not incredibly complicated in terms of what it's trying to achieve, it's like there's a lot of details there. The the line from Malcolm soon, where he's like, "God creates dinosaurs. God destroys yeah. dinosaurs. God creates man. Man destroys God. Man creates dinosaurs." Uh, which is fascinating enough to himself, and then she says, uh, "Dinosaurs eat man. Woman inherits the earth." And it's cool because you get him being like curious about what she's just said, and Alan's Both in the of background. Them look over, yeah. well, he's just smiling. <laughs> like she has a couple of digs like that in the movie throughout. Uh, more characteristics going on, you know. Oh, and this is where yeah, you get the line from I think Alan saying, uh, "T Rex doesn't want to be fed; he wants to hunt." Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. Like, it's, uh, just the behavior is not being recognized by the um the park. Yeah, which makes me wonder as well, combined with what Muldoon knew about the raptors in a sort of insufficient way, he's uh, he's delivered as someone who knows the most about raptors, I think that's what Hammond says, but I do wonder how much he really would know compared to someone like Alan Grant, who studying them in depth extensively and historically, as opposed to a hunter who's studying just their behaviors, uh, you know, in a very controlled, probably... very controlled environment. There's probably a lot that they both know. Um... How much of it's overlapping? I'm not sure. Well, but, yeah, together you know, there, there's make... like the theoretical knowledge, and then the actual like this is what they actually do. The actual or, well, comparing it to what the actual real creatures do, park, you know. Not yeah, that's the, the problem. Is Muldoon's information is going to be so limited because you don't get to see them operate in any kind of like you. How can you know anything about how it will work yeah. to fight against them in an open environment when that's something you could yeah. never see? It's possible. One of the things. Outside. One of the things that's interesting about the film is Muldoon and Grant. Um, you've got Grant, who's been a paleontologist. I love the fact that Muldoon has been a guy that's worked in the park. You know, he he's come to know these creatures. None of it's theoretical. I mean, he's he's coming at it from oh well, yeah, he's making explicit information, but it's it's yeah. a very skewed piece of information i guess or all the information no i no absolutely but I, I but i love that that juxtaposition between a guy like the park ranger you know the 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 british colonist you know who's who's here wearing wearing his what is it his pith hat or whatever and uh, pith pith helmet and um the 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 scientist who shows up who has no actual real experience it's a great it, it, it's a great juxtaposition, and it's not they don't hammer home that idea, but it's definitely there. Like one guy has real world experience, one has scientific theoretical experience, and I I've always liked that about the film that that they don't hammer it home, but it's still there. The idea that somebody has actual practical real world experience, and I'm sure Alan Grant's going, God, I wish I. I why 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 wasn't why wasn't I brought here a year ago or 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 five years ago? I, I've been in this dig in Montana or whatever. You know, can I can I live in Montana? Hunt for Red October? It's like, come on. And it it's it, it's an interesting thing they do in the film. It's I, I love that though. I love that you have these two different guys that both in a way love dinosaurs. Because they both do. Well, they're the ones and that I'd one... say respect the dinosaurs the most. They're the two yeah. that yeah. better understand and know what the, just the, this whole situation, what it is. Um, Indeed. And that's the thing. It was just a really great choice to have such a breadth of different people with different histories and understandings yeah, and values in this film. Uh, yeah, you just get to see what each of these people with the traits that sort of built up and then how they change over the course of the film a whole bunch of different perspectives on basically the same core question of is this a good idea? <laughs> yes or no? And why? Uh, there's that line, you can't suppress 65 million years of gut instinct. <laughs> mm. Right. So, so the thing, you don't know what you brought back. You just, uh, you're treating it like it's a little no, toy. You don't really know. It's an experiment, but you've got it like a, and and it's like th this whole arrangement of Let's get the cars in a motorized track, come around, and then get the dinosaurs out for everybody to go look at them. It's like, what? Why do you think that you can control them like that? <laughs> like that they're interested in performing for your theme park, you know? That's the thing. It's like, so straightforward animals. and narrow-minded as an approach, um, but yet it I makes so much sense that this happen. is how it would go. Yeah, yeah. I, could, I think that's um, when you think about how stupid Jurassic World is. So much of it comes from the implausibility of the way that everything is run and handled. 
Um, whereas, like, here, you buy into it for all of its flaws. They all seem like the kinds of mistakes that people could make. Like, did you come up with this idea of a theme park for dinosaurs? It's like, that sounds awesome. But then actually making it work, it's like, well, there's a lot of... Because, I mean, obviously, some things work, right? They've created the park itself. They've created the enclosures. They've got the electrified fence and the gates and everything. It's like, yeah, that's all thought through. But then there are the potential issues that can stem from that, especially when it gets sabotaged. There's, like, the inherent idea of trying to have ancient animals sort of behave and comport with, like, your goals both monetarily and in terms of the show that you want to present to people. Yeah, you just buy into it as, as, a, as a place that could exist compared to, like, in Jurassic World where it's stupid. That's the big thing for Jurassic World, the way that the Indo... Indominus Rex, yeah, that's what it's called, right? Yeah, the way it escapes yeah, is so yeah. beyond stupid. It doesn't it's make so, any sense at where all. Where it was sabotage that made everything go wrong and it was a chain reaction of everything. And they you know, give you all the information doing. ahead of time. They tell you the dinosaurs are a lot smarter than you probably think. They, they're they not like your average sort of lounging animal. These things, they're, they're like the top of the world when they were in their prime and that they they remember they have critical thinking they they test things like the mm -hmm. and you see the t-rex even he tests the fence before he breaks it apart uh yeah it's it, yeah it's just um obviously with the raptors too it's 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 all stuff that, that, that they deliver to you extensively that you see it all play out and uh you're there you're right in there um oh yeah and i think this is where we get an explanation from uh, Malcolm of what he means about like being a chaos titian, I think is how it's described, right? Studying is that what it's, a chaos titian? Is that a, is that actually a chaos titian? I might be saying it wrong. It doesn't sound quite right, but I mean, uh, he's a mathematician, but chaos titian just doesn't. Yeah, but there are weird names for things that don't quite like sort of roll off the tongue. Um, hmm. Studies chaos theory. Yeah, because uh, I think Hammond calls him a mathematician. He corrects him on that. Chaotician. Chaotician. I could have sworn when he says it in the film, I think he says chaos titian, but I can see how it sounds clunky, right? Chaotician, chaotician sounds... sounds. Oh, so yeah, Wikipedia says chaotician. Oh, okay. That's chaos theory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, chaotician. That fault. Hey, you Maybe the whole point is that the name of the the person who does the chaotic chaos mathematics, as we still know, <laughs> we have no idea what the who knows. That's true. Yeah. Well, yeah, and he, uh, the way he tries to explain it to Ellie is like, you would assume, based on information you had, what is going to happen next, but it doesn't. And then he explains, like, it's because of um, imperfections in the skin or the way that hairs move the dilation or distending of vessels. It's like, there's reason behind it, but it's so chaotic in terms of information that you can't have known ahead of time that you'll get results you'll never be able to predict. Um, That's a really good layman's... Um interpretation isn't it yeah because it's super super straightforward and then uh, yeah, i like the uh, you got to be like hey are there any dinosaurs on this dinosaur tour and you just have habits <laughs> staring at the screen uh, so just yeah, love that the, the so good. Lens as well look at his face <laughs> Hello. It's just funny. he's like a troll at it, breathing on it yeah he's a fun character bringing in so some fun. of the biggest criticisms while simultaneously being a bit of a like jokester type that's just here for the mm -hmm. ride as well he does come across that way. He's uh, all about them ethics, but at the same time, you'll go wherever life takes him. Like, he is the chaos element. He in has his embraced own chaos. Point of view. He's like, oh, chaos, take me away. It's kind of the perfect environment to put this guy in. He is in the backseat of the Jeep and his journey through life. He's just being driven. Um, well, yeah, that he's like, nobody could have predicted Alan would jump out of the car, and then Ellie, and then he's like, all that I'd be sitting here talking to myself. Like, yeah, this, uh, <laughs> don't expect all this shit It's an happen. amusing movie. It, it, there's, there's plenty of little uh, jokes that can land really well <laughs> throughout this, yeah. You try and nail it all, but you have a focus, you know? It has it no helps. velociraptor saying Alan. No, that, yeah, well, you know what, that was a dream sequence, so it's okay. Oh, okay. okay no judging. Yeah, no judging true. here. No judgment. If it's a dream, it's uh, yeah, it's good. We're all good. Oh uh, yeah, the reason they're able to get out and even check out the uh, Triceratops is because they don't have as th th this. All these systems aren't complete. There's no locking systems on these cars yet. They're all they've been built for magnetism to the rails, and that I assume as well is going to be an awkwardness to how the locks would be controlled. Can it be controlled from inside, or is it only from the uh the security like? control room and if that would be even 
how viable is that how, in terms of you got to be careful in case the system shut down for whatever reason but in any case Muldoon says like we were supposed to get the locks sorted out and it's like haven't like, there you go people are just coming off the tour at will and um yeah we get the uh, the triceratops scene which again to me comes across as another attempt to at trying to get the ore an incredible nature of dinosaurs before they give us the stuff a lot of people will be waiting for which is the more aggressive dinosaurs right and the, the fear of them chasing you and stuff so like, there's a lot more to appreciate about them than just big spooky lizard the triceratops animatronic is so great it's kind of incredible so yeah yeah because um, it moves with um I don't know. I, and I think that's it. Goes into the like both the animatronics and the CGI. They they're they're believable not just because they look pretty good, but are really good in some instances. But they move well. The breathing, you know, it's it's this it's the breathing that that sells that that uh, animatronic. Gives it life. Yeah, and and that's hard to do. You know, of of um, no uh, that eye as well. Incredible. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the the it's so well done, and all that you know. There's guys and girls and people making these things work. They're in the background, you know, doing all of that, and it's really beautifully done. I mean, Stan Winston, you know, before he rest in peace, Stan. Uh, before he passed away, he put together the very best of physical effects, makeup effects people in Hollywood, and Jurassic Park is a great example of what they were able to do. It reminds me of um, how when the prequels came out, there was a unified complaint that there was too much reliance on CG, not enough of the practical that the OG films had. And then I remember the promotion of Force Awakens. They were like, "Look at all this practical stuff." I remember them. They they had like the one of the aliens on stage in its like yeah, full like, outfit, oh, just being like, "See, look, look at this. Like, it's amazing." And it's funny because you skip forward to the end of that trilogy, and it's just a mess of CG. Like um, it, it was it was even the respect to the idea of having practical effects was superficial. It was like we have this because people like it, right? Like it, it's never from the ground up for why you have these things or how they're built or what they do. It's just oh, it's a it's a good film, so it has to have special effects, I guess, that are physical or practical. And you're just sitting there like, well, it's it's more than that, man. Like you don't, it's not because uh, I have to push back on this every once in a while. There's a lot of CG hate that's happening. Um, it even comes from me as well, and I always want to try and Sometimes, refocus yeah. to be like, well, it's not CG is amazing, um, and this is a film that has it in in spades as examples of when to use it properly. I'm looking forward to when yeah, we get to some it, of the it's shots. It's all about how things are employed. Yeah, I mean, it yeah, always comes down to the use the of things. So uh, there's there's several well, shots well, I want to good example of that, yeah. Sort of like uh, go into a little bit deeper in terms of like slowing it down and stuff because it's kind of amazing in this film how. It's using CG better than like all of Phase Four. Um. Mm. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Because I mean, Ant Man and the Wasp. It's not even a matter of it's going to age poorly. It just looks bad now. I think that's one of the things that I've started to as more more tech as more time passes between these films and the technology gets better. It's like the I I think why is it that some things age better than others and it's like it's got to be the way that the technology is employed because you can have you know two things come out at the same time you look at it with a lot of video games right there are certain video games that age way better and a lot mm -hmm. of it can be attributed to art styles like you know wind waker is the go-to example that game won't age basically at all um but but even games that kind of go for like a little bit more of a realistic look it's like through really great art direction in those cases and here it seems like it's just it is how you use the tools, not like how old it is or even how much it is. It's just how you use it. Completely agree. But yeah, uh, Dennis is about to enact his plan. He's got a limited amount of time to get to the boat because the storm is going to speed up. It's uh, leaving the island because it's getting dangerous. Um, and so he needs to do this now. And so he sinks it and uh, starts grabbing the stuff. But of course, the, the fact is he's going to try and lower all the security so that he can not only get out, but it can cause chaos for these guys that are too busy to deal with him. I'd imagine that was all the goals. I don't think he's ever explicit about exactly why he's doing all of those things. You even have um, Samuel Jackson's character saying, like, why did he lower the fences? And the interesting thing to note is that he didn't lower the fences for the raptors. 
um, which is commented on. I think is it Muldoon later says like not even Dennis would have done that because that's a... yeah when they were going to the power uh, station. Yeah, he tells it to Ellie as so much as it's sabotage. It Ellie, yeah. That's how much that's Dennis knows that releasing the Raptors is a seriously bad idea. Um. Yeah, and he has this moment where he's like, I want to go to the vending machine and pick up uh, some stuff. Yeah. You, 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 you guys want, 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 want anything? And it's just like, man. Absolutely. <laughs> it's like, oh boy, can you look any more suspicious, dude? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and I do like that it's, it's reasonable that he said it, but I just love, like, where is Dennis? Someone check the vending machines. Like, I think that's what happened. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Someone check the vending machines, which is weird because I just don't think he'd fit in there, but. I guess you might as well look Gotta look, Greg. Gotta look everywhere. Gotta look. You might be in there. Um, and yeah, you have one of the, the few that I love back and forth between um, Malcolm and Alan, right? Like, have any kids? It's like, oh yeah, three. Anything that can happen will happen. Or uh, it's the Murphy's Law thing, right? That's Murphy's Law, yeah. So, Which is, any, <laughs> anything that can happen will happen. Wait, what was, what was they saying? Interstellar? Was that they said they anything said? that can go wrong will, I think. No, um, Murphy's Law is no, anything it's... that can go wrong will go wrong, whereas what they said in Interstellar was the other one. Anything right, I got it backwards, before. yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, Interstellar fucks up what Murphy's Law is. Even though which it's... is weird, considering one of the characters is one named, of the after, characters it and is it's, named yeah. after it, and it's a big part of the film. <laughs> uh, well, oh, every, time, um, every time I go through that or uh, find out about it, I always have to end up Googling some stuff, because I always get mixed up on the laws as well. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously, you don't want to get mixed up in the script. That's, uh, <laughs> like you want to make sure about that. Oh, you're fucking, it'd be a bit awkward. Uh, maybe that's foreshadowing for eventual coverage of Interstellar or a deep dive. But yes, uh, what Malcolm's referencing then is that a different law or is it a variation? <laughs> I'm genuinely asking, so I'm not actually sure. Which one? Sorry. Anything at all can uh, and does happen is what he says. I think. Uh... Anything can and uh, does happen. I don't know what that is, yeah. Might be a reference to something that ties, else. Then. Maybe it ties into chaos theory, this idea that, you know, it, every, anything could, you know, who could have known, who could have. Well, he's really definitely embracing it to the, the other thing, yeah. Like the fact that he says, I'm always on the lookout for a future ex Malcolm, being that he's he's just going to embrace the, uh, the journey of getting married, having kids, whether or not there's the expectation of things going wrong because he's aware of how much. Everything can go wrong all the time. Mm -hmm. People say Murphy's Law, but again, Murphy's Law is anything that can go wrong will go wrong. So, like, there's got to be something else, right? Yeah, whatever they say in Interstellar is not Murphy's Law. <laughs> yeah. It's one of the things I, I remember. I don't remember the specifics, but it's one of those things that the movie does just so well. <laughs> Someone said, you don't know Murphy's Law? Apparently not. Uh, uh, until I go reading about it on the... Uh... On the wiki pages, because I thought it was one thing, but mixing up them laws, something I do. Plenty. No, we we're, were right about Murphy's law. Oh well, I'm saying I do. I mix them up. Um. Anyway, he's uh, he do be doing the stealing bit in this moment. You said so, doobie do. I do. I I, I look uh, for any you know on Mountain Dew. You know, Mountain Dew bottles. They used to say doobie doobie do on them. Why? Because they say D E W is how they'd spell it. Doobie doobie do. Yeah. 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 That yeah was, he's uh, um, he's yeah. stealing what looks to be like the core DNA for each of the dinosaurs. And I always remember thinking, like, man, I'm surprised they only wanted one of each. You'd think they'd want a whole, like, you know, fill a briefcase or something. Because uh, those things would be incredibly valuable. We're talking like millions of dollars, I'd imagine. And yeah, um, maybe more yeah. than millions. That might be underselling it. It might be, yeah. Maybe a Barbasol can. It, it is more under the radar than a briefcase. You know, if if they're if they're doing checks for things, you you wouldn't think to check. You'd be like, okay, this is a can a of Barbasol. Pretty sure there was a line for that in the movie that it was specifically yeah. in the can because it would be easy to get through, like customs. Yeah. Oh I yeah. Well, in it. that case, just you'd think they design it so they can steal some more. I don't know. I just would have thought maybe several cans of. Well, maybe it's too suspicious to be carrying more than one can of Barbasol. <laughs> well, I think he says you got to get one of each, probably referring to the fact this is a one-time thing. Once you steal it, the 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 security is going to be insane, and it won't be yeah. well, like it won't be easy or possible to, you know, have for, a second for, go yeah. around. So mm -hmm. you need to 
get the variety. That's what's important because those are only chance. Someone mentioned they're embryos. I, I'm not actually sure. Oh, wait. No, yeah. It does say embryo. Yeah, yeah. yeah these are embryos. I thought maybe it was um, the stages even before reaching an embryo, but because uh, of, I don't know what stage of research you'd need to steal to get the guaranteed results, but uh, yeah, um, supposedly that would be enough. And I think that, like, we talk about the deliberateness of everything and a lot of the symbolism of the script and uh, I think that the can of Barbasol is there to represent how hairy the situation is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is all because this, this is where the tension really starts to rise up. Because you, uh, you know what you're in for with a movie like this, and there's just so many red flags everywhere. Uh, oh. All those fences going down, all the setup they've yeah. had about everything the dinosaurs do. Just like, oh, this is not going to end well. And then of course Dennis. Um, rushing so hard to get to the dock and uh maybe do something that fucks up well <laughs> i mean i would say this this is he, nedry is a little over the top character wise neat in what way but he needs he needs to be i mean in terms of his whole persona i can you believe know, it do you, uh, what, do you, what do you think is a bit too much yeah no, 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 no. I, I mean, I mean, in terms of, in a way, he borderlines on caricature. You know, in terms of a nerd computer guy. Do you, you, you know, mean because he's fat, or <laughs> no? His whole persona, not um, just because his physical presence, but even the way he acts. He's like, you don't know it. Okay, I, I, I go back to 1983's War Games. And there are two characters, Eddie Deason being one of them. Um, there is a certain way that tech guys are portrayed movies. And I, I would say that that this is... I mean, at the same time, Sam Jackson counterpoints that. Yeah, he's the, he's the cool, like, suave black guy who knows yes. what's up sort of thing versus this, like, yeah. pasty, so you, you, fat white guy, you know? Yes. And, and by the way, he needs to be that guy so you understand his motivations and all that. But but and 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 again, this is why Spielberg is a great filmmaker. Nedry does has to be over the top to understand his motivations. I I think so. I, I think, think so because at all. well because he when, you, been, when you he could have been he could have been they could have swapped Samuel L. Jackson's character could have been Nedry's character and Nedry's just you know really greedy and unethical, but he plays it very seriously and he's more toned down. Um, and, and he's a bit more serious in a way, you know, absolutely. You could, you could go that way, but it, would it be as fun? Would it be as fun? Well, definitely, yeah, if you in, make a character less fun, it will be less fun. But I mean, but I mean, in terms of, of from a movie making standpoint, it's uh, pretty well, we would have had more it, of Nedry being the, the Samuel L. Jackson replay if we swapped him, right? Then we'd have the fun guy who's trying to fix the situation. Instead of the fun guy, who's the one who caused it? So, well, wait. Yeah. How, are just, how are we figuring out what's who's fun? Um, well, here, here's the thing. I, I, I think that Nedry is th there is definitely a stereotype he is fulfilling in the film, and it's a stereotype we've seen, and back to movies all the way. I mean, eighty three was War Games was the first time I would like the irreverent hacker kind of. Well, what I was gonna say is, I or... feel like uh, I feel like well, he's not an irreverent. He's good. he's just a douchebag. Um, I mean, kind Ned, of. A, it's pretty irreverent. Sure, uh, like I, I guess what because I'm interested by this comparison of like if Samuel Jackson was told to play uh, a bit of a douchebag who's. Um, complaining he's not appreciated for his place and he's for money reasons going to sabotage the whole area. Meanwhile, we have this other character who's like the chubbier white guy who's like, oh no, the whole system's falling apart. We've got to get this back up, you know? And, and even does the whole getting eaten by dinosaurs in an attempt to reset the circuits. Like, I think all of that could still work. I'm curious if, um, that's why, uh, that's why I thought you meant like him being like this super overweight sort of, uh, uh, it, and, and his it's, desk it's is gross. It's not about sort of being overweight, but he's definitely a nerd stereotype. I think I agree, I mean, but I don't see that as any I kind know, of yeah. issue. Like, yeah, I don't think it's an uh, issue at all. But, but I don't know. I don't think. I, I, I don't think it's an issue at all. I think it's a shorthand, and okay. I think you need. I mean, look, they've got look at the wrappers on his desk and all that. Yeah, 
because he's I mean, fat. <laughs> well, so I'm, actually, I'm gonna. I, I think I assume I'm gonna agree with Robert on this one. That I actually do. It annoys me when they portray uh, even fat people with being like they're just gonna be unclean. I, I like, agree, and I I would say I would say that that it is. But here's the thing. At this point in the movie, it's there's a there is a nerd shorthand that's happening, and I think it needs to happen because it's a shorthand in terms of storytelling. And 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 here's like, look, I I am a geek myself. I've been a geek my entire life. A nerd, call me what you want. I've been a Star Trek fan. I've been going to conventions since I was ten, you know. And and I there's nerd stereotypes for a reason. Now. There are things like I I hate Big Bang Theory, one of the most successful uh, sitcoms of all time, which I feel has 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 uh, it's not racist, it's nerdist. <laughs> I know, but I, 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 hate, know what you mean. I, I I hate that sitcom. I hate it so much. Um, but when you see Nedry and you see that, they definitely play into that tech. It's not. Nerd. It's the tech guy. It's not even a fat guy stereotype. It's a nerd guy stereotype. It's because, um, the tech head who doesn't get out much. With this screenshot, I was gonna maybe because I, I saw some people being like, "Wait, what? You don't think that slobs exist?" It's like, oh no, sorry. If you look at this image, right, his whole desk is filled with wrappers. The floor around him yeah. is filled with wrappers. It's like, uh, I mean. Uh, this and, is before it gets thing. knocked I, off the desk, by the way. It's just like, come on. <laughs> I don't mean to be, I, I'm messy. not disparaging anyone, but the way it's, and that's what I mean. It's not just him. It's it's like a, any person who is a tech guy is, or girl, or them, whatever you want to, they're interested in, in making sure their equipment is working well. Yeah, yeah. You know, most people don't want rappers and, and detritus all around them. But they shoot it that way because they're trying to make you understand in a very quick shorthand who he is. Yeah, because I was going to say, and, this definitely it can support the character, him being a slob. Yeah, and, with like and, and there's stuff. nothing bad about it, but... Well, it shows that he doesn't really care that much about yeah. um, his job. Uh, his he Because mm -hmm. we've already said he's not paid enough to do this. He doesn't feel appreciated. He doesn't respect the job. So exactly. as a result, he doesn't keep his workstation clean. Yeah, so it's all very and, 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 and but But the thing is, like, uh, here's the thing. Uh, I don't think that it's, it's not about... You you need to have visually in a movie. You need to be able to convey, um, uh, because he's not a very well developed character. We see him make plans. He's pretty and... straightforward. He's very thin. Yeah, uh, thin. and no, I yeah, <laughs> and, and, <laughs> he's uh... and, and I do think that that one of the great things is because you have to. <laughs> this is a terrible thing to say, but we as the audience. When he dies, and this is a terrible thing because it's become, by the way, since 93, it certainly happened in Star Trek and it's abhorrent. Um, they kill people like him and, and people think it's okay to do it. And I would say that Jurassic Park was, people have taken the wrong lesson. Um, well, he did a very, 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 very bad say, thing. Yeah. Bad uh, thing. And then I used a lot, lot of lives. Yeah, if, if, and, if, and, if I can, I wouldn't mind writing about this. I, I so mm. passionately agree with this. Uh, what Nedry has done is maybe killed everyone here and released yes. uh, all those but animals will money. suffer. It's he's he's done possibly one of the worst things he could do on this island, and he's yeah done it for money. And so watching him get killed by a dinosaur in a pretty gruesome way, as they described it earlier, you can, as an audience member, feel like, well, man, you know, you did all of that, and look what happened to you. Like, it's yeah. it's hard for you to feel sympathy it's, for you. It's biblical. It's biblical in terms of its justice. Pretty hard. You know? But they fuck this up. In uh, in the Lost World, for example. Oh my God! Do they? F oh God! Just, it's it's actually I, difficult to watch. What was one of the most I, heroic uh, characters in the whole franchise get torn to pieces by two yeah, T Rexes? I it's been a long time since I've seen the Lost World. I rewatched it last night, and um, I I remember that Moller always talked about because for me it was Gordon from uh from 2012. I it always really made me angry because it just felt wrong. Um, for those who don't know, in in 2012, there's a character called Gordon who's like the stepdad character. And he flies the plane. He is he is essential for the survival of all of the characters. And he's nothing but good to everybody and trying his hardest and helping people and taking care of everybody. And then he gets grind he he gets caught in some gears and and, and gets crushed to death. 
Um, and then everybody just moves on and forgets about him. All he gets is John Cusack saying, oh, Gordon, no! And then that's <laughs> it, and they don't care anymore, and they move on from him. And he reconciled <laughs> with his wife, who Gordon was going out with at the time, so she don't really give a shit either. Um, and then, yeah, the Lost World, right? It's like, Eddie is... He's a hero. He is, like, relentlessly trying to save the lives of all of the characters. And his reward is getting torn in half by a T-Rex, two T-Rexes. It just seems wrong. It's so and interesting like one because... one line of dialogue for him. It's... Well, maybe two. Yeah, because what has been highlighted about, like, how we feel about Dennis is it's it's the exact reason we feel the, the opposite about Eddie, uh, typically speaking, anyway. It's just, like, I think there's plenty of people who be like, ah, oh, damn it, there he goes. But for me, I was just like, why did you do this? Why would you show yeah, me this? Just, like he's there, like right until the bitter end. He's got his foot on the uh, on the pedal yeah. to make sure that he can buy uh, the main characters as much time as possible to escape. And he just gets torn in half by raptors, <laughs> and then they immediately move back into plot. And I think all they get is a line from Malcolm, like, "Oh, he, you know, he sacrificed his life," for, which I guess is more than they gave Gordon. Like Gordon <laughs> was a complete slap in the face. The entire family just. Moves I think that's on part of it, by the way. If we were simply told uh, he had done it, Eddie, and and maybe even just shown him using the car, and then we hear screams off screen, and we're just like, "Oh no, I guess he didn't make it," sort of thing. But like actually being shown that he recognizes the T Rexes, right. he knows his window yeah. to save his own life is running out, and he continues. That's like some yes. top tier hero shit. <laughs> and he gets torn in half, and you know, yeah. him screaming, and, and then, and I think the main thing is a lack of acknowledgement. They carry it on. Jurassic World, yeah. you have the babysitter who's been panicking throughout the whole movie because the kids ditched her in order to do whatever they want, even though her whole job is to take care of them, but they subvert yeah, it deliberately. Yeah. She's panicking, the whole thing is falling apart, she finally finds them, and they, for some reason, felt the need to have a pterodactyl grab her and carry her all Drop the way over to the door. Mosasaurus that eats the pterodactyl and her at once uh, after well, she nearly and not, drowns. And not only after she was antagonized relentlessly by the pterodactyl, it came back for her and started yeah. like swinging her around and everything. And you're just looking at it, it's like, you know, film, this just doesn't feel right. I don't, it feels I don't a bit mean-spirited and vindictive. Uh, it's yeah. the tone. It's a balance of tone. How can a film present you something that is bad? Like, I don't know, like a hero character dying right like when schultz gets killed like in django like that's a bad thing right like him you see him die it's like oh man not schultz and it's like well so but that's fine right it's like well yeah because obviously that's the point right it's meant to be sad and it's like feeding into and tonally you know like and and then like recognition after the fact compared to like an almost like obliviousness as to what's happened of like this this really innocent character just getting absolutely brutalized and it, it just doesn't seem like the tone recognizes it. I don't, like, the Eddie one, for some reason, to me, seems like, um, I can understand how they ended up creating it, but they fucked up, like, the acknowledgement of what happened. This scene, I legitimately have nothing for why they made this scene. It's so Grow cruel. It's brutal, it's fun. It's not fun to watch a hero get ripped in half by a T-Rex. That's not fun. <laughs> yeah, that's the opposite of fun. Especially when there's, there's very little acknowledgement from the story as to what he did. I think that's, like, one of the complicated parts of storytelling, where, like, people kind of want, expect, and demand acknowledgement of, like, the heroic deeds of characters versus, you know, the dastardly deeds of villains. Yeah, people like have this sort of sense of justice inside yeah. of them that's almost, it's, like, kind of innate, and they don't, like, generally, people want to see good things happen to good people, or, and they want to see bad things well, happen to bad well, people. Well, and the big thing is, I think the important part is when bad things happen to good people, generally, it they needs like to be it framed as a tragedy. There's an acknowledgement of the fact that a good person suffered an unjust end, but you don't really yeah. get that feeling with Eddie. It's like, we needed somebody to get ripped in half by a T-Rex because that'd be cool, right? It's like, it's just lame. I don't know. It just feels, it's the same with Gordon getting torn up by those well, again, gears. It, it, it always bugged me. To me, it feels like you can trace their scenes back to Dennis's scene. And it's just, it's like, we got that scene where the character gets the almost comeuppance from a dinosaur at a very singular, very rough moment. And you're like... Did you did you watch the same scene as me? Because I don't yeah. know why you've created this this other scene with like the horrible thing happens. Uh, well, it's the same with um, it's 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 the same, you know, with the clever girl payoff and then getting torn to shreds. Like that's that's a guy who we think is cool losing. Um, yeah, it's in in like, Yama, It was yeah, and even in, even at the end with everything he knew. I mean, it was it was close, but the raptor got him. Yeah, and it's, but, it's like, but that uh, also, damn, man. Uh, like, damn, you know, that sucks. That's kind of like... It ups you know, the threat, coming. though. Yeah. Yes. You know, yeah, if, no. if, if, a, 
if, if if an experienced hunter and somebody who's been a part of the park for a long time and who's learned these creatures, if even he is destroyed, it ups the threat in a credible way where where the audience is like, well, if that guy dies, shit, man, anyone's on the table. Like, yeah. I'm- and 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 I think from a storytelling standpoint, that's a legitimate way to increase the stakes. And 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 while I hate that, I hate that he's killed. It makes the movie scarier. Well, that's the thing. I got nothing but compliments for how they approached Muldoon. And if someone said, like, you see, killing yeah. the babysitter with a pterodactyl and a mosasaurus really ups the ante. I'd be like, no. <laughs> like, she's just a random lady who got picked up. And it's horrible. Like, it, And then someone would be like, oh, yeah, but that's it, right? It's kind of horrible. It's like, no, I, it's hard to explain. It's not the same. Uh, it's like a meta response as opposed to one of in the story where I see yeah, like, the like, scary thing happening. Her, yeah, I can only think character. about them constructing the film i'm like why would you make it this way that's so yeah. weird it just seems really weird and callous kind of yeah while i feel like there's so much more purpose with all of those kinds of scenes and the decisions in them in this film yep um, definitely so yeah uh i suppose that's the big conversation about nedry <laughs> that, that, that evolved into talking about all this jurassic world franchise jurassic park franchise of course that's, that's why I think Jurassic World really prompted the discussion of the uh, what is the difference between a reboot and a sequel. Because it feels like a reboot, yeah, but really right. it is a sequel. But it's like, eh, but it's a different franchise well, it's soft, almost. It's like, no, reboot. it's the same well, one. I think, uh, I think that's what a soft reboot is, right? Typically, is that it's spiritually a reboot, but it's the same continuity. Uh, so soft like, reboot, is a soft reboot came in as quite a popular thing to call it, but a lot of people have been using requel as well. Um, um no, that's a, yeah, that's a it almost captures, seems kind of like. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, That's I'm okay cool. with that. Um, but I think yeah, it's a hard reboot is new continuity, new timeline. You carry over elements, yeah. but it's new timeline. Whereas soft reboot is like spiritually, it's it's like a a jumping in point. Um, but it's the same continuity, you know. So yeah, because the rain and him fucking around and being so desperate, he eventually uh, crashes and no longer knows exactly where he's supposed to be going, and then. Because of uh, everything being shut down, gates are opening and different things, he accidentally crashes into, I, I assume, the Dilophosaurus paddock or um, a place that the Dilophosaurus has ended up in. Uh, Mr. Nedry, which... Uh, actually, I don't know, do we see all of that before the... I think we get the T-Rex scene first. Mm. Which, um, I feel like the whole film has been very carefully building up toward it's building up to a lot, a lot of things but this is one of the bigger ones and it feels like this is the the first one um in a similar way you could say about the the brachiosaur and the triceratops but this was the big one it's like we've got to nail this this is what people are at the cinema before sort of thing and uh and it will forever be referenced as a time where they absolutely bloody nailed com uh, combining cg and practical effects Oh my God! I mean, uh, this movie is is a masterclass in doing that. You even have and that, that cup with the the tremors. Oh, a visual so that everyone good. remembers. Well, it's it, you know the idea, and, and in the theater when you saw this when it came out, the bass, the 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 surround sound, it came out, and I don't know, I don't want to say this is the very first DTS film. Um, but the 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 digital sound processing of this in theaters was amazing because when you saw that water and you heard the, it was pretty incredible in the theater. I think we've not been dealing with stuff this big before. So you get these no. like fun ways of because this whole scene is just build up, build up, build up, build up. And oh then, yeah. Everyone's going to have lots of different favorite shots, but one of the ones I absolutely love in terms of... Uh, Rags brought this up when we were watching, but um, something that seems to be benefiting this so much is having these animatronics actually being in the rain. Uh, yeah, having real water running down them uh, does a lot of uh, help to sell these as being real. Um, everything's in rain, the cars are in rain, the people are in rain... The animatronics, they're the puppets, they're in the rain too. So the rain, I mean, they're real. So it it makes them seem like they're you know really there, like they're part of the world. 
Well, I have to say that that at the time, part of the reason that they're in the rain is because they needed that to sell the CG. Because it wasn't oh, quite yeah, the, there yet. It, that's all, the thing. It sells CG and it sells the practical stuff. Yeah, I mean, all the way into uh, 1998 when Roland Emmerich did Godzilla. God, ugh. <laughs> but, 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 oh man, don't get me started. But that's the reason that the, the, the scenes in New York with the faux Godzilla rampaging were in the rain because rain was a great way to, um, get rid of any, uh, uh, let's call it less perfect effect shots. And it was an easy way to be able to transition between CGI, practical and, um, practical effects, and then just live action. And it was a brilliant way to do it. And of course at night, things are scarier. Yeah. And, so, and, and better at hiding imperfections as well. Nighttime. Yeah, I, absolutely. And, and, and unfortunately, I mean, at the time, even though the effect, this is another brilliant thing about Jurassic Park. The the way the effects were caressed into live action, it was so well thought out. And the verisimilitude, again, the, the reality that was created across that film was because even the people that were doing the effects understood the limitations of what they were able to do. And they all worked together synergistically to create... You never for one moment, there's not one shot in Jurassic Park that I can remember that you say, ah, that looks fake. I don't think there's one shot. I think you act there that the, the, every single effect shot is, is amazingly caressed into the film. There is, and that's, I mean, every movie, even like pick your favorite effects film. There's always one shot that you're like, oh, okay, I'll give it a pass. One of the ones Not I was going to highlight now, actually, just jumping ahead a little bit, is where uh, the Velociraptor's below them, and it pokes a hole up through where they're uh, crawling through, and uh, I was kind of just yeah. impressed by how good that looks, the uh, the Velociraptor below it, even though it's completely CG. It's like, yeah, I mean... That looks better than a lot of shit these days. It's uh, Yeah. They nailed again, the way that the it moves, they nailed the motion. The design of the shot, and you had Phil Tippett, I mean... What's really interesting is you had a stop motion animator making sure that the CG, because they were stop motion animating models that they then scanned in to the computer. So it's a pretty amazing synergy of practical, more so than just seeing practical effects on the screen, but the CG effects were also designed by people doing stop motion animation, which is incredible. Incredible. Oh yeah, it's it's really interesting how that can feed into making CG. That's like I keep saying it, but it's just true. The actively more convincing than a lot of two hundred million dollar projects that are coming out today. Um, and a lot of people talk about how it's it's because the animators aren't given their time. It's it's less to do with the fact that they're like less skilled necessarily. A lot of them can do that that, that running animation in Ant Man. There's not many animators in the world I think that would look at that and be like, that looks amazing. Like no, they know. It's the uh, the 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 quantity of work that they need to do, and the time that they have is uh, because like, what ninety five percent of shots in Jurassic Park? Uh, oh, it'd be more than that, even like ninety seven, ninety eight percent of the shots are not like CG. Mm -hmm. Would be my guess. They're just right. They're well, just, you know, real regular photography. Whereas if you look at like Ant Man, how many shots would have no visual effects? Like five, ten percent, maybe. Maybe. Well, like, you maybe. you've just quantified. Uh, a very salient point when it comes to filmmaking today. Everyone uses visual effects as a crutch. They think, oh, we'll shoot mm -hmm. against a green screen. And they don't think about the 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 toll that takes in post-production. Well, you know, it's like, it'll it'll like, help it, us. It'll help us in, in while we're shooting. Like, let's use the volume stages or whatever. But when you're dealing with post- it's exponentially longer amounts of time because of the people, the design. And and what's really interesting is it definitely translates. I mean, at the end of the day, all a movie should be concerned with is what is the effect that this film will have on the audience. And when you when you look at like I always go back to I mean, I hate to keep going back to the MCU, but 
the reason that Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania didn't work for audiences the way other Marvel movies did is because they don't believe it. They don't believe what they're watching. You go back to Endgame. I watched Endgame last weekend. I'm like, well, there's lots of people in rooms talking to one another or sitting at a table in a diner, even the Hulk. And you buy it. You you enjoy what you're watching. Quantum Mania, everything's a goof. You know, we're 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 in a we're in a quantum realm we don't believe because it's not it's it it was designed by people on their screens. They never well, thought to Well, well, so something I would interject with is why is it that Avatar 2 I don't think Avatar 2 is a good movie at all, but like the production side of that film is incredible. And that would have been incredible. A film that was- 95 but you believe it Xbox. like they're underwater you believe they're so underwater that, that's kind of the uh the interesting thing is like so what is the difference you can have films that are like 95 percent visual effects you can have you know fully like rendered like you see some of the cg trailers they make for video games that looks awesome and it's like so what's the difference and and you look at and it seems like it's the intentional use of the technology and deliberate thoughtful use of the technology with avatar 2 they spent what two years developing new technology to do actual underwater like motion capture. Like yeah, they spent well, well, time developing you, that technology to leverage it. You but you just nailed it. You nailed it in the sense that that the idea that that okay, if you're gonna create a quantum realm, we all the audience lives in the real world. We understand what what the physical universe looks like. We understand when you are, are are looking over a natural vista what that looks like. If you're going to create an artificial environment, you still have to give us cues, some kind of yeah. visual cue to make us believe that it could possibly be real. We need to laugh. And, and what's interesting about the Marvel, uh, I, I, I'll flat out admit, I loved Marvel phase one, two, and three. I loved I love Infinity War and I love Endgame for all of its <laughs> Endgame's problems. They're so okay. much fun, but what's interesting about them when you go back and you look at them, um, all of their fantasy sequences are 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 conduits. Like you go through the quantum realm and it it takes you to New York, or it takes you to a rooftop. It takes you and and the stuff of the ancient one is not exactly convincing, but but. It takes you to real world places. And I think the Marvel Cinematic Universe, I think Loki uh, failed in that with the time variance authority, it pushed the Marvel Cinematic Universe beyond credulity. You cannot believe it anymore because the time variance authority is Terry Gilliam. It's, it's, it, it, you don't. So when you bring it back to something like this, is that everything in Jurassic Park. Even the effects, even as far as they want to push it with the Raptors or whatever, you believe. You believe because it's always in an environment that's grounded. You can have the biggest visual effects you want. And that is a directorial choice. Yeah, Whereas yeah, yeah. What, well, so, what's happened, well, what's happened now, uh, no one believes anything anymore. Because because the visual effects are not grounded in our world. Like, you have to believe that if we've seen pictures of, of space, we need to believe that... I'll give you an example. In Star Trek, they have large capital ships that that move... They have to... They, and in and, and our experience, capital ships are on the water... It takes a long time to maneuver them around. They can't move like like starfighters. So when we see capital ships, they have to lumber. Even in space, they wouldn't have to. You could spin end over end. It wouldn't matter. You're not constrained by gravity. but Or maybe you are if you're by planetary gravity. Well, but we still have the experience of we understand ships on water. We get that. You still have to make us as the audience believe. And so much of modern effects work. Uh, oh, hey, it looks cool. because, And I blame video games. Because when you're playing a video game, you don't have to believe as much. That's why people love like The Last of Us. Oh my God, there's real emotion 
It's uh, the cinematics are incredible. The acting is incredible, but the gameplay can break physics and you're all cool. Like, uh, look, I love devil may cry. I love being able to jump up 10 feet on a wall and pull out my and blaze out at a, a, and kill creatures. But with movies, you have to believe. And what's happened is with the Jurassic world sequels, there is no more verisimilitude. They do have those wide God images and effects. It, it, you can watch the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and now it's gotten to a point where you can't believe any of it. They wonder why, why, why are not, why are people not going back and seeing Ant Man and the Wasp: Quantum Mania? Why hasn't Kang caught on? Because no one believes it. It's bullshit. Something it's I would say. The, the, and the Star Wars prequels and the Star Wars sequels were a bunch of hooey in the <laughs> long run. Nobody buys into it. No one believes it. Now, kids will believe it. Like, uh, Jar Jar Binks, whatever. That's You're saying fine. no one bought into the prequels? Wow. No, they didn't They didn't oh, buy into the prequels. I do. Well, so this is well, the yeah, thing. Because you were a kid when you saw them, right? Nope. I What, you think I haven't seen them since I was a kid? <laughs> No, no, but when when did you first see them? When they first came out. Right, but how old were you? Uh, not old. I was. That, not old. That's they, what I, yeah, not old. But that what I mean is your. I believe them as an of, adult. Well, I've seen them you, as an adult. Yeah, but you grew up with them, like your yeah, first sort of, experience. Yeah. Your well, first what, experience with them. Like, but, Robert, um, I imagine you'd, uh, like, you'd concede everyone's going to be different in terms of their line for breaking what they believe in is happening, right? Like, uh, yeah, but you'll, you'll get someone who says, nah, Jurassic Park's a bunch of bullshit. Dinosaurs aren't real. I could I could see that shit a mile away. It looks like a little robot. It looks like a little bit of CG. Uh, wait, wait. Here, here, but I would say to you this. In all of cinema history, dinosaurs all the way back to the 1920s, The Lost World, Willis O'Brien... Dinosaurs were portrayed in film since the dawn of cinema. Not until 1993 was reality established where we could believe that dinosaurs existed. I don't know. I think that depends on who you ask. Because uh, there's been a lot of there's been a lot of that Ray Harryhausen you mentioned, you know, Valley of the Guanji and stuff of that nature. I think there's plenty of people who felt like that was very realistic and it was uh, well, very immersive uh, and believable. Uh, but okay. Yes, but I don't think anyone believed it the way, I mean, at the time, I mean, now we're getting into philosophy, but at the time when people watched these things, look, I loved Jason the Argonauts when I was a kid, the, the, the battling skeletons. And, but even then, as much as I loved it, I didn't think it was quote unquote real. Well, that's you. I knew I knew that I was watching a film, but Jurassic Park was the first time that in the history of cinema where the audience could look at those images and go, are there really dinosaurs there? <laughs> I think that is a hard disagree on that one. I, will, I think cause... that there were plenty of times. Uh, I think that's up to different people, and it's not only up to different people. Uh, it's, it has a lot to do with the expectations of the time period. We're almost into it, escapism, maybe, right? As a maybe, concept. but but I, what I, what I'm talking about though is look, the first time someone watched a movie of a train coming into a station in the late 1800s, people were freaked out by it. But I, I here, Mike said something but, about uh, expectations that I find interesting because now I'm thinking about video games. I I'm pretty sure this is true that when Final Fantasy VII was coming out. People were like, there's no way. This is like the peak of graphics with like the pre-rendered stuff that they were doing for that game. Yeah. Uh, and then like you look through every generation, right? Like the bar keeps getting set of how can they do better than that? This is like, this is so, I buy into this. Like I believe that these characters, they're remoting and, and like I can connect with them. And then it just sort of keeps changing with the times. I would have to imagine that a almost meta recognition of what we as people are capable of with creating art can kind of feed into what people will buy into as real and that it keeps sort of changing over time. And it's the reason why Jurassic Park is so interesting because even though, you know, visual effects have improved and everything, like Jurassic Park is still a film that you can really buy into. Whereas there are other well, films that came out in the 70s, 80s and 90s with visual effects where it's like, eh, it's not really working, you know? Like it's not really like, yeah, it's kind of goofy now or it hasn't aged very well at all. Uh, I mean, look well, at, how, but, but, look but at the way people looked at Star Trek, the motion picture, or the way people looked at Star Wars when it first came out. 
It's like, yeah, you could see how people were wowed and amazed by that, but visually, they haven't necessarily aged the best. But but here's but here's but here's here's the thing. I would say this, like for instance, in Star Wars, when you when you when you first see, because I, I I saw it opening weekend. Now, and I've said this a lot to people. Um, when you first see the the blockade runner and the star destroyer, yeah, never before in cinema history did that kind of imagery exist. There was nothing in the history of cinema that showed that shot. That uh, when the camera pans and it, the 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 crawl goes away, the camera pans down. You see the two moons, and then you see Tatooine represented not as a sphere. But you're 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 there on the horizon. No one had ever seen that before, and the way it was portrayed created a reality because we'd seen orbital pictures of the Earth and all that. So there was never anything in cinema history ever to show us space the way Star Wars did. So when the Rebel blockade runner goes overhead and then the Star Destroyer follows it. The fact that it took so long to see that whole ship reveal itself, and then when you saw even the light in the engines, it created a a sense in the audience that this is real because there was no visual language that existed before Star Wars cinematically to give us any frame of reference. Out of curiosity, complete- what do you say to the people who say Jurassic World does feel real to them? Well, here's the thing. Now, what's happened is, um, and that's a very, by the way, great question. What's happened is our sense of, of the real has been changed because we have a whole generation of people that have grown up with virtual cameras. And, and the, the idea of, of cinema has changed because of video games, because of uh, CG, the the idea of reality on screen and here's another thing they don't care because they didn't live in a world where cinema had to create you know if you go back into cinema history and you you deal with the the neo realists the like uh uh italian neo realism like open city roma open city or you go back to the french masters truffaut or uh, italy antonioni that idea they never saw that so they grew up in a world where they don't care about realism anymore it doesn't need to feel real because they've grown up in a world with virtual cameras where anything is possible ai artwork that's great why do we need somebody sitting there painting on a canvas who cares so what they're seeing is something that they don't know the difference because they didn't grow up in a world pre Star Wars. So, so what's they, so, so in, in one sentence, can you tell me what the point of all that was? Hey, rags, rude. Well, no, no, the, I just like condense it. I'm, I'm losing, I'm losing track uh, here, here of here, kind of what's okay, being said. Here's, here, here's the thing if you haven't grown up in a world where you saw stop motion animation, when you see computer generated technology, or computer-generated imagery, you don't know the difference. You haven't. Wait, seen... you don't know the difference between CGI and reality. You don't know the difference between cinematic technique in terms of stop-motion animation to reality. For instance, if you were to watch a CG, and what's interesting, if you go backwards, you'll see it. If you watch computer-generated skeletons fighting Johnny Depp in Uh a Pirates of the Caribbean movie. Great. I love it. Looks great. But if you go back and you watch stop motion skeletons fighting Jason and Jason and the Argonauts, you'll be like, that looks terrible. Maybe. That doesn't look... Um, uh, I mean, I can see that's a a common uh, POV. It's just that um, we go through all kinds of eras and all kinds of people seeing all kinds of things. It's funny that you seem to reference how video games are like this thing that you clearly can't get immersed to into, into a sense of it all being real, but it's like millions of people do, depending on the oh, game. Yeah, that's what it no, does. No, no, no. Video games do it more than anyone, anything else. Well, but, but that's, but that's, here, okay, look, here, here's the thing. Video games are amazing. 
I've always said that video gaming is the art form of the 21st century. Cinema was the art form of the 20th century. And, and Jurassic Park represented a, a pinnacle of cinema technology and that we finally believed that these extinct creatures were real because in cinema and 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 here's the thing you had to have you had to have lived through it you had to have watched these things and get to a point where nowadays you can you you can go back and you can look at it all because it already is all there all i can tell you is that i went to the cinema as a fan and watched the evolution of this stuff and it was astonishing and sitting in that theater watching Jurassic Park in 93 at the Galaxy Cinema on Hollywood Boulevard, I felt a change in my perception of reality in that I had been watching stop motion, and I love stop motion, all the way back to Willis O'Brien. But I knew, even as a kid, I understood stop, land of the lost, you know, in the 70s. But when I saw Jurassic Park, I believed, man. I believed. Does yeah, it, no, I, I totally think believe that, that when um, we look at um, like the evolution of the technology that was employed to make these films over the years, that it was like mind blowing. I mean, you see that rep represented in just sort of the way that those films were discussed at the time and how they're remembered now. Like, but even Star Wars here's the thing, the crazy it, stuff that it, yeah. But it was it was the experience of sitting in the theater because stop motion animation is was constrained by the fact that you're dealing with a a limited uh 24 frames you always had motion I'll, I'll i'll give an example so in 1981 a movie called dragon slayer came out that ilm did and they had created what they called go motion with empire strikes back where stop the the problem with stop motion animation was it was click 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 and what it didn't have was motion blur. Because when well, people... so something I will interject with is uh, as a big old fan of Ardman's work, um, stop motion animation is like a uh, is like a medium. I think it, I think it's almost worthwhile to. It's, it seems like we're very much focused in on like examples of stop motion integrated into like live action films, like with Terminator, like at the end of the film with the T eight hundred. But it's also worth thinking about like other applications of stop motion as well, right? Because like Wallace and Gromit, like that's you hyper buy into that, right? Like that those characters. Yeah, but, are... but 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 hang on a second. But Wallace and Gromit, yes. And by the way, I love look, the wrong trousers is fucking genius. I love stop motion animation. And if you go back to Vladislav Steryevich in the teens and the twenties in Russia, you know, he was one of the, the the people that that pioneered stop motion. But stop motion itself is an art form. But like you say, yeah. When you start to integrate stop motion into live action, like nobody, nobody ever would question Ardman animation. I love those movies. But when you're trying to use, like, how did you show before CG, how can you possibly show a dinosaur in live action? Because it, you could never make one mechanically that's 65 feet tall that, that would, you can't do it. It, it was, it was technologically impossible to do. So you you use stop motion. Now, what's interesting about film is film is a succession of still images that are projected at 24 frames a second. And and because of our perception of reality, persistence of vision, the the idea of motion is created. But what we're watching is a succession of still images projected at 24 frames a second, which is where stop motion comes from. You know, you can, you can click, click, click. And so what happened was the reason when you're watching a movie that we believe it is because there is our persistence of vision, but not with stop motion because there is no blur. It's, it's a succession of still images. Like when you pan a camera at 24 frames a second, there's blur and like blur is part of our reality of perceiving the world. So what ILM did is with it? Empire Strikes Back. Uh, I mean, we have blur. I in see a... blur. Well, well when I mean, you... when you're driving in a car, right? And then like it's yeah. It's I mean, really from really you and, and also you have your you have your perception of like 
your awareness, like when you're looking straight ahead as opposed to your uh, peripheral vision. Yeah, there's a whole difference. That's, that's a, a depth of field. Do humans see blur? Under, well, if, if, if you are like little conscious of blur moving objects, okay. Well, yeah, because I thought but, like when lights move fast past us, we they like blur into lines. Yeah, right? I was what I was um oh, I was sorry, thinking of. I yeah, think the point was, was uh, talking about. Well, well, I mean, how about, how about the fact that we're locked in to a um so with cameras, for instance, basically the human eye only sees things at fifty millimeters. Like if if you were to if you were to when you're making movies you have a whole series or taking photographs you or or even virtually there's a whole series of different kinds of lenses with different focal lengths, but human beings are basically and this is an oversimplification we see things at fifty millimeters. That's that's how our vision is designed for whatever reason. Looks like so, it's twenty two. Twenty two millimeters. So, yeah, 22 millimeters. Eyes focal length is 22 meters. Well, so we're locked into that. That's all we can see. So when you're seeing cinema and movies and you see things shot at different focal lengths, we're seeing the world in different ways. And yet well, um, all of could our... you Could you explain what focal length is just so we're all on the same page for what that kind of like means? Okay, well, a focal length is how we perceive, like, okay, the distance, say, between, well, it's hard to, so if you're looking at something, let, let's imagine you're looking at the world, uh, what, whatever you're looking at right now, whoever's listening to this, what you're looking uh -huh. at, uh, whatever is, how, what you're seeing in front of you is the focal length of how you are seeing the world, which is probably entirely in focus. So I don't quite follow like cuz like cuz 22 millimeters is a distance what's the what's the distance is that like how small of an object we can perceive or No 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 it... it's it's it, okay all like you can't see like for instance if you look through a microscope and you're looking at say a paramecium or something mm -hmm. you can't see that right now because the focal length of what you can see in the world is fixed. You can't, like, say, zoom in on something. So anything smaller than 22 millimeters, the human eye cannot distinguish. Well, you, you, you can, depending on, I mean, maybe where, where, it, where it is, depending on where you're standing. Or if you look at something closer, the focal length, the way you see does not change. Like you can't zoom in your uh, 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 focal length. So the focal length, meaning the way you see in terms of where an object is and where your sight begins and ends, you can't zoom in to something. So your focal length is fixed. Like you can't zoom into an object. You can bring things closer up to you. Well, so it sounds like, like you're saying can't... from this that there are realities about the way that we can see and that filmmakers are very aware of that and they try and create consistencies yeah, in course. their approach and, and, and that and, that's and been kind of broken cinema... with a lot of modern stuff or maybe other mediums. Well, well the thing is, but, but the whole thing about cameras is they change focal length. So, like, if you're standing at the beach, for instance, the way you see things, the way you perceive the surf, for instance, is unchanging. You can't, you, you can't, you can't change, you can't zoom in and see the surf differently. You can't see motion differently. The way we are designed, the way we've evolved, it's the same always. Well, you and mean, what happens is... But you can create stylistic representations of those things in, in the forms of like animation, stop mill, wherever else, right? Of, oh, yes, absolutely. But the way we actually perceive, like if you're standing here... The way you see things right now that you're looking for, whatever you're looking at right now, you can't zoom in and look at something closer. Your focal length, meaning if you have a lens or a zoom lens, for instance, you can change the focal length, meaning that where you're standing can actually, the way you see something through a lens can change. You can zoom in, get closer to it, and then the bokeh changes. Everything changes about, and through a camera lens. So well, yeah, so, so that's like kind of what the what the value of uh, 
basically any form of art, but if you're looking at cinema specifically, is is that through the use of different techniques, you can essentially provide people with a different representation of reality. Every single to, shot can and do that. that. Can be super exhilarating. Yeah, no, I mean, totally. I'm sure, and, no, and that's what that. that's, that's why cinema is so exciting because it shows us the world the way we can't see it. And, yeah, and no, so, I, I got you. You know what I mean? Well, and yeah. So and when you well, it's interesting because you were you were referencing what you think maybe in terms of medium or iteration has lost it or kept it. Um, I was really surprised you referenced Endgame as one of the ones that felt more real to you because I felt like that was particularly fake, especially the um... Endgame is a uh, well, the, it, it uh, the, the, the gamble, end. Right? But here's here's one of the things about Endgame: you have scenes where people are just sitting in rooms, like for instance when those when ones Steve are Rogers believable. Goes, yeah, yeah. But yeah, of course, that, anyone I mean. filming the final people, is, uh, anyone filming people in a room is going to feel mostly yeah. real unless you really fuck it up. I, obviously, we're talking about how Iron Man. You would like slam down into the ground and look around it, but it's like clearly all CG or uh, at least mostly. And yet it'd be like, man, that mixes in so well. It feels like he's actually there slamming down. Meanwhile, everything in the later movies, and including Endgame, that mess of stuff in the final fight. Obviously, the the, oh, oh, the colors yeah, of this yeah, stuff uh, happening. To, uh, and then when you totally. see how it's filmed, everyone's wearing those weird things. There's green screen everywhere. There's yeah, a couple of rocks. No, no, no there's, like, there's no. And 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 the Marvel Cinematic Universe is a great lesson. In in how we we lose the plot, it, it, it lose the reality. And but what I was going to say about so with stop motion animation, all even the best of it, and I'm not talking about Ardman because by the way they've they they use computer assisted technology to. But and I love the Wallace and Gromit movies, and one of my favorite things in the world is Creature Comforts, their Academy Award winning five minute short which if you have not seen it is one of the greatest so for creature comfort yeah they're good shit they actually it's so good and they went to they went to the zoo and recorded people and they went to an old folks home and they recorded people and they used the dialogue and then they created this 5 minute short it's amazing but what happened with stop motion beginning with empire and beginning with um dragon slayer was they added motion blur. The problem with stop motion is it always looked herky-jerky because it was singular. There was no blur. When Look, put your hand in front of your face right now and, and, and just, just wipe it back and forth. It blurs. There is blur there. You can, you, you, it, it, that's, that, that could not be created before 1980 cinematically so that's what you're seeing you you're not seeing a singular like in front of you there is blur there motion blur because we see persistence of vision we don't see uh perfectly and 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 so i feel like i've gone off the track here but <laughs> but i will say what jurassic park did cinematically is it finally, for the very first time, like certain things like Star Wars did with miniature photography and motion control, Jurassic Park showed us photorealistic dinosaurs that moved and appeared real to our perception for the very first time in cinema history. And that was shocking. No, I, and I, this, it, I completely understand and can see there's so many arguments to make, especially I would make them about this movie for why it comes across as so much more immersive, realistic, and perfect for the form of escapism to the point where you can believe for a moment, maybe in the cinema, holy fuck, that dinosaur just looks in is yeah, real. And, but, and also because of the way it was shot. Yeah, you know, no, of course. And, and while um, all this technology, like we have great technology that makes us look at things that are real, but I'm talking about the, the, the quality of us, like it's a philosophical, how is it that we believe, like when we watch movies, do we actually, we have to give ourselves over and believe in them. It, it, and it's a hard thing to explain, but Jurassic Park did it for the very first time. Well, that's like and, what the craft of filmmaking is, right? Is, is essentially getting people to buy into what you're presenting to them as like, like suspension of disbelief, right? What is it other than uh, 100%. I know this isn't real, but I'm buying into it, and you're doing a lot of work to buy me into it. And then there are some things films can do where it's like 
ah, you lost me, you lost me. And a lot of the time it can be like plot stuff, um, or yeah, it, it can be it, like it, visuals or anything. It, it, but it, in the case of Jurassic Park, it's like it's so tight and it's tight in all aspects from like the filmmaking to this, like the writing itself, the characters, it's all very 100%. Cohesive. And you believe it. And and the no, thing is, sure. I think what, what's happened now is because the technology, we have become, we creators, we have become lazy because we now live in a world where people just ah, buy into it because they're, they're so used to seeing all different kinds of... Well, I guess uh, Ant-Man is kind of an example of where it, it's not working, though, I guess, right? Like that even you could for say as much phase as four we are in a... was like the slouching towards creating amazing things. They just they do it a dime especially, a dozen now. But now, well, especially, now it's yeah, having a detrimental set, effect, right? uh, finally. Exactly. Well, and, and the difference is, the difference is when you go see Ant-Man in the theater you don't walk away from it satisfied. You don't feel good well, about the it. Whereas the Rob, we got sludge. We got like six it's hours of talking about all our issues with that. that not even, we do bring yeah, up was... how fake it looks, but um, even for but me... But I mean, like... I, when it comes to Jurassic Park, part of the appeal of the first Jurassic Park is the believability of it all. Yeah, and, no, I yeah, think it's, they're all support elements. elements. I agree. Yeah, it's just... um. <laughs> <laughs> there's just so much that comes into whether or not an individual believes what they're seeing. I don't know that we could ever get it down to a guaranteed assumption about how everyone's going to take everything. But, no, uh, but, but, I, but, I, but I, I think in, in terms of the evolution of cinema, it's important to recognize that until Jurassic Park, there was no way. In, and even if you go back, and I'm not saying, look, I grew up watching all these movies. I love them. But... Jurassic Park was the first time people went into a cinema and saw dinosaurs that they, in the back of their minds, believed that they were real. It was real. Yeah. Um, it was yeah, a I big guess it deal. depends on who you ask. Um, I bet for a lot of people, it's probably true. Um, I bet a lot of people felt that way, you know, about earlier stuff. Yeah, and a lot of as well as you said, a lot of kids would be watching this film. I know I was, and you, it's even easier to uh, take them, sort of whisk them away to a fantasy world while an adult, uh, right? You know, whereas an adult might be to more aware of the filmmaking, like more aware of the fact that you know the the craft of filmmaking. But I mean, that's that's the thing that's cool, right? An awareness of filmmaking gives you like an appreciation for all of the work that goes into it, and like a respect for uh, you, you know, new benchmarks. Well, and it's what for, this scene uh, is. The scene for this that. scene, this scene is uh, this is a great example of basically like a hyper flex as a filmmaker. It's yeah. like a really amazing, like in a microcosm, it's an awesome tech demo. But I mean, obviously, in the scene with these characters, it's so cool. Like having this incredible spectacle of the T Rex, the terror, the tension, um, and and like it's all feels so seamless. Like it's it's such an amazing sequence, and it feels like it hasn't. Like, if you saw this in a film release today, it would just be as effective uh, as it was, you know, back in 1993. When we talk about... Oh, I, there's so many different totally choices agree. for special effects you can use, and today it would just everything would be done with CG for the dinosaurs in, uh, like, the Lost... Well, the, the World franchise. I'm, I, I don't know if they've ever... I assume they still use some practical in some places in those movies, but I can't say I know for sure. Uh, I, uh, I legit don't know if they even do. Maybe they have practical stuff on set, but it'll be, like, the green big foam thing or... Or, like, a tennis ball or, or something. Not it'll like be a this, base, where we have... And then they'll put CG goo on top yeah. of it. As opposed to what we have here, which this 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 scene is like such a great example of jumping back and forth between practical and like CGI to where you don't even notice. Because here, like the shot with the dinosaur eating that uh that goat, well, yeah, that's the, real. The reason why I've got this up here is yeah. that I want to like, as much as it's definitely a time to appreciate the use of CG, the blending of it, the animatronics themselves, the actual it's physical amazing. special effects yeah. out, out of this fucking world. Good. I've always remembered this moment, especially because it's the the action of like swallowing the goat. And then it like slowly realizing like what's going on over here sort of thing. This shit is just enough for me to be like, oh my <laughs> god, is that thing actually there? Like, is that is that how it would look? And it's seriously, that sense of being there. Yeah, because it um, is there, of course, and, oh, when they were the filming lighting. it. And yeah, the lighting, the, the lighting. rain, the reflections from all of the look it at being that wet. shot. It's gorgeous. It's so good. Look at him there. Yeah. <laughs> and then and then the fact that it integrates so well of him actually moving. And it just seems like that intercutting of almost a recognition of how how much do we want to have it be like, you know, CG 
to where we need to try and like ground it again with uh something that you know for absolute sure is real and it's almost like the effect is that people don't even know which is real or not and like when you don't know you kind of buy into it totally like if you can't right. tell if it's real or not it's like you're kind of already there i'm pretty sure james cameron's talked about that before like if you can get people or i think what he said is like if you can get somebody to be like invested in this face like honing in on their eyes or whatever that that's uh that's like enough well, I mean, case, clearly he knows um, what he's talking about, guys. considering that box office. Well, but... <laughs> all of these guys, all of these guys know how to use the tools, and I think we talked before about the intentional use of it. When, if you're making a film like this, where you've only got, I think someone in chat said about five minutes of visual effects work. It's like there, there was no, there was no haphazard, we'll fix it in post kind of mentality possible here, because it needed to all be very deliberately constructed to make it feasible for them to to do this um like they needed to know which shots that they were going to be making were visual effect shots and plan for it on set to make it especially when you don't know if it's even possible it's just that amount of precaution and care going into it it like shows in every frame compared to ant-man where it's 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 much more broadly careless but not careless on the part of the individuals working on each of those shots right and, and to immediately after seeing that this incredible representation of the t-rex and then you have the lawyer just fucking sprinting yeah. off terrified well, yeah we're, we're still doing character right because this is the moment where we get to see these characters jumping into action he ran off whereas uh grant and malcolm are, are, are gonna like jump in to because yeah, they, they don't even the situation. they don't even know why he's running because uh, he says when well, you gotta no, go you yet. gotta go <laughs> he thinks he's going to <laughs> that's toilet right. which that's right they haven't and then that which is really cool as well of lopsided information that can always be really great for drama when some characters know a whole bunch um it's it's like, impossible not to I'll fucking go. love though yeah. they yeah. say that and then we pan left they both turn and you hear the <laughs> of each of the wires just coming down mm. and you're like that's that's the feds it's like what <laughs> you know a, 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 something that you'd reasonably assume is impossible is just happening now the t-rex is out right next to both of these cars it's just out and and what an amazing payoff uh, when we've built up to it for an hour, you know, that we're finally Yeah, here. and uh, uh, not only does it, it, it just, it's it's a restraint. It doesn't, you look at this and you don't think, oh, restraint, but you think about how we got here. And it's like, well, they could have splooged this all over the camera way mm -hmm. before now and shown you everything and just been excessive with its display. But this is like a payoff in and of itself, just seeing the thing for the first time. We talked about it with uh, House of the Dragon, the old man walking. This is dinosaur moving from its paddock <laughs> to outside of it, and it's one of the most memorable things that happens in this whole movie. Uh, I say that as if the movie isn't filled with amazing parts constantly. I guess I should say it's one of the most memorable in the whole franchise. It's a T-Rex. You used to be able to impress us with just the T-Rex existing, okay? <laughs> that used to be something you could do. Not anymore. When the reality is that you still can, uh... Just a, as how long you use as it, it's, you know, well, couched within the context of a story that has characters who you like is uh, is a big ol' that's a that's a good start. Well, like, I just you know, how long before it's Jurassic Park in space and there's a dinosaur with lasers attached to a spaceship, <laughs> and you're just like, yeah, why if all not, else I guess. fails, if all else fails, space, and yeah, um, on the topic <laughs> of utilizing everything at your disposal, the it would be interesting to ask initial audiences how much they thought was CG if they were told the exact mm. seconds amount of dinosaurs on screen. Because, like, you have this, the big old animatronic practical big boy head at the at the top right of the car, and it's just like, yeah, there he is, looking creepy as fuck. Camera pushes in, and the CG one takes over. Such yeah. a good idea, such a creative idea. You see the very real practical effect, and that will like it'll it's just gonna have the natural effect of your brain believing that thing is that. And when you see the CG one, it can help blend it in your mind. I would say like a like mm. a you see them together almost. Yeah, kind of. Well, it's the continuity is not broken, so there's no reason for you to assume that anything else has been broken, like the you know practical nature of the T Rex, the rain, the darkness, yep. and then keep switching from those different shots and. Man, what a, what an awesome animatronic that you put the light on it and then is is uh, the pupil changes dilates. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's a uh, it's such a cool detail. It just it just adds to helping you believe it. Yeah, absolutely. It was the little details, the little touches that breathe life into it. Like before talking about the Triceratops breathing, those little d d sort of yeah, th it's just the tiny details. Gorgeous. Oh, yeah, look at the, that. The and then it starts killing oh, you. Oh, I mean, yeah. 
Well, no, I guess it's one of them, a little bit of trivia for you moments, because I've heard it said a couple of times, where Rags, you were mentioning it uh, last night, the, he starts pushing in on the car from the ceiling, and then the glass itself comes through. And uh, were you saying, do you know it like as a, as a sort of established thing I've that heard, that was not deliberate necessarily? I've heard that it wasn't supposed to go through and push the glass oh. down from the top. Um, I've heard that that didn't, uh, that, that that just sort of happened um i don't know if it's true but that that's what i've heard um so really? I, i'm not sure yeah i'd have to check if anything it, like, it's it, certainly it's just awesome if true <laughs> like, it, yeah yeah it's one of those oh this happened to have happened oh good the children are actually terrified excellent that'll 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 be great for our movie yeah it's uh because <laughs> improvisation utilizing accidents is another part of uh I was going to say filmmaking, but I mean the creative process in all regards. I mean, and, and, and also creating reality. You know, I mean, one of the funny things about like uh, shaky cam now, that came out of combat photography from World War II and Vietnam and Korea. And the idea of you, you have shaky cam, it's like, oh, your you're, you're document is a documentary thing. You're running and gunning and shooting. And so that's become a thing, Saving Private Ryan that, that uh, Spielberg did. That opening sequence, which was the basis of, the, of Call of Duty, the video game. You know, that whole storming Omaha Beach or whatever. I mean, it's really interesting. Whereas in Jurassic Park, we don't get a lot of shaky cam. It's very composed, which is harder to do. Because you don't have that extra added technique that creates reality. So it's even harder think, um, when you're not. Do you think that the reason why they probably would have had less shaky cam was because at the time that would have made it even harder to integrate the visual effects? Like, oh my god, so much harder. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it it would have been insane to try and get to do to do CG shaky cam mm -hmm. is insane. That's insane. It's already hard enough at the time, especially. I mean, that's kind Jurassic of Park is thirty years old now. Yeah, this, insane. Uh, That's, this um, year or this study is old, yeah. There's a bit of irony that you you would have said back here, like, less shaky cabs is harder to implement special effects, but in modern times, it feels like more shaky cabs so we could protect the special Obscure. effects. You well, know, like, like from being seen as bad. It's kind but, of an interesting switch. Yeah, because, because it's a lot harder to have a steady shot and convince people it's real. Yeah. And then, and, and shaky cam is used as a technique to cover up many times uh production deficiencies uh right, sets like don't look real fights is a common one the more you shake the camera the harder it is for audiences to latch on to the fight whereas exactly it's every kind of painting video jackie chan likes clarity in his shots and big wide angles so that you can see the action it, it's, it's like how to... they used to shoot dancing uh like right uh, fred astaire movies you know swing time or something and and it used to be that that the thing is when you're like editing a fight scene and uh, this is the thing as an editor myself, I, I hate this when I have to do it. But when you edit, every cut makes human perception you jerk back in, in, in not like literally like, oh my God, you're back in the, your seat. But when you, when you cut, so like if you see somebody throwing a punch, for instance, and the camera's in front and the, the fist is coming at the camera. When you cut there, you get a what I call a fake punch. And then you can cut around that, and then you show the punch connecting, and you can the, the punch doesn't actually hit somebody. It can be far away or whatever, but it's that edit that helps you sell that punch. Well, editing now, is um, editing strikes me as an element of filmmaking that's kind of it like is it's it's totally that you don't quite when it's bad you it, it, it's it's a little bit harder to latch onto as clearly as like bad acting right where it's really obvious and in your face but good no editing is um, I was gonna say I don't know if I agree bad editing but, but, here, uh, but here right. but here's the thing here's the thing when you're watching like dancing and you see multiple moves in one shot then you know the people are really dancing. And in a fight right. scene, like a lot of Hong Kong cinema or one of my favorite, I love The Raid and The Raid 2 Baron Doll. 
-hmm. when you're watching these fight sequences, it's one long take and you see three, four, five moves. Like uh, you, you have one punch, two punch, three punches, maybe a kick in the same shot. No edits. It's a real big problem in modern stuff. Yeah. So many action scenes have so many cuts, and there's so oh many continuities. Oh, my God. Everyone's referencing the Taken one, yeah. right? The, the Taken. Yeah, Doesn't like it kill you? I Don't you watch it? What the fuck, man? It's and like, I guess the they're way... punching or fighting or whatever. I guess. I just see random things. Yeah. I don't really no, actually it's... watch them fight. Yeah. I just see, Dude, like, a I'm... punch or maybe half a kick and a spin. Well, I assume the, the... I'm so glad you said that, because, my God... I assume it the idea destroys... is they want you to imagine that the cool fight is happening and that you see enough there, right? So it's probably happening. And you sort of yeah, run with it. It kind of does the work for you yeah, rather um... than when you show it in full and there's nowhere to hide. Well, is there, any, like... editing, right? is there any like. Is there any famous Well, One of the beloved... great things about Jurassic Park, to bring it back, is when you see like the T Rex charge, it charges. Like it's a long shot where it's running toward you. And even though it's a CG effect, it's a shot, it is combined with live action, and you are watching, it does not cut away to create false, again, it comes back to perception. All of movie making is using the perception of us as human beings and how we see. I but, wonder what the longest unbroken CGI cut is in this movie. It that's could a, be. Yeah, that's actually a here. really... That's a really good question. I, I mean, I'll, now, I'll Google it. You just made I'm, me I'm want to go back and re-watch the film. <laughs> My guess like, would be like, like, either... Breaks out of the paddock, maybe? I, I was going to um, say, it's kind of that or maybe one of the scenes with the velociraptors in the kitchen when they were, like, moving around very slowly. Some of those were kind oh, of... Oh, yeah, maybe, maybe yeah. especially if... Uh, I, can't, I can't remember from memory if they apply a depth of field when they, like, zoom into the kids behind the counter and the raptors are in the back and they blur a little bit. But it might have been, maybe uh, it's the T-Rex running after the Jeep. Someone's the, recommendation the, was the uh, Gallimimus. That could be it as well. Or the opening, right? When they first see the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park, some of those shots were uh, long. Yeah. yeah. Like with the I guess it helps because they were so much further away yeah. as well. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. But I but bet I mean, it still it's... isn't that long. I bet I bet none of them are over 10 seconds. Yeah, what well, awesome... You guys have just totally excited the filmmaking like side of my brain now i have to go watch this movie yet for the 35 35th time and t i want to i want to do it with a stopwatch and time <laughs> every well someone's probably done that already you probably will find that online if you really yeah, want to. that's then, probably true don't take away an excuse to where you watch the film of course um i was just gonna say like uh, on the editing point I think that people struggle to see the difference between good and great editing, but like really yes. bad editing can stand really the fuck yeah, out. That's, you'd be like, Ugh. I oh yeah, well, like in, in the sound design, right? When it gets really bad, you notice, but when the sound design is great, it, you just sink into it. Like it's not even you're not even cognizant of how great it is. You have well, to start yeah, like again, deliberately it, listening. Again, mm. it comes down to like I'll I'll I'll, um, I'll give you an example, like Michael Bay. He, even his website is shoot shoot for the edit. He he runs like eight cameras on an action scene. Mm -hmm. The thing about that is he gets everything he needs, all these different angles or whatever. But there's no intent behind what he's showing you because when you blow something up, you know it's expensive. You can't keep reshooting it, so you run eight cameras. So when you watch a Michael Bay action scene. And with all the editing, the editing makes you, it's herky-jerky. It seems exciting because, oh, my God, I'm seeing all this work. I'm seeing all this editing. And it's it's and your perception, every time the image is cut from a different angle, you, your perception in your brain is going, ooh, 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 and it's exciting. However, I'll give you an example. If you watch Paul Verhoeven's action movies, like we talked about Starship Troopers earlier, if you watch RoboCop, and in RoboCop, when he attacks the cocaine factory, and you have a big, wide master where RoboCop is walking in, and you see him gunning down different positions, and then it cuts to uh, uh, different shots. Or, or another great example of editing is Raiders of the Lost Ark where you're given a master shot when you have the truck chase, when the Nazis have the Ark on the truck. And Indiana Jones has to get to it. What, through editing, what it does is it establishes a objective. And, and through editing, you, you see the different shots where Indiana Jones 
knows the objective. The audience knows the objective. And then he gets to the truck and he climbs up and through his bullwhip and all that, goes to the front of the car. And then the objective, uh, there's a new objective. And then it builds upon that. It's 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 rhythmic. It's like it's music. It's like it's um, mathematical poetry, call it that. And it has sure. intent. It has intent. And, and Michael Kahn, Spielberg's longtime editor, knows this, and Spielberg shoots. He doesn't shoot with eight cameras, and they'll figure it out later. The reason that Spielberg's able to do what he did in Jurassic Park is because those shots are designed. He understands how to create that in the minds of the audience. That's great direction. Yeah, well, yeah, storyboarding and, and, like, helped that quite a bit makes, too, right? Uh... Yeah, of, of course, and and he does that, and but also, you know, like he'll he'll build a model, you know, and he'll he'll yeah. have a model and and be like, okay, this is what I want to do. And storyboarding is great, but here's the problem: the problem is is it used to be that Spielberg would work with a storyboard artist. Nowadays, movies, action sequences, are designed by the visual effects and previous people. And Marvel right. does this, and the director has no input. And so the directors of these movies are given an action scene, prefab. And you ever see, they um, don't... You ever see Ryan Johnson's storyboards? Uh, I have not. <laughs> but, but he strikes me as somebody who's very involved in that. Uh... He works, or is he not? Uh, I would be curious to see what you think, because this is the thing, right? A storyboard that you can see ones that look amazing, and you're like, "Wow, they knew exactly what they were doing." And hang on, right. folks, I'll get you it now. But uh, so let me post some of these for you first. Th these are some that I don't know where people got these from. I think it was like a special behind the scenes thing. Now, are these Star Wars? Hang well, on. Well, you can see that that one's the TLJ one. <laughs> um, well, I mean, here's here's here's, here's what I. One. But my problem with a lot of, of and I, I saw this when I was um, working on Superman Returns, there was a there was 65 people doing previous. Now Brian Singer, the director, was always involved. He was but but still it was the storyboard guys that were coming up with all this stuff. And and that bothered me from from a a because you know, you. I think directing, and nowadays because of the way there's so many visual effects, you have to have these storyboards before you start shooting, in order to shoot these sequences. Because if you don't have them, you can't. Uh... Yeah, no, dude. Prep is so much is in prep that, like, I, I look at some of these storyboards from Ryan Johnson. I'm like, I think I would have said before seeing these. It's okay. It doesn't matter how crude your drawings are if you've got all of the ideas there. You know, like if you're yeah. Like, but when I see mm. these, I'm like, okay, maybe this is a bit too crude. <laughs> like, well, this. remember also with storyboard stuff and animatics, they're cutting these into the movie as you're editing. So, what your previous you might have previous that's done six months before you even start shooting. Well, and we saw your uh, editor is yeah. already cutting these into the movie. We saw with Endgame that they had previous the final battle three years before it came out. So that would have been yeah. about a year and a half before they actually went to shoot uh, and probably before they even had a script. Yeah. Uh, uh, and by the way, <laughs> Marvel has been doing this uh, yeah. since the beginning. And and I think there's been a schism between their, their visual design department and the movies they're making. And we're now seeing the results of it. I mean, it, it's so far removed from human consumption that, I mean, it's, you know, when I watched Loki, the Loki TV series, I, I even I, I'm a huge Marvel Comics fan since I was a kid. I thought that show broke the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Because it did. Because it, 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 did. It's, yeah. it, it did. It strained credulity. It's suddenly the TVA. I'm like, wait a minute. This is Terry Gilliam Brazil shit. This is not Iron Man 1. You know, Iron Man 1 is the story of a man who is questioning his choices in life. He saw his own Stark Industries bomb that didn't go off right next to him that should have killed him. And it was always human. And the end of the show is a, a, a battle between 
two dudes fighting for the soul of a company and and a philosophy. Very human movie. Yeah. By the time you get to Quantum Mania, there's nothing tethered in reality to it at all. Oh, yeah, dude, uh, people have speculated on like the human drama of Quantum Mania, and it's like, is it that Ant Man oh, needs to learn to be a hero again? It's like, not really. He... <laughs> No, but, but but to bring it back to Jurassic Park, we, all of us, think to ourselves about, I mean, what kid doesn't dream of riding a dinosaur? You know, even, I'm sure Michael Crichton, when he wrote the novel, it's like, uh, uh, how, and, and there was a different scientist who, by the way, wrote the scariest book I ever read. Um in terms of a horror novel, and they should make this movie. Uh, uh, st I think it's uh, Stephen Pellegrino. As I look on my shelf, it's over there. And I, um, he wrote a book called Dust. And, and uh, this scientist, he was the first person to come up with the idea of cloning uh, dinosaurs because blood law, uh, uh, preserved in amber. So he wrote this book. I want to say Stephen Pellegrino. It's not Stephen, but his last name is Pellegrino. And this book, Dust, is the premise of the book is all insects die. Not arachnids, but there's a major die out. All the insects in the world die. And what happens to the planet after that happens? I don't know why this book freaked. If I've read horrible uh, uh, every horror novel in the world, every British horror novel, I I've read them all. This book freaked me the fuck out. And he was the guy that came up with the theory of, of um, blood and amber. But Dust, read this book, and I'm telling you, it'll get under your skin. But the same reason that Jurassic Park worked was the reason Dust worked. Because you're like, oh, well, what would happen if the insects all died out? And he does that from a scientific standpoint and shows you what w would happen. And man, it was terrifying. <laughs> but the same thing is true of Jurassic Park. What if dinosaurs were real? And, you know. Well, real and alive. <laughs> like currently. Yeah, but, 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 but when you watch this movie for the very first time, you believed it. They were real. And, and I think that's the great ultimately Talk about the characters, the structure, the story. This was the first time we believed, man. Well, it's a fucking great we combo to have, to have the effects to be this good, the filming to be this good, and the script to be killer as well. Uh... Oh, yeah. And, 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 and that's the great... The, and by the way, I would dare say that the script for this film is better than the book. Hmm. Well, Michael the Crichton, book, uh, he, he was a screenplay. Wrote screenplay. Well, I think yeah. he wrote it, but then someone else did the final draft, I think. I think. But he was involved. Like, he was significantly involved in the film. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, and he wrote The Lost World. But, but you know, there's a lot more characters in the novel. And different people die. Like, Ian Malcolm died in the book. So did uh, uh, John Hammond. And um, hmm. uh, I think they made some really great choices in the movie that made it work because you know books are different than films tom bombadil did not belong in the fellowship of the ring <laughs> yeah that's that's an interesting uh, sticking the point for a lot of lord of the rings fans we'll discuss it to hell and back um, well, i think uh, often the challenge with adapting a book to a film is that it seems like often there will be more material in an average length of a novel compared to what you can get into our film it just seems like there's it often skews more of like more information in a book so it's like often, hmm, what do we have to cut? Um, but yes, because uh, this scene is funny. We got this much conversation out of this scene. We're like halfway through it. <laughs> like it's, yeah, not, well, it's, I'm it's sorry. I should shut up. Know, I'm sorry. It. I apologize. It's all good, man. Uh, EFAP isn't exactly known for being um, non tangential. <laughs> Tangent free. No, not really. So, what's cool, of course, is once Alan and Malcolm realize what's happening, they both have. Pretty big moments of like we're gonna save these kids. We got to like obviously the complete in co in comparison with the the lawyer. Um, I, I almost say that as if it's to imply lawyers don't care about kids. Of course, no. It's just uh, 
That's, of course, that's... no, they don't. We all know that they don't. <laughs> um, but yeah, Alan nails it. He distracts it with the flare and tosses it. It starts heading toward it. That gives you the opportunity that Malcolm, looking to help, is like, yeah, I got the flare too. Hey, hey. And he's just like, no, 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 freeze. Like, what are you doing? Then he starts getting chased by it. And of course, Malcolm, just trying to save his own life, heads in a direction, gets hit over, covered in a bunch of uh, debris from the building falling apart, which reveals lawyer man to the T-Rex. His efforts to hide from it basically guaranteed his death. And you know, this is another... Before we go, um, before we go too far, uh, uh, unless I blank, do we talk about, like, the mud in, underneath the car? Well, um, oh, I'm glad you brought that up, Rags, because um, something that I was reminded of while watching this film is, man, we've lost just, like, the grit and, uh, like, grime. Yes, like getting, people getting hurt, <laughs> people getting dirty... Like everything yeah. is too yeah. everything's super safe and sterile. It's everyone, every sterile. everyone's don't got worry, their we'll CGI the mud on, on you. <laughs> everyone's nice <laughs> hair oh is my always God. ready. Everybody's <laughs> got their lovely Hollywood faces, and this is like, because I think the mud serves a a number of uh, purposes. It does. What Fringy had mentioned it is like it's muddy, it's dirty, it's gritty. Um, you know, it, this is not a clean, sterile place. But the way that the car is flipped over and is spun around. And the weight of the T-Rex pushing down on it into the mud, it's just another one of those elements of selling to you that the T-Rex is real. Because even mm -hmm. though it's not in, like, the shots here, you know that this thing is being pressed down by this essentially monster on oh top of it. Oh my god, you're so right. In. <laughs> it's the so because it's how the environment effect. reacts to these things yes. and how the people yeah. react to these things helps you believe it. And I think it's, yep. in no small part, it's one of the biggest things that you could do. To make sure everyone's reacting to it realistically. Also, the feeling yeah, of uh, your shuttlecraft in my shuttle bay. Yeah. That's all I can say. The feeling of being wow. trapped too. Uh, yeah. The absolute horror. You don't want to get out of the safety of the car. It's like you got to get out of the safety of the car. The car is not safe for, <laughs> no. for very long. You know? No. The car is not yeah rated for T Rex attacks. No. It is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's. I mean, I can't help but look into that. Right. One of the first things a T Rex does is just fucking crush this car. A big representative of one of the coolest sort of uh, technological human achievements creations. of human creation. Well, yeah. it fucks up with it. It, it, it like pulls the muffler or whatever it is off the bottom it takes it rips a tire off it's like yeah an animal would i guess fuck around with this weird thing in front of it yes yeah, like is there so any part of you that's tasty it it's like nope 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 but what <laughs> this is what's this <laughs> like, thing um but yeah it's, uh, it's almost like you're saying uh binding it into the world with physics around it as well as um the way it's it so looks important. It's, yeah there's so much it's going so on so important especially because the because i they probably have a real foot um that they're showing pressing down on the car and you know when they move the I, I don't know how they do it i think they have something that flips and moves around the car and so the car is real and its movements are real and then they have the uh cg dinosaur you know looking as if it's causing those motions on top of it, I might be why so it works. it's that, it's that, that blend of yeah yeah um whatever they're using they they blend it together really well well, um, yeah, what better way to make a CGI thing seem real than to have it uh, actually interacting with a real thing? Like, who mm. framed Roger Rabbit when you have <laughs> cartoon characters who are carrying around real objects and they go through the trouble of having cutouts in the floor and things hanging from the ceiling so that people make the movements of the real objects so that afterwards the animators can come in yeah. and animate creatures carrying these actual real objects and it allows for a seamless transition of an, an object being handed from a tune to a real person who can then take that real object and continue yeah. to interact with it so true um but they don't do that shit anymore probably worth mentioning too because with so many aspects of why it's believable the sounds the t-rex makes um, oh the sound it's, what an iconic it, roar that the T-Rex has. Ruined the, it ruined the sounds of dinosaurs in the same way that Elijah Wood ruined the look of Frodo in a way. Like, can you imagine these things sounding any other way now? <laughs> yeah, you, and, and so it could be yeah. like, that's not how they would sound. It's like, don't care. <laughs> like, I don't care. That's how they sound dude, in my heart. that's how they sound, man. Come on. Come on, oh, dude. fucking brilliant. And I've heard, don't know if it's true, that it was a mix of crocodile and lion to make the uh, T-Rex roar. Um, really? uh, that's what uh, I remember reading it somewhere. Um, that's so, cool. Don't know. It, yeah, I can't say for sure. I should have probably checked, but um, we'll see. If ever I do a video on this film, I will definitely look into things like that because that's just badass. Um, oh, some people are saying elephant. Oh, I can believe elephant. With I can the, believe uh, elephant. Can yeah. Believe, uh, 
I I hear elephant now. Because crocodiles said it. make like a bellow, don't they? They just they kind of rumble. I'm not sure. Well, because um, elephant and lion, I can really I can really imagine. Crocodile, lion, baby, elephant. Seriously? Okay. Is that like the actual combination? I want to see the creation of that sound. That sounds I really awesome. I believe the elephant now that you've said it. It's kind of like that... Yeah, like yeah, that yeah. kind of sound underneath it. Yeah, I can believe that. Well, and it's so, it's so memorable now. That it's like you have to have at least one moment per Jurassic movie where it's here is standing <laughs> in full frame I, and makes the sound as got, the roar. I got some news here. Uh, the strange bark-like sounds that the film's raptors use to communicate is actually the sound of tortoises having sex. My God. <laughs> really? <laughs> That's uh, according to this article here. Um, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. Rids, this guy, who's Ridstrom? Uh, this is the, the film's sound designer, Gary Ridstrom, spent months recording and fine-tuning the dinosaur noises. He said if he knew where the sounds in Jurassic Park came from, it'd be rated R. Um, <laughs> the barking velociraptors are the sounds of tortoises mating. Uh, the Gallimimus stampede. Uh, the high-pitched squawking sounds those little guys make are terrifying. That's that. They're actually the sound of a female horse squealing at a male horse when he got a little too close and she got excited. You know, um, now you've made me... There's a vidoc for Halo 3 that talks about the sound design and the creativity that those guys had of like, well, I'm, I'm a sound engineer. I, I just hear sounds and I'm constantly thinking about how I could integrate those sounds into the game. And it's things like the doors, the forerunner doors, when they open, you know you know what I'm talking about, Rags, like the doors that part open the, the when you go yes, into the forerunner. Yes, it has a, um, yeah, and it's, almost... It is the uh... sound of, well, the real sound is like a hatchback car, the boot when you lift it, like the, the metal part of like, like when it's going up. Yeah, it's it's the changed. sound of the sort of like the beams uh, extending. Yeah, yes. yeah, and yes. kind of rubbing and against like, each other. You wouldn't think of it because it all feels so seamless. But it's like, yeah, the creativity that they sound like that the sound of like the brute shot is them like bashing a saucepan or like destroying an old Xbox. It's uh, it's really interesting. Have you ever seen movies of um, how when they have the old cartoons, they do live sound effects for it, like skates slapping and pans banging, and they make the noises in tandem with the um, the cartoon? That stuff's really cool. Because all the, I mean, hey, every sound that you hear in the video game or movie that you watch, that shit's got to come from somewhere. Every gunshot, every report, every footstep, every door, every blip, whir, and whiz. I mean, the blaster sounds Someone from Star Trek were. That. Uh, metal strings like a guitar that they plucked and altered. Um, it's always so much worth so. doing your original sounds because if you accidentally throw in a stock sound everyone knows and associates with something else, yep. it'll yeah. pull them out. Or, do you think, okay, does Wilhelm get a pass? Um, like a meme, well, right? So I'm thinking, do you, do you know yeah, about I mean, the, that's... The, hmm, I'm thinking about the I think now thing. you, you know can't use it unless it's ironic. It's it's only ever used ironically. I, I would it's, assume, it's, it's always a reference, usually, right? Like it's like, yeah. look, I, I made a movie. I got my Wilhelm screaming there. Do you uh? Are you all you all know the cat sound that you hear all the time. That yeah. one. You, you yeah. That I hear that every time I hear that. I'm like, oh, that's the stock cat sound. Uh, and Gunshots, also the, the, man. Gunshots. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's. I mean, I, I I love a great gunshot. When you go back and you look at older movies, like 80s Indiana, movies, they all have the Indiana same. Indiana Jones like, did a really punch. good gunshot noise. Okay. It's very, very the, punchy and umphy. Oh, my God. You are so you are so right. I was about to say, you are totally right. Uh, the Indiana Jones, the I mean, it feels full. It's, the it, Aliens it's full, pulse rifle. Oh, um, oh man. Oh, dude, oh yeah. Totally. <laughs> There, because a lot of it's one of my it's a constant complaint in video games that a lot of the times gunshots sound weak and anemic. They're not loud. They don't have pop to them. Um, but when they're done really well, they they super sell the Whoa, you know, Rags, the threat. You me. Another fun Halo fact: uh, in Halo Three ODST with the suppressed uh, SMG and pistol, uh -huh. they recorded the real sounds, but they thought that they were too weak, so they buffed them up. Um, because I wanted it to sound suppressed, but they felt that the suppressed one was actually too quiet and too muted. That doesn't uh, that doesn't surprise me. Depending on the kind of gun that you use, the kind of suppressor, the caliber, whether they're around subsonic or not, they can be surprisingly quiet. And mm. you want it to sound away because a lot of people are just not 
familiar with the way that guns sound. Um, especially like suppressed ones, automatic guns, rifles, and things. So you kind of have this line of, you know, we want it to, it doesn't necessarily, it shouldn't necessarily sound real. Maybe we should give it a little bit of, you know, a little bit of elaboration to it to really make it feel punchy or, uh, you know, or, or umphy. Well, I think Total Biscuit said that there was, because when he would describe Battlefield, he said Battlefield isn't realistic, but it's authentic. And it's like, hmm, what does that mean? And I think he described it as like, um, that it captures a perception that people have about is, reality rather than emulating reality, you know? It's plausible. I think it's it's the plausibility of it. It's like, yes, I know there wasn't... Yeah, they only made two Hell Regal submachine guns and they were never used in the war, but they did exist. They were real. The technology existed. It is plausible that a soldier could use it and it doesn't break immersion because aesthetically it fits in with everything else. So mm -hmm. it's fine, right? Whereas if you had an AK-47 in Battlefield 1, you'd be like, wait, 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 hold on. I know that's bullshit. Yeah, that gun didn't exist back then. Or like if an yeah. M1 Abrams in a World War II game. Yes. Um, that's one of my, yeah, the, yeah, like as much as I love Battlefield 5, I hate the Garand in that gun. It's, it's kind of, it doesn't sound umphy. It's not like, the Garand in Battlefield uh, Bad Company 2 was like, mm, it sounded umphy. It had a lot of heft to it. Um, the, it, Ugh, that's but, how they yeah, ruined world that's... at war i was fine with zombies but man they put a ray gun in that game and i was like you know what that's it you fucked it up you fucked it was only it in the zombies mode which helps ah, yeah, with the, the fantasy course. element of it though <laughs> i am just joking like, well, we're world already world. we're already in the realm of science fiction gone wrong you know okay let's do it ray gun well it's like fallout you know there's like a, you could believe pretty much all the guns in that um and then they have ray guns they're like oh and it's treated as if it's a special thing from outer space so you kind of buy it um so anyway, <laughs> I guess the... oh, I was I was um just gonna say the let's see the Triceratop sounds were from dozens of cows on George Lucas's film site Skywalker hey. Ranch, oh where God. the sound designer works. Um, <laughs> for the unforgettable sound of the dying Triceratops, Ridstrom turned to a simple homemade device: a cardboard tube with a spring in it. What about um, um, does it say the T Rex in there? Now let's see the T Rex. Here we go. Uh, let's see, the star of the film, biggest scariest character. Majority of its sounds came from none other than Ridstrom's own pet, a petite Jack Russell Terrier named Buster. <laughs> its characteristic <laughs> roar, on the other hand, oh. is actually the sound of a baby elephant. Oh, there you go. So, is it only the baby elephant that he warped it in, like, editing, or was it combined with other sounds? That'd be... It was probably... Uh, this just mentions the baby element, which I... Uh, the baby elephant, which I assume <laughs> was uh, fiddled with in editing. Um, let's see if I can read... This links to the full... Um, let's see. Velociraptors, mating tortoises, Muldoon, goose, birds. Um, the flock is... Every day I'd see my dog playing with a rope toy and doing exactly that, pretending like he's killing his prey. So he's a, He says in Terminator 2, he recorded the sound of Buster eating puppy chow, and that became the crunch when the T-1000 spiked that guy's eye socket. Wow. <laughs> so I, I guess it really it. is a thing Fringy said. If you're a sound designer, you just hear things. and like, how can I apply this? What could this uh, be used as? They, they hear the world differently um, because it's... It's it's you don't think about where the sounds in movies come from. Sound design really is like one of the most underrated aspects of filmmaking, video games, because it's just when it's there, you don't notice it. Um, oh, uh, apparently there's a, well, a YouTube video that goes yep. over the breakdown of the T Rex's roar. Okay, I'll have to check that out. Some point cool. sounds cool. <laughs> the Rancor Beast in Return of the Jedi. He did it by slowing down a Chihuahua. <laughs> wow. Really? So he, Man, said, he much, says it's I'm one of the today. secrets of sound design, that if you slow something down, something small, it brings out elements of the sound that you could probably never get if you recorded something big. <laughs> Man, you learn something new every day. So, um, in closing almost for this scene, well, there's two more things I wanted to talk about, but the famous thing of this scene is it seems as though, and I'm saying seems because I need to do extensive checking of all the shots, that the T-Rex the bursts through... Uh, one of the walls, and then later they fall out of it and into a pit. And it's like, how could the pit be there if the T-Rex came from that area? And how does the pit match, like, the the paddock, if you know what I mean? And I think there are theories about how it's like, no, that's just, you're confused on the POV of, like, where everyone is. They change throughout the scene. It's like a different area, maybe. 
Um, but some people say, no, it is just a huge plot hole to, to change into what they're doing from what they were doing before. I know that they're still fighting over it, and I think this video is breaking it down. So I wanted to mention it, because I used to be sure this was just a problem, because it used to be me me referenced all the time. But I know that there are arguments I haven't checked out for how it can make sense, and I need to check through the whole scene again. Because it's pretty bizarre to change the geography entirely in the middle of a scene. But it's not unheard of, um, you know, and it could be that, but... Uh, like it, Interstellar or whatever. <laughs> yeah, it does seem the dinosaur came from an area that they eventually went into and it completely changed what was on the other side. It's uh, might yeah, be an I don't, I don't think that it, it might be one of those. It might be a nitpick. I don't, I don't think it really affects any plot stuff. Um, but yeah, well, of course, if, uh, if the paddock were the way that we'd expect it to be, then he wouldn't have had to repel down that whole scene changes. But I think they'd still survive. Yeah, I'm not sure. I think that a T-Rex might be able to, because in real zoos, a lot of the time they have that big gap in between like the fence and where people stand in the enclosure where the animals are actually hanging out and moving around. It's where Harambe, rest in peace, died. Um, you know, they have that pit. And so it's possible that that's what that is. They have a, a big pit between the fence and the actual enclosure where the Tyrannosaurus walks around and all the dirt is. But, oh no, but the car falls down, and why would it fall? The, the pit wouldn't have anything in it. It wouldn't have a tree in it. Well, Yeah, that's um, really weird. People, uh, I remember someone at some point had emailed me like a video explaining it all with maps and stuff, like how it does make sense, and I remember not being very convinced by it, so I'd have to look into it to be able to say more. Maybe, yeah, maybe. Why am I wrong, Ben? What? <laughs> I just saw someone in chat say, fly high, Harambe. Fly high, Harambe. Yeah. Harambe. Oh, oh, man. Like, oh, Everyone oh, remember, man. dick's out for Harambe. Dick's out for Harambe. Dude, what was Harambe? Was it like 2015? It was a while ago. Uh, hey, hey, too, hey, hey. Too soon, hey. Frangie. It was too Harambe soon. Harambe endures forever. Don't, Gone, don't, but not don't put a date on Harambe. It's Come an on inspiration. Uh, Harambe always will be. Harambe forever. Um, so... That the only other thing I wanted to talk about was uh, the death of the lawyer man. Unlike Dennis, I don't think anyone would feel he deserved it or anything for the, like the damage he caused. It's just that they did make him abandon the kids to probably help you feel as though it's like, oh, there he goes. I less guess. less bad about less it bad, than you would yeah. if it was Grant or Malcolm. Yeah, as if you know him being a lawyer wasn't already enough. They really wanted to go the extra mile by having him abandon children in uh, distress. So that pushed him just I mean, over just, the edge of being like, yeah. It's that thing we were kind of talking about. Just, you, you do these things on purpose so the audience sort of don't have to feel as awful about a thing happening. They can, they can yeah, be like, it's, ah, there you go. If if you feel super bad every time someone dies, that's that's it gives a movie, it's not bad necessarily, but it gives the movie a certain vibe. Well, you know what it makes you think um, of? Um, do you remember Mummy Returns, Rags, Ringy, Robert, anyone? I... Oh, I don't remember Mummy Returns much at all. I'd have to see it again. There is a oh my god! Does well. anyone want to see it again? Hey, uh, some people like uh, it. Uh, I think it's not too uh, 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 I mean, <laughs> anyway, okay. there's a moment. Like it. There's a moment where the two heroes are. Oh, sorry, the hero and the villain are being like. Wait, grabbed. wait. Can I just stop it? Like, Mahler is invoking the Mummy Returns. Can I just say that? I just want to stop. I mean, I look to you. <laughs> As the guru of great storytelling, and you're invoking Mummy Returns, which means I have to rethink my a positive example. I'm still I I've famous I've been grabbed on for the opinion of saying that film's all not very good. Of, so you all know, kinds you know of movies have good or bad things. Yeah, there's an element. I'm just saying. I, mean, I I admire you more and more as the days go by. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'll defend all kinds of things. Uh, it's, right. it's, yeah, it's well, this isn't even particularly. God bless you, sir. It's not particularly good, but it's it's something to highlight, right? Like you have um, Imhotep and uh, Rick are both getting pulled in by like gross evil mummy demon things into like I don't even remember where they're getting pulled into. It's like hell or something. And um, they between them and their two equivalent wives slash I guess girlfriend for uh, Imhotep is um, a whole space of area with loads of rocks falling. I think it's like like stalactites. They're they're all coming down or something. Something heavy and sharp. Uh, over and over and over again. Think of it as like a floor is lava sort of situation. Walking across there is going to get you killed. And um, uh, Rick tells um, Evie to run. Just get out. because There's no saving him and there's no point in risking yourself sort of thing. And she rushes forward. She goes through the whole thing and saves him, gets him up. And then Imhotep says, 
save me, <laughs> like, to his girlfriend, and she looks at the whole situation and just says, no, fuck this, and runs. And it's just like, oh, you kind of feel bad for him almost. And then we follow her, and she slips on, like, running downstairs and falls into a pile of scarabs. It's just like, she gets one of the grossest deaths when you understand how that works. Oh, then again, I think it's probably more gross to die from one of them than many of them. Because it would be quicker. Um, one of them, I, I guess, uh, because... Well, they eat you slowly, right? Um, well, so, when you're in that many of them, of them, I guess get... they'd be able to do it faster. But one, you could you could get one of them out of you, right? If you had like a knife, like Rick does with uh, what's his face in the first movie. Oh, someone said, "What does this have to do with Jurassic Park?" What do you think I'm making saying this for? What do you guys reckon? Um, oh, I, I think what you're that. trying to illustrate is that um, when How it comes when to character dies? deaths, you can just like have them do something that will change how much a person is upset, basically, by what happens to them. And usually the way to make them more upset is to make that character a really awesome, great person. And the way to diminish it is to, I mean, do what we've done with uh, Newman here, right? Like, just, uh, d d like, have him be an asshole, Like, a completely contemptible... Yeah, like, she's, like, um... Dick. She, in the movie, she's not a good person. She's kind of an asshole. But uh, you oh, wouldn't just have her slip uh, and fall and die. It'd be kind of weird. But doing it right after she did something kind of assholey, which, by the way, is not entirely... It's the more that she abandons him. You're just like, oh, damn. Instead of yeah. sitting there being like, I wish I could save you something. But yeah, so that when she dies, you kind of... It feels like consequences. And that it matches. And an audience feels more comfortable with it, I would imagine. Hence my disdain for Lost World. <laughs> <laughs> in lots of different ways, but still. <laughs> but yeah, there's but that great really... scene with the the truck and the, the when the glass glass cracks. is about yeah. to crack. I mean, the the Lost World is like again because like that film you compare it to the worst of what you get now from like the Jurassic World as a series is like yeah, they're not even close. <laughs> like that film's got way more redeeming qualities. Yeah. Uh, so I think well, we could talk about dances. I think it's a Dennis's Neth scene. This is a Den death. Th I think you're thinking about you're thinking about N Newman. That's all. You um, never watched Seinfeld, did you? No, no. Ah, right, yeah. <laughs> so, but I, right. I have heard it's some. Well, there's so many things I've got to watch. And, and why? Uh, why would I watch Seinfeld? All that stuff's been done before. I have recently <laughs> watched. Wait, yeah, chat doesn't even know about this. I don't. I don't know. I think Drink City's releasing it today, so people will find out. But I have seen. Star Trek The Motion Picture and Star Trek The Wrath of Khan recently. That's and right. We watched and, those movies. We did. And, and, and uh, thumbs up and thumbs down. Thumbs up for both uh, of them. Um, thumbs up for both. Yeah, dude. I'm, but, I'm more so so on the first one, uh, but I really like Khan. I think it's a much better. Understandable. Movie. Well, after understandable. discussing Khan as well with Drinker, we did an audio commentary so you guys can have access to that soon enough, I'd imagine. And it's something you can watch without the film if you really want to. It's just going to sound a little bit weirder, because obviously we're prompted by things that are happening in the movie. But we talked a lot about Wrath of Khan, and I would say that my estimation of the film actually went up after having discussed it with Drinker as well. It's uh, I very, can very it. good. There seems to be a deliberateness to the script that you notice very soon. Um, well, yeah, and yeah, talking it's... to someone who's seen it like a hundred times and is very passionate about it will help, because <laughs> you'll be like, oh yeah, I didn't think about that or this, you know? So uh, uh, again, a movie that, in context, was um, a, a very important film in terms of, I think, the genre in terms of science fiction, fantasy, horror, and IP. Um, it it meant a lot at the time when it came out because, even though motion picture made a lot of money, it cost a lot of money, and uh, the motion picture was a. Uh, 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 Wrath of Khan was made by the TV division of Paramount. It was given to Harv Bennett as yeah, a different director. Yeah. Group. Well, mm -hmm. the the production company, the 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 methodology was different. So oh, they feel like such different movies. Oh yeah. Oh, completely. I They're mean, just totally, totally different films. And um, you know, it, it it's very interesting because in terms of IP, the fact that Wrath of Khan was a sequel to a TV episode is there, there's an entire lesson about how to, to um, how, how to look at IP and translate IP to a different medium, because my God, it's amazing that wrath of Khan nowadays 
No one would have ever made that. They're like, well, wait a minute. You're, 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 are you telling me you're going to make a sequel to an episode of a failed TV show from the 60s? Hell in yeah. the 80s? <laughs> like, and you're going to bring back the same actor? To pl- What? I mean, it's astonishing that movie ever got made. When it's the budget it's got astonishing. slashed as well, right? From the first one, it went down. Yeah, I mean, is... well, uh, the the reported budget of motion picture is forty four million, but it's because that they spent the entire seventies. Um, they were going to make a movie called Star Trek: Planet of the Titans, where uh, Toshiro Mifune was going to play a Klingon warlord. That got canceled. Although, what's really interesting about that is the design of the Discovery, yes, that Discovery, was created by Ralph McQuarrie, yes, that Ralph McQuarrie, in the early 70s, pre-Star Wars. And so Planet of the Titans didn't get made. They spent a lot of money on it. And then they were going to make a Star Trek Phase Two TV show. Sets were built. Canceled. So a lot of money, so the $44 million that they say it costs the motion picture to be made really wasn't $44 million. Um, it was less, but they had to roll in all the development costs for all those other failed projects into the budget. Mm-hmm. But uh, Ratha Khan was made for basically $11 million. Cheap. So it does not feel it, cheap. What a That's fucking true. great use of eleven million dollars! Yeah, and uh, and and uh, what's interesting is that you look at it now; it made like uh, theatrically, it made like seventy-five million or something. That's a huge hit. A, a, an eleven million dollar spend, even with marketing back then. The problem is studios are now thinking we're going to spend two hundred million dollars to make a billion dollars. Why not release? 10 films that you spent 25 million or the horror films, well, 15 million dollars making, isn't that good? So, our business model is uh, everything we make is probably highlighting Bloomhouse's approach, right? Highlight, yeah, I was about to say Bloomhouse released a lot of films that are very cheap, and you only need one of them to, you know, like make 50 million dollars. Well, like look at what Scream budget. 6 made this weekend. Wait, what did it make? Oh, it did, it did really well, I think. I think it made 20 million opening day domestically. What was the budget uh, on see. that? Uh, not not a whole lot, but Scream by Nelson. So Scream made. Oh damn, that's going to be it looks like successful then. Forty three and a half million opening. Yeah. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah. And, and you said was it thirty or forty million budget? Thirty five. Thirty five. Right. So well. yeah, that'll be fine. <laughs> Meanwhile, Ant-Man. well, Scream Seven's already in production, I guess. Uh, and what's Ant? Where is Ant? Oh, I need to know. Where is Ant? <laughs> Yeah. Is Ant Man safe? Is he all right? Well, that's that's a good question. I mean, four hundred twenty-five million is where they're at right now on a budget of two hundred million dollars, oh. and it's been out for nearly a month. So it's it over. It's it dead. Yeah, that's it. And that it's uh that, well, ladies and gentlemen, with enough uh, theory crafting on exactly how much these films cost and what they get back, that is that's cost the money overall. Uh, it is very uh, likely I mean, that we're going to be reading articles soon from like Variety and stuff about how Ant Man and the Wasp: Quantumania lost money. Which yeah. the last time that a Marvel Studios film lost money is I actually don't know. <laughs> I don't think that's well, not in a non-pandemic um, environment. I non-pandemic, mean, non-pandemic. Yeah, this, I think this is actually cool. I would use the word debacle. Uh, yeah, I think it's safe to say that it's a debacle. As of December 1st, 2022, this Digital Trends article says no MCU film has ever made less than its budget. Well, oh, um, yeah, but, but you've got to factor in marketing and you have to factor in yeah, your, total I mean, box office. your total box office is not the total amount of money that gets taken home by the studios. Well, you know? I, I'm pretty th- sure th- this is a $700 million spend. Probably. I mean, people need to understand it's, it's remember, the, the, the studio only gets half of the box office. So it's even left from the worldwide gross, let's let's call it 425 is what they're saying. Mm-hmm. The studio that's half of that, that doesn't even cover the Plus production marketing. budget. This yeah. movie is, is a debacle. Half? Is that how much they uh the stu- I the think, theaters I think and stuff the take? Pretty much. I believe, pretty much. I believe domestic overall in America is usually like sixty percent on average, and I think international is maybe, typically lower. That's maybe. 
Uh, uh, but says, uh, this is this is a debacle. I mean, this is really bad. And oh, okay. you know this says uh, just while we're on topic, uh, uh, this says here in Vestipedia, a studio might make a studio might make about sixty percent of a film ticket sales in the United States, yeah, and yeah. around twenty to forty percent of that on overseas ticket sales. Oh man, Ooh, I mean, especially where. China. It depends. What so you're doing if it, yeah. if you think about that, and by the way, a lot of people never consider this. Every single movie, they they wrap in the studio overhead of their entire year into this. So whatever it costs to pay everybody that works at Disney, at least the studio, for the year gets rolled into. By the way, every budget of every film. Even though it might be sketchy, but 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 every movie's people don't understand the idea that every movie is itself a business. It's an LLC. It's a, it's its own entity that a studio acquires. Even though it's part of their, it's very the the way that studio accounting works is crazy. This film is a massive debac debacle for Disney. Yeah, and uh, it's combine really that bad. with the layoffs, combine it with their desperation for what they're going to be putting out next, Disney or at least in the coming years. The, uh, and Disney what, Plus losses, too. What Iger said and, recently. And, and this, this movie is not going to bring Disney Plus anything. No, it was... Oh, I, I don't want to sidetrack too hard Disney on Plus Disney Plus's was... insane decisions, because <laughs> that'll probably. be forever. Um, Opportunity cost is a big part of it as well. If you've got $200 million, you could have made... That two hundred million dollars could have made you more money on other projects. That's always a factor with these decisions. Could we have spent our money more effectively? Could well, we have spent it on better projects? Yeah. What I find strange about this, I mean, I, I'm a huge, I'm a huge Kevin Feige fan. I really am. I, 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 I've loved seeing the evolution of the MCU until the last uh, three or four years, Days. and I'm, per I'm perplexed by it. To be honest, whether you like it or not, the the Infinity Saga was really beautifully done. Th uh, Twenty three movies, average box office a billion dollars, well done. But but Phase Four and Phase Five, uh, from a monetary and business standpoint, I don't get it. I, I really like... don't understand what they're doing. I I I don't. And 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 not to please go. I I don't mean to interrupt. I'm sorry. No, I, I was I was just thinking this this I it just seems like there's almost a um you guys ever played Starcraft? Nope. Okay. Well, I was thinking like it, the um the way that Disney's attitude sort of is, it seems to be we've really built up this this reputation for making all kinds of fun and great, you know, superhero movies, and then they don't like learn and improve. So it's like when you like if you're playing StarCraft, the 13 year old RTS game, we've built up this base and we're doing pretty good in the early game and we're we're doing well, but then we're we're fighting harder and harder opponents as we go and we've been winning by just sort of a moving our units to the enemy base and sort of winning and now that's just not working anymore. We've built up all this stuff and we're just throwing all this money at you know these projects and they say, we're just not making the ticket sales anymore. Our, our foundation is no longer solid. We've we've grown complacent with making all this money. We have not improved as we've gone. Um, people are people are wisening up to what we're doing. Oh yeah, and part of the fascination for me is that they had warnings so early on. Do you remember Black Widow? Uh, it did so badly. Black Widow that should have been a Scarlett huge Johansson was red planning flag. on suing them. Um, and it's strictly in relation to the financial sort of aspect. And it's like, you guys understand. It's unbelievable to me that we've had what is close to the first, it's probably fair to call Ant-Man a, um, a flop in a particular definition. But I was asking Gary on uh, Real BBC, when do you believe we'll get the first flop that basically it comes under the budget, the like actual stated budget when the box office comes under that? He believes wholeheartedly Marvels. that the Marvels will be the, that's what's going to happen. And if it does... That would, uh, I, that I, would be my guess. Because who the fuck cares? <laughs> the, if uh, people don't care about Ant-Man... Who even know like, <laughs> who they are? Or what they're doing? Wow. Or so what's going to what, happen? What, something that's how, worth how, how about the mix. fact... Here's, here's what I don't get. Captain Marvel made over a billion dollars. 
a billion dollars. Now, now, whether it you like it or not, five billion, take, I think, yeah. Take Brie Larson out of it. It made a billion dollars. Uh, why would any sequel to that movie not be called Captain Marvel 2? Yeah, no, I, I, I can understand that for sure. I think uh, they were I, on like, top to of the world honest, in terms of like, I we mean, can do anything. Like, we'll instead, gonna... it's the Marvels in Captain Marvel 2. I mean, <laughs> I... And, and, and look, like Brie Larson or not, I mean, the fact is, if you're, if you top line, if you're the star of a billion dollar movie, I don't care who you are or what your representation is. If someone tells you, we're going to bring in Miss Marvel, a TV show person, and, 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 and uh, look, I love the 80s Captain Marvel. I do. Polaris, whatever you call her. We're going to bring some TV stars into your billion dollar movie. Yeah, and call it the Marvels. I'd be like, uh, I this... don't even from a business standpoint. I'm like, what? Because the they fuck? they were originally going to call it Captain Marvel two, and then they changed it, right? And I assume that's just something they're now trying to stick to, even though they must know that's a bad idea. And I will say, I, mean, I don't think wait, wait, Captain who... Marvel two makes a billion either, but. It's clearly the better choice in terms of anybody who actually cares about Captain Marvel could at least be told in the most simplistic way, this is his sequel. Look, here's the thing about Captain Marvel, and I said this on uh, when it came out. Mothers and daughters having a movie to go see is a big deal. I even said before it came out, I said this movie's going to make a billion dollars because it's about mothers and daughters. I haven't, hadn't even seen it. It made a billion dollars. And, and why, I, I am perplexed why any movie franchise that made a billion dollars, which is not something every movie franchise does, why would you change it? I'm be honest with you, dude. I think you're generous to say it's about mothers and daughters because I did a... I, I, I think no, so, I, so. I, look, I'm not, I'm not talking about the quality of the movie. I'm <laughs> talking about from a purely I don't business even... perspective. Yeah, oh, well, just... from a business perspective, I would have said it's the movie that sits it's between the Marvel thing. Infinite, Infinite... We're talking about Captain Marvel, right? It's the movie that yeah. sits between Infinity War and Endgame, and there's teasing I and know. information. That, I Any think, movie in that explains place entirely probably... why it makes money. Like, Could yep. be. I, listen, Pretty I'll much let, any give, movie give, in the MCU, give me but... 90 seconds, I'll be right back. But let, I just want to say All that, right. yes, that's true. But I would, I would also say that it is a movie. It was a movie about female empowerment, mothers and daughters. It had an audience Marvel didn't have before that also went. Just because it was become, I mean, lots of movies, Deadpool 1 and 2, they didn't make a billion dollars. I mean, it made a billion dollars. And the reason it did was because it had that extra added oomph of the, I mean, remember... We dudes who love the MCU or love Marvel, I was primed to hate that film. By the way, I've read the scripts for Secret Invasion. Let me come right back and I'll tell you about that. Oh, shit. Right. <laughs> um, I actually Googled it. Uh, it this uh, Cinema Blend article says that as far as 2019's Captain Marvel goes, apparently the audience was 55% men and 45% women. Wow. Well, is that unusual? Or... That's the thing that I need to kind of find out. I'm not certain that uh, here, there's a Statista article on viewership. Let's see. Share of consumers who have watched selected Marvel Studios superhero films in the United States as of February 2018 by gender. So... Um, it looks like da, 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 female and male. Let me turn off dark view. I think it's messing with the colors. Ah, the screen's so bright. Dark reader is one of my favorite extensions. Um, so it looks like I'm just, uh, there's a bunch of stuff here. I just want to kind of pick out. So one or more movies from the Avenger series. It looks like 38% female and 45% male. That doesn't add up to share of consumer or is this by is this percentage or by a certain number i'll have to as of 2018 around 45 percent of male respondents and 38 percent of women stated that they had seen one or more films from marvel's the avengers series the most widely viewed individual series within the marvel universe is iron man with around 48 percent of men and 41 percent of females why would they say men and females instead of men and women that's an odd way to um, 
But yeah, it looks like just and it doesn't surprise me that generally more men see the movies than women. Yeah, I would have thought. Uh, though it looks it looks as if depend different films have different um different gaps. But it looks like it's about nine, ten percent. Oh, well, this is I'm... interesting. Um so the one or uh, the percentage uh one or more movies from the Guardians of the Galaxy series, so one or two. 36% of female respondents said they'd seen it, and 41% of men said they'd seen it. So that's only a 5% gap, which is the smallest. Mm. However, 37% of female respondents and 28% of male respondents said that they had seen none of the Marvel Studios movies. Wow. So, so that is the, the only, uh, essentially the only gap that has women ahead of men in this survey is the one for not having seen any of the movies. So yeah, it looks like generally males are more likely to see these movies and females. Well, yeah, that makes sense. Um, at least to some, because part of what they've been trying to do is increase their um, sort of appeal to female audiences, right? Which is, you know, I'm not exactly someone who generates uh, genre statistics to figure out exactly what appeals more to male or female audiences to an exact science or anything, but I genuinely, I thought Captain Marvel was so shit that I don't see why it would appeal more so to. A, I didn't um, even the trailers. Like I don't remember anybody talking about how this is going to be an exciting sort of action film with an undercut of a uh, uh, mother daughter story. Because I remember the whole uh, Annette Bening character. She's not really in it that much. And then, well, like, wh what relationship would you say you're referring to with the mother daughter thing? Well, uh, here's the thing. I mean, mother-daughters in terms of who's going to the theater, not in the movie. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, uh, and, and, and here's, here's what I would say. Uh, and I said this early on before even the movie came out. I said the, the mother-daughter audience, like moms and their daughters going to the movies, they're not given a lot of action heroes or heroines, whatever you want to call it. And Captain Marvel... They really played in, like, I think it's an anomaly. Yes, it came between Infinity War and Endgame. It did. But I would be very interested to see, I, I think most, as you talked about just now, I, I think most people, mo we're, we're fucking geeks. So we are the people that are following this stuff religiously. But I think most people don't. And when a uh, mom sees it, like, like my mother doesn't know fuck all about movies. My, my mother is, 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 is the most pragmatic woman in the world. And I have to tell you, in which she's 83 now. When she was 70 years old, I took her to see Avatar in IMAX 3D. She'd never seen an IMAX movie, and she saw a 3D movie in like the 50s. <laughs> And my mother is was the, she's she raised an uh, imagination connoisseur and 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 was a great mom, but my mother had no imagination. She was incredibly like, uh, what's going on right now? It, 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 if I was making uh, a, a cookies, she'd want to know, did you use enough flour? I'm like, I don't know, mom. You know, she was that woman. She won. <laughs> so when I when I went and saw Avatar with her, when it was over. Um, in 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 what two thousand nine, my mother looked at me with eyes as wide as saucers. I mean, my God, I saw wonder in my mother's eyes for the first time in my life. And she looked at me and she said, "Because uh, she calls me Bobby," she said, "Bobby, how did they do that?" Uh. And and I I I you know for the first time. And to be fair, my mother. As a kid, the first time she said, I need, she took me to see Logan's Run in 1976. Oh, that I mean, movie sucks. I was Aww. fucking nine. Dude, come on. That movie's <laughs> no, that fucking movie's awesome. Bad. How can you say nope, that? That come movie's on. bad. That's a bad no. movie. No. I can appreciate no. it, but that is a bad movie. The plot. No, no you're, you're a young kid. Come on. You're looking nope, back. I saw, nope. I'm not looking back. Well, you well, I mean, everything that I, all of my everything in my memories, I'm looking back. But yeah, I saw it not too long ago. It's bad. But you know no. that's controversial, no. though, right, Rags? Okay, it shouldn't I'm, be. If I I'm made a video gonna... talking about the plot issues and the character issues with that, that is a. Oh bad my god! Film. Oh my god! Okay, you you have to put things in historical context when they came out. 
So Logan's Run was based on a novel by George Clayton Johnson and William F. Nolan. It was born out of the 60s. Maybe the novel's better. Well, the novel is about people that died at 21. That's that and uh, it, it, it was could, all about it people who never mm-hmm. trust anyone over 30. There's a whole so that movie when it came out, it won an Academy Award for visual effects. Just saying, and it was mind blowing. I saw it in a gigantic theater, uh, the John Dan's Theater in, in in Bellevue, Washington. My mother took me and my sister. She was seven. I was nine. It was astonishing. Because no one had ever seen anything like that before. And and there there was nothing like you have to remember that when things came out, and I'm not I'm not saying this should be given a pass, but when Logan's run came out, it was a big gigantic MGM release. It was a big deal. And and now we look at it, and I don't disagree with you. It might not be a great movie. But at the time, and and this is what I feel that that I feel that historical context is being lost in all, all of our discussions because everyone's looking at things like right now, and and it's so weird. Like like people go back and judge things. These special effects are terrible, and I'm like, but guys, when the movie came out, there were no better special effects. Logan's Run won the Academy Award for visual effects. A year later, Star Wars came out. And I get it, right? And here's the thing. I I agree with you. Logan's Run, not a good film. Whoa, that changed dramatically over the past five minutes. No, no, I'll I'll take it. it, 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 it's, it's, It's not a good movie. Damn, okay. But I love it. I love it. It changed my There's life. There's things to was, like about it. Absolutely. I, I, Man, that, but, that chick but, in the green dress. Mm. Oh, oh, well, well, okay. When she dropped Trow in the ice cave, I mean, there are so many things. But I would say this. I would say this. You have to remember, and it's, it's very interesting now, I would implore everybody. You ha- and I have to say, Dave Cullen has been doing a really great series of reviews of 70s dystopian films. Colossus the Forbin Project, Rollerball. Uh, he's, he's done a very good job of contextualizing and looking at these films. It's really difficult to look at movies like Logan's Run without taking their historical context into consideration. And the fact that the guys who wrote that movie, George Clayton Johnson, wrote original Twilight Zone episodes, wrote Star Trek episodes or a Star Trek episode. I mean, and, and so there's a whole historical context. And when sure. you look at um, Logan's Run and go, dude, you're right. It's it's not good. <laughs> but I, my nine-year-old self, that movie changed my life. I mean, it was crazy. And then... A year later, I got Star Wars. And my nine-year-old self was, it made me go out and buy the novel. And I then think Logan's Run was probably one of the last... Um, I, I'm not super familiar, but I feel like Logan's Run was kind of like um, Jadage in a way, where it was like the last of that kind of science fiction. And then Star Did Wars Did you know happened. that they made a TV series? Of... For Logan's Run? Logan's Run. It's... I did not know. No, I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, yes. Wait, how... Yeah, what, the way... what, what year was that? God Awful. The year of God it Awful. That's uh, 1977. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, okay, like the movie. It was the same year. Oh, that was later. a year later. And yeah. it was terrible. Now, here's the thing about Logan's Run. It was based on a counterculture novel in the, I want to say, 67? 60s, yeah. Logan's Run was not based. It was cringe. <laughs> well, well, I know. But, but, but <laughs> in the, the, novel, the novel is very different than the film that was made. And the original uh, writer who wrote the first script was Richard Maybaum, who wrote a lot of James Bond films. And um, it's, it's a very interesting, I mean, I would say that here's the thing. There's a historical context to all of genre uh, of fiction, movies, whatever. Sure. And I think, I think it's important to consider um, it's important to consider where these things came from. And when a studio buys a script, I'll give you an example. Like right now, 
uh, 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 for my life, a speed racer. I did coverage, which means I had to read a script and 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 uh, write. Here's what happens. This is crazy. So when a studio or a, an agency gets a screenplay, they have to have what's called coverage, and coverage is a three-page document where you synopsize the script. You know, you have to write exactly what happens in it, and then you write comment. So you have the, the the title page, a synopsis, and then your recommendations. I read professionally 3,000 screenplays in my life for various agencies and, and production entities. Wow. I said, I said yes. You're never supposed to say yes. I read 3,000 screenplays. I said yes to one. The only screenplay that I said yes to was Andrew Andy, Andrew Kevin Walker's script for Seven ah. that David Fincher made. I said yes to this. He was a clerk at Tower Records, and there was a, there was a particular a guy named Gavin Pallone, and he worked at an agency called Bauer Benedict that later became UTA. And and everything he sent, I worked for Joel Silver, who made Lethal Weapon and Die Hard and all Predator and all that. I worked for him. I was a reader for him. And um, there was two of us, two two professional readers that read scripts for him. And um, when I got that script, I, I asked to get everything that came from him because he had great taste. Everything he sent, not a, not all of it should have been made, but it was at least good. When I read Seven, I was like, oh, I'm like, this is the greatest script, like, fucking ever. It was so good. The guy, Andy Kevin Walker, was a clerk at Tower Records in New York City. That said, Logan's Run, to, to tie it in, the first draft script, the novel, was great. And then it took them years, years, seven they they said you can't make this movie where where Gwyneth Paltrow's heads in a box. You can't do it. And and they tried for years. They're like we can't do it. We can't do this. Wait, wait, you can't make this movie because you can't kill the hero's wife. And David Fincher said, "Oh yes, we can. That's why I want to make this movie. I'm not going to make this movie if I can't kill and put a head Gwyneth in a box." Paltrow. Yeah. Oh, I mean, that's it's one of those wanna... memorable elements of the film, funnily enough. Uh, going yeah. Forward. Every reference I, 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 that. I, 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 and that's the thing. No one will. I mean, there's an MTV. Shatner. What's in the box? I mean, and here's the funny thing. The fact that Logan's Run got made finally. The, the, I actually have the original Richard Baybaum script where there's an apology where they have to explain before you read the script um, this is a, uh, uh, it's, it's a thing about youth revolting against the, uh, adults. And it's crazy that that movie even got made. Now, here's the thing. Nowadays, you go back and you look at it. I agree with you. It's not a good movie. It's not. But you have to look at it in its historical context. It was and understand. never good. Enough. Okay, I okay. haven't seen Logan's Run, at least not in the sense that I'm familiar with it, so I can't talk oh, about can't. this. We'll watch but, it, Butler. Uh, we'll watch it someday. But, but, but here's the thing: you can't, you, you can't say it. You can't, run. but you can't say that it wasn't ever good because I when I saw it, it changed <laughs> my life. No, no, I get, I get, I change your life. I get it. Yeah, okay. dude, the prequels I, changed a lot of people's <laughs> lives. It's kind of like the terrible. I understand. I understand. But, 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 in 1976. When that movie opened at the John Dance Theater, now here's, here's I'll tell you something else. So it was on a double bill because they showed two movies. The second film was a animated sci-fi film that I dearly love called Fantastic Planet. Ah, Fantastic uh, Planet. That, yeah, which I, so uh, my mom sat through Logan's Run, liked it. And then Fantastic Planet started. And if you've ever watched it, my mother, first time, 
only time, manhandled me. She grabbed my wrist and she said, I am not going to sit here and watch a movie where human beings are treated like ants. And if you know Fantastic Plant, you know that. But she dragged me up and my seven-year-old sister didn't know what to do. She followed me and my mom out. And it took me three years later, 79, to see. I went to a double feature of Wizards and Fantastic Planet. Oh, the Ralph Bakshi Wizards? Yeah. The, yeah, it's a trip. Yeah, uh, yeah. and and uh, so anyway, Logan's Run at the time was a big deal for science fiction, fantasy, and horror fans because there was no movie that was that huge, that gigantic on those big screens. Now we look at it. I agree with you. It's not good, but but at the time it was mind blowing. And oh, I yeah, always things think can be that, amazing. I think it's going to be mind blowing and memorable. But but historical context needs to be you. You, you always have to take into consideration the historical con- context, especially because uh, the 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 seventies were were filled with dystopian sci fi cinema. Boy and his dog, Rollerball. Oh, I Soil hate that Green. fucking movie so much. <laughs> Which oh, one? my dad showed me the Boy and his dog. My dad's like, oh, you should watch this. You should watch this. And I watched it, and maybe one my least favorite movie of all time. Oh my god, I hate. Nice that way movie. to put that you hated it. I guess least well, favorite. Well, but 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 here's the thing: in 1975, when that movie came out, based on a Harlan Ellison short story, you know, starring Don Johnson, um, uh, that film, it 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 meant something at the time it came out. And and I I do think you cannot disassociate uh, the historical uh, uh, call it the zeitgeist of the time. You have to consider the zeitgeist. Why did that movie get made at that time? Because someone was smoking something. There were toxic fumes leaking into okay. the, the room. Which that they were to, in. But, but that's the easy the way part. out. I mean, well, when you I, make a I movie. If we if we would actually time. bridge the gap, I like ultimately the conversation is it's two different conversations. You can respect where it comes from and the work that went into it and how it was relevant and groundbreaking at the time, and then you can also yes. have a perspective on it about like what you think of its quality. That's basically uh, 100%. Yes. Which these I'm are, sure we, yeah, we, we all agree different with. Different things, yes. We all and totally and, that, and so. I would say yeah. this: I mean, I mean, Logan's Run came out in 1976. We're we're the better part of half a century on, so it's not it's not. Uh, absolutely, you should look back at it from this perspective and judge it on its own merits, hundred percent. And I, I, I do think all literature and all cinema uh, stands to be judged from the perspective you're at right now. However, I also think that while you're judging it, it just needs to have a historical perspective. Uh, considered at the same time. Well, it's part no, of what, yeah, I, we, uh, we know all about that. A lot yeah, of praise the, um, that I levy for Jurassic Park is the fact that it was made in 93, or at least the adding yeah. that context in, because that is some, I mean, oftentimes more impressive because it's like, damn, it feels like everything they're achieving in this would have been made easier by making it today. The irony, of course, being that you don't see anything like this today. Uh, nobody's. No, and I, I would say that, that Jurassic Park is, you know, a masterpiece. Yeah, and I it transcends so. the time in which it was made because it well, doesn't. It, and so on that note, right, like we celebrate it for the fact that it was made in 93. And yet if it came out today, it would be glorious in the same way that if something that we consider to be of lower quality today, it doesn't get away with it, so to speak, if it came out at a time where everything was lower quality and thus, because uh, this is the thing, a lot of things can age incredibly well alongside stuff that people will try to forgive because of its time mm. well, like, um, uh, yeah because um well I've it's funny i mean film that's aged incredibly well in terms of its like storytelling vocabulary that film feels incredibly modern uh meanwhile there are other films that are just going to be difficult for like a modern audience to get into from that time period just because of the mismatch in 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 that whereas i guess you look at something like jurassic park part of what's so exceptional about it is that it really does feel like it has a timeless quality. 30 years later, it feels like it came out today. Oh, um, I, I, we, I need totally to see, agree. Um, we need to see Casablanca sometimes, because that's, a, I, that's yes, from 1942. I, I will, I will happily 41. watch that one with you. 
Yeah, uh, and that is a, a that's a film that has really it, it's it seems very modern in a lot of ways. Uh, oh my god, I oh, I Citizen recently Kane's rewatched another good it. example. You're absolutely right. Those movies are timeless, but they but they are uh, movies that take place in the time they were made. So I mean, they, yeah, they're 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 contemporary uh, uh, movies. Yeah, um, but but their stories hold up and the characters hold up. It's all hundred percent, hundred percent. Both quite but, good. Mahler, I have to say, I, I feel a little embarrassed that I've tried to defend Logan's run. If, what? Why? <laughs> you should be! Oh, 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 nah, only because you better. you gentlemen, I, I respect all of you, and um, uh, I'm defending a movie that isn't good. This dude, Sean, I, 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 I don't really have an opinion on it. Yeah, it depends on what you defend about, about it. There's things, things about that it. I like about it, but yeah, and this. Um, well, I, I, look, I would say, I would say to, to to. Here's the thing: when you asked me to come on this stream, one of the things that appealed to me is that I've watched your dissections of the trilogy, the the, the sequel or the prequel trilogy, and for hours, and I'm like, this guy gets it, man. Like he understands, and it's not it's not a malicious takedown. It's more of a why isn't this better? <laughs> like it's a description. you want you you want the prequel trilogy to be great. Like you want it to be great. That's what your entire all of these things are about. You love great stories, and you understand why great stories are great. And you want the prequel trilogy to be great. When I watch your, for hours, how many hours collectively, like between Phantom Menace, Attack of the Clones, and Revenge of the Sith, how many hours is that? Seven, 72? I don't know. Something like that. Do you know what? Probably. All of those, all of those videos you make, they are all about storytelling verisimilitude it's all about tell me a great story and you love <laughs> the only reason you made them is because you love star wars it's like well yeah i love i love those videos you made and i, I you should be being paid by oxford to teach a class on 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 storytelling i mean well, you really should because those are a master class in breaking down how to tell a story cinematically. Um, and, oh, go ahead. Well, so, uh, <laughs> the, the, cause we've got lots of coverage funny enough on EFAP for prequels. Uh, the sequels, I think we, I don't even know how to count that. Um, but the, yeah, the, the all, all, all of it comes from loving of the franchise. The reason we don't cover Star Trek here is anywhere near as much in terms of its downfall is, I've got no familiarity with the original stuff. Like, we don't just go after anything that's bad. It's usually from a place of loving us uh, I, where it came from. I've I've never thought you've done that. No, I've I, I, I'm just saying. I, um, I, I've always thought that, that your work came from love. Yeah, you know? I, 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 and I, I, I mean, I love movies. Uh, well, stories. I know, I and, and when you asked me to come on the show, I'm like, really? Mahler wants me to go on a show. I'm hey, like, we've been oh on shows God. before. It's always been fun. I, I know, but not your show. You know, and and and, and it was, it, dude, your work. I mean, I know I always say this, but your analysis is incredibly valuable, and I would say that anybody who's who's working in an IP should watch your videos. Whether you agree with them or not, uh, your analysis is incredibly useful and and very insightful. And you you know, politically, whatever you, if you don't believe in it, fine. But your breakdown is so well articulated; it will help anyone. And by God, does IP the people that the 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 corporations hire to manage their IP is so wrong. And and what's funny is Jurassic Park was directed by a master, Spielberg, and then it became an IP. And 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 even this IP, the 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 if you look at what happened to it, and the problem is, uh, well, if you look at money, perhaps Jurassic Park Dominion might prove that it's important. 
to have people that understand a franchise to manage that franchise. But either way, your videos, the stuff you've done, might help the next generation understand how to tell a great story. Oh, I'm hoping everybody in our sort of spheres I believe that. can inspire people in any way, shape, or form to bring storytelling in some some upward trajectory. The idea that uh, we can have that level of an effect would be incredibly wonderful, honestly. Um, because well, I think I you have that. Movies. Um, well, and uh, seriously, I appreciate you uh, <laughs> giving me all these incredible compliments. They're uh, they're very kind Dude, of you. It, you know what? Here's the thing: it's not a compliment. You earned it. You did like. I'm just a bloke watching your videos. Your analysis of story is unbelievable. And uh, I think everyone who wants to understand how IP should be, I, I really believe that. And um, your your work, the same way, I mean, you know, not to equate you guys, but Red Letter Media. I didn't know those guys. I watched their Generations, Star Trek Generations, a movie I fucking hated. And they did such a great takedown of it, and I became fans of them because I realized, oh, they really get Star Trek. They really understand the IP. Just like your take... Oh, I wouldn't say they were takedowns. They were... They were... Um, Post-mortems. Oh, the critiques, post yes. The rage videos, I'd say. Uh, they're like they're, they're takedowns, but, uh, <laughs> um, and uh, But they come from a place of love. Well, and you know what? On that note, Perhaps we should get back to loving Jurassic Park. I reckon. I, by the way, should. I have to go. I'm like, I'm, I, I've been getting buzzed. I didn't even realize. I had it. a feeling you. Uh, so some people. You know, we, <laughs> I, I, I apologize. I, I apologize. And, and no, that's and fine. Absolutely okay, man. No worries. Um, thank you all for having me. All of our I'm guests. like, uh, my ladies go. She's like, where are you? <laughs> <laughs> hey, dude, uh, listen, wow. you've been here for a good five hours, almost five and a half, so don't you worry about it. We shall we shall bring it home if you need to, uh, if you need to head out. Gentlemen, I, 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 it, it was such an honor to stream with all three of you, and uh, thank you so much for Absolutely. having me here. I mean, I, I love this. 100%. And uh, uh, it's so great. And Mahler, your videos, my God, uh, what a what a privilege to speak with you, because I really do love the work you've done and i can't imagine how long it took you to do that work uh astonishing well, like i said man it I, really I, is it's something else smaller that I, is I, incredible i, I appreciate cool. the compliments heavily i've had more today than i ever get usually <laughs> because, uh, on, people dude, like you must I mean, be look, blushing it's like no, it's just, no, no not at all. um oh. But hey, man, I very much appreciate your work too, and we will see each other again soon enough on the internet, I am sure. Absolutely, and 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 seriously, man, it, it's a great honor, all three of you guys, and I, you know, this is why this is what I love about the internet. You know why? Because Mahler, your work makes me think about my views. You know, and 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 I, 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 on my whole channel, it's like every person has a story to tell. All you have to do is listen, and and your analysis made me th rethink what I thought. And mm. isn't that great? Yeah, isn't that what's really what, something? Yeah, yeah, Mahler. Yeah, man. And isn't that what the world's all about? Like, I once heard somebody say, "You should never think you know something." Because if you know something, you stop thinking about it. And you should always allow yourself to open up what you think you know mm -hmm. and allow other ideas to come inside. And Absolutely. Humans my are. God, do your videos My God, Mahler. That. That's true. My God, He's Mahler. Right, Mahler. My God. He's right. He's right, Mahler. 100%. Well, as I said, Gentlemen, thank you so much for coming on. And uh, we'll see you again sometime, I'm sure. Thank you. This is amazing. Absolutely. Hey, catch you later, dude. Yeah. We will see you later. I I I can't I I thank you so much. I mean, honestly. No, thanks for being here and being right, here I'm... for so long. Oh my god. Are you kidding? It was the best. Oh, yeah. You guys are the best. I mean, By the way, surreal. we we need to do a Logan's Run stream. <laughs> uh, uh, I, uh, now 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 I'm going to have to go watch it again. Well, wait, don't watch it yet. We can we can wrangle Mahler into it and Fringy, and they can they can marvel at the film production that is Logan's Run. All okay. Right.
I love that you you tempered that. That's uh, I appreciate that. But we should because it's very interesting. That was the last big budget studio sci fi film before Star Wars, and we could talk about it in that way. Very <laughs> yeah, well. it would be very interesting. I, I, I understand. Film. It's not great. It's not great. <laughs> Anyway, gentlemen, I salute all three of you. Doodle Pip Zergeria. Hey, dude. There he goes. <laughs> Off he you goes motherfucker. The great, <laughs> the great wild yonder. There he goes. Repeating it over and over again. I, uh... A crusader. <laughs> hey, you know what? I have to bounce it out and say I love the work you two do, okay? I fucking find it insightful. Yes, you see, but it fun. pales in, to, in comparison to the incredible monumental work that you Mahler do you have inspired us both Fringy, myself and so many others are you uh you feeling all right you good you good no i'm good <laughs> Excellent. What, what do you mean what's that what was unusual about that nothing at all i appreciate you, you know? the incredible i'm just expressing my undying mind. praise for you and everything that you do and the inspiration that it causes and you know i just want to let you know that how I, I like that you finally you let me know work. this. It's uh, and I appreciate Fringy. I assume you like my work too, right? Or... Uh, I mean, I'm a fan. I mean, it's obviously influenced in some part, an aspect of the way that I'm making stuff. That was, um, that was like an, an intro to be as sarcastic as you want. It sounds like you're going serious. <laughs> I can't tell anymore. I don't well, know what's yeah, happening I mean, anymore. Fringy is yeah. what we call well, I mean, sober. You get inspiration from uh, from all sorts of places when it comes to like creating stuff. And I guess the interesting thing is looking at um. It's, it seems like people are a lot more reticent about uh, inspiration in terms of, like, YouTube compared to what you would typically see with people talking about, like, film or television or yeah, yeah. novels, right? Where people kind of wear those inspirations on their sleeves. Um, but I'm I mean, glad that people are like, willing to say they're inspired by YouTube content. Like, I don't want that to be uh, a taboo a good, thing to say. Good, it's a good thing because I, if there's one thing that I would like to see more, it's that people take making stuff for youtube seriously rather than oh it's just dumb youtube videos like maybe they're dumb for you but like a lot of people put a lot of work into uh into making videos um a lot of people just don't know what goes into it they they just have no idea they take it for granted right, they don't know the work that goes into making and just edits well and I, I think uh the problem is that when it comes to basically any film that makes it to theaters everybody's working hard on that um, more or less. Whereas when it comes to YouTube videos, a lot of it's just shit. <laughs> like, it's just, you know, and, and partially because you can basically throw up whatever you want. So it can be like low editing, no scripting, which that doesn't necessarily make it good or bad either, by the way. Um, it's just that barrier to entry is non-existent on YouTube with everything that comes with it. Um, yep. yeah. Better and worse. Well, and I just want it said, um, we do try with uh, guests on EFAB to personalize them, and I had the full intention of listening to a lot of Robert Meyer Burnett talking about everything to do with film and his experiences, um, and plenty, like, like was, was gained to that in terms of me just listening to all kinds of things that we would get into. I never expected we'd talk about... Um, what was that? Aperture, Logan's point Run. of view, fields, uh... Focal length? Yeah, all the creations of different I shows and movies. I don't know much about, uh, cameras, I will say. Um, Look, if ever there was a podcast to explore in length whatever you'd like to, mm -hmm. tangential as it may or may not be, this is the one. Oh, we do I not discourage so. it. Well, and, uh, yeah, uh, I think... <laughs> you're passionate about, go I think for it. think he was talk about either it. tipsy or full on drug. I couldn't quite tell, but, uh... He was drunk passion if anybody's ever seen shows that he and i are on they don't run that way usually i think he was uh he was <laughs> a little he's had a little bit of the sauce and made for some uh very interesting topics and rants and stuff that i like i said i i'm a big fan of of robert as a as a person he's like one of the most sincere people you'll ever meet online mm -hmm. and uh i really love that uh, you know as of recently he put his uh integrity on the line to defend what he thought was strong work right in the form of picard season three and it seems like people are coming around on the show, so it's uh, kind of cool. Obviously, I just don't have an investment in Star Trek, so I can't say too much to it. In but the same way that do I don't have an investment in Logan's you, Run. <laughs> are you, well, I've never... The only thing I know about Logan's Run is the parody that they did in Family Guy. Uh, yeah, yeah. That, that thing, right, with the gem in the hand, like, and Brian was running around and getting chased. Oh, to, like, yeah. To, like, city. With the real, if you watch Family Guy, you end up just getting laden with a lot of references from the '80s and '70s, anyway, of media. Yeah, very referential. Killed That's good though. Mm -hmm. Well, like the thing. thing, the thing is, when you look at a lot of uh, '90s Simpsons episodes, 
well, really, it's all the Simpsons, but like, there's yeah. so many references, but they're a lot more carefully crafted. Like, one of my favorites, obviously, is the uh, the Terminator 2 parody with uh, Homer with Flanders. Nanny! <laughs> you know, like a punt down at the night, Nanny! <laughs> and then he starts chasing after yeah, him yeah. with a blanket. <laughs> Lunges himself on it instead of like the T-1000's claws, it's the, the golf club slamming into the car. It's There's a lot Slamming of into the car. I was like, all right. I, th I thought I said slamming into the car. Sorry, is I'm... that like an problem? It's, it's it's kind of ruined the entire stream. The difference between sliming and slamming. I can't I can't take it. But it's it's interesting. Like with Jurassic Park, how when you like watch the film again and you just you just remember so many of the things that this film did that are just persistently referenced, both in ways that are obviously more overt nods to it and borrowing or uh leveraging some of the things that, like the vibrating water right that's that's become a thing in so many movies at this point of like if you focus in on water vibrating because of you know loud thuds and everything on the ground mm -hmm. um well i mean general, i was gonna say uh, we well. will now continue talking about jurassic yeah. park well likely mm -hmm. what we got next in the oh, actual... the t-rex yeah and it's um as it's fucking around with uh Grant and the and the kid it's, it pushes them off the side into that pit I was talking about, which, like I said, logistically speaking, not sure if it's supposed to be there or not. Need to check, but uh, you know it makes. I didn't it, even register that first time. Like when I, hmm. it's particularly this shot that makes you think, like, wait a minute, like, yeah, huh, like how far does this pit go? And it's like I don't see how the T Rex got up. How did how did this? Because even it's... from this angle, the fact that it levels out to the same level, like a little bit further on, it's like man, that's gonna be a steep sort of drop in it. You wonder if there's uh... like a hill, like <laughs> like a yeah. very steep hill, I guess. <laughs> yeah, a hill to the left, someplace where it can. I don't know. It's it's a little bit confusing. Yeah, yeah like I said, I have to look into it, but. Yeah. yeah, they start rappelling down on one of the broken wires, and uh, the kid is uh, still in the car, and he's going to end up in the oh, tree, because yeah. the T-Rex is just continuously pushing it, I guess, looking for a, a chance at his food. It's hyper-stressful, isn't it, because it's so much that Grant just cannot account for. No. Like, all of this crazy stuff, and he's on his own having to deal with it, and how can he? It's a T-Rex. Well, that's the thing. Two of the adults are knocked out so quickly, like, one's eaten, one's... Uh, well, knocked out. Yeah. And, uh, and he's all on his lonesome. Yeah, at this point, it's a disaster. And, uh, you know, it's only going to get worse. But something I quite like is uh, uh, Hammond being like, Robert, I wonder if perhaps you could take one of the gas jeeps and bring back my grandchildren. It's such a, like, strong and stern way of what is actually happening subtextually, which is, good God, please save my children. Yeah. Like, like my grandchildren. And, and uh, Muldoon is just like, yeah. Because yeah, yeah, yeah of he, course. he jumps right in. Yeah, of course I'm the one that's going to do that. that. That makes the most sense. Yeah, uh, none of these characters are just the asshole that we can see die later that I think a lot of other films would do. It's like, oh, this guy's just the jerk. We can have him get eaten and people will like Oh, by that. the way, how, how refreshing is it of a character saying, I'm going with you, and they're not like, no, you're staying here. And they're like, no, I'm uh, going. I can do this all no, on my I'm own. I'm doing that. It's just, it's just you, you accept, yeah, like, I am coming with you. It's like, yep, all right, let's go. She's probably like, yeah, please come <laughs> with me. I'm actually kind of fucking terrifying. Um, it would be nice to have you come with me. It's downright refreshing to have that, which is funny, considering that a lot of films afterward are doing that bullshit of like, no, you're staying here, all right? Well, that's um. There was another line that prompted me to say something very similar. It was uh, later on when the it, it was in this room when um uh Sam Neill and Laura Dern I, f I forget their character names escape me uh but they're Ellie. at the door the Velociraptor is trying to push in the door and the shotgun has fallen down and uh, uh Ellie she says uh, frantically as they're trying to keep the door shut I can't get basically she says I can't get the shotgun without leaving the door. And yeah, I'm like, yeah, yeah, it makes sense that you'd yell that to him because he might not necessarily know that. And it's a frantic, panicking situation. And you just want to make that really clear to him so that he understands what's happening in this frantic well, moment. Something that, because uh, because it happens with the um, the car, which comes right, shortly it's a after rifle. No, wait, 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 wait. No, no, it is not a rifle. It's a Spaz-12 uh, Spaz shotgun. 12, yeah. It's a classic Italian model. Um, it's not a rifle. What I was going to say was uh, something that, like, you look at a lot of the really stressful situations that occur in the film, 
uh, especially parts where it's like real close. You know how films like to cut it real close in terms of uh, big dramatic moments and often how frustrating it is when characters are saved by an inconvenience. This film has a lot of instances that are inconvenient for the characters in terms of timing and what's happening and where situations get worse because of very understandable, honest mistakes. Like, um, like when, when, uh, with the car, when, uh, uh, Grant, like, accidentally, like, when he moves the steering wheel and then it redirects the tire to where yeah. it loosens its grip on the, uh, on the tree. It's like a yeah, nice, it's understandable well, it's they knew, that causes drama. Presumably they knew when filming it. It's like, it's going to be annoying if we just have him take the kid out of the car and then for some reason the, the car it. falls yeah. when the, there's yeah. less weight. It's like, no, if we can find a way to make this, make something happen. And I, yeah, I appreciate the fact that he just instinctually grabs onto a thing that's there, which is the wheel, and then it turns. And he's like, "Oh fuck!" And then those wheels turning fucks up its leverage on the on the tree branches. Which is good stuff. Yeah, branch drama, and it's 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 not some bullshit. Like it's a really honest sort of error, um, as opposed to characters being stupid. Because nobody in this film is is dumb, right? People are making the best decisions they can in difficult situations. I find to be a lot of understandable, right? Because we're about to talk about. De Dennis's death scene. And, uh, uh, yeah. The one thing I said this while watching Iraq, the one thing I never fully understood in this movie is the slip sound effect he has. It goes Wheat! like he, yeah, we noticed that. It's cartoony. That so weird. Um, of all the things, you know, you just <laughs> like because there's there's not many of them I, in the film at all. There's just this one. I wish the audience is. could hear it. It's it's yeah. The, oh, I can play like it. Yeah. Legitimately, like a slapstick. Whoop! <laughs> when he slips, that's so bizarre. It stands out from an otherwise very serious film. Yeah, I'll try and get it up. And oh, here we go. Okay. Hopefully this comes out. <laughs> it's actually kind of quiet, but you can hear it. The whee! Like, um, <laughs> definitely a cartoon sort of thing. Hearing it again. Is it an Easter egg? <laughs> I, I, I'm really not sure. I don't think it's an Easter Maybe it was used. Yeah, maybe it's in another... Steven Spielberg movie, and this was the time. It's just hearing it again. It's like, what are you doing in this film? I've seen two people say that's the cable. No. Would well, a cable no. make that sound? No. May, like, maybe it gets pulled back in? Are you is it, Are you sure? Well, when I, it gets yanked out, right? Because that's what he's doing. He's holding onto it. Hmm. Like, as it's getting, at, like, rewound, it's making that noise? I don't understand. Like, I, I always thought it was... Uh... Not in universe, Just you know. A, oh, right, like a non diegetic sound. I didn't think it was. Hmm. I mean, I guess it could be because someone else is saying it's it's the Dilophosaurus, right? Like in the background, it's like I don't know about that either. I don't so, think it would be that. It's always come across to me as just to be like, oh, there he goes. <laughs> there he goes, tumbling down the hill. Yeah, because if it was the. If it was the wire, then the re-winching sound wouldn't happen until after, like, he lets go or something. But he has it here in his hands, doesn't he? So well, that's extended, what I'm saying. Maybe anything. it was the sound of him holding onto it as he fell. But then I well, if he lets go, is it drawing back in? I think in it's and a that's slapstick kind of slip sound. That's what it seems uh, to me. I, I just don't... That doesn't feel quite right well, as the cable sound. I don't know. Yeah, I get you. Very quick, too. It's not like a... It's a... Right, right, right. I need to, I'll Google what the sound actually was. I'll, I'll look up the sound guy and he can tell me what it really was. Like, if it was like a chihuahua passing gas or something and he put it in the film. This very specific thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, if I suppose if it was supposed to be the cable, then fair enough, but I've always thought it was like a cartoon slip sound. Someone said it was foreshadowing for his part in Space Jam. Oh, oh yeah, yeah he's Space, space Jam would come after this. He was, yes. He, he gets was. flattened mm. in that and then reinflated. Yeah, <laughs> it's a very normal movie. We should check it out sometime when you found movies. Um, <laughs> uh, are you gonna make us watch the remake? Uh, the, sequel, the sequel. Yeah. yeah, the requel maybe. Well, of uh, but course. yes, of if course. We watch one, I'm gonna watch okay. the other. All right. Uh, so we got us uh, him him gradually working to get his uh, car free of the wreckage of this. The Lophosaurus just playing with its food for a while, seemingly. Or uh, trying to assess its potential danger, obviously, because it wouldn't yeah, know what to it's do. Yeah, like sizing it up. Like, I don't know, like, you're a big, strange-looking creature. Mm -hmm. You know, you're brightly colored. You are not really afraid of me, but I can't quite tell. Yeah, it's, it's just, it's like, it's like the dog in The Last of Us, you know? 
What makes it's you like, wonder if you he don't know what he's thinking? If he took the jacket off and like waved it around in front of him, maybe it would scare it off. I don't know, but uh, he doesn't take it seriously. He he's like, it'll be. I don't have any food. I got nothing on me. Leave me alone, sort of thing. Um. Even tries to play fetch with it, which I think is very much a signal that he's underesting it, main it significantly. Um, because yeah, it's uh, this scene goes a little scary, a little fast. The uh, the whole like yeah, the 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 visual of it like spreading its um, I don't even know what body part thing they're called, but uh, pretty creepy. And then yeah, he gets Next flap fingers. <laughs> gets hit enough with this yeah. stuff, and earlier they did say it can uh, blind and paralyze. So, um, yeah, making his way into the car is uh, the Dilophosaurus is already in there before he gets in as well. So it just eats him in the car, presumably. And I just love the shot where it pans down. Uh, yep. We see the Barbasol can just getting buried by mud. All of that. All of that scientific progress, all of that engineering, all of that technology and human innovation, and ultimately it's just back in the mud. Oh, it's Never to be seen again. Back right? to the dirt. Well, that's the thing. It, uh, I can't even remember which movie it's in. It's one of the sequels The Barbasol Can pops up. Um, the same for the, you know, the cane or whatever iconic thing that they like from... Uh, these movies, they can reference them either visually or in, in just like, it's that thing we've talked about it before, but Star Wars does it a hell of a lot. It's whatever the fans kind of like, suddenly it gets transposed into the universe in its sequels. It's kind of like, well, that doesn't make any sense at all. Why would you, why, why, why would you have it that way? Like, why would and, and, and a lot of these universes they like, almost treat the events of the movie as instead of a disaster as like this cool thing that happened because movie like it's a complete inconsistency that's frustrating but anyway maybe they could they could have had a sequel where the the embryos they fuse with the mud and become dinosaur mud monsters like the sandman and spider-man 3 yeah that would have been really really awesome and cool they destroy human civilization yeah, they gradually realize that the the because I'm sort of we're able to skip a, a couple of things. We've talked about some of these things, but the the wheel, the turning, the breaching of the branches, and the they've literally got like a this this something to be drawn out of this, right? Like a car crashing through a tree that's potentially going to kill them. It's like the yeah. tree is the only thing separating them from death right now. Kind of interesting. Yeah. I yeah, they're so. climbing down. Through I mean, these the, are just cool. Yeah. Uh, they're cool set pieces, really. They're just like really tension filled, uh, and then they ratchet up dramatically at points. Like it's um, this film knows how to sort of build up that tension in any given scene, and then you know bring it to a really satisfying shot. payoff. I hmm, yeah, I'm I not sure it. actually. Yeah. Um, because know. well, first up to to what you were saying, right? It's like a lot of the uh suspense and tension and uh, conflict in this movie it's very small scale and believable it's a guy and a boy and they're trying to you're just climbing away from a car you know and it's a fairly extended sequence it's not super fast um there you have a lot of time to build up tension um you have a lot of time to sort of just be aware of what's happening it's not like part f three in a series of 10 crazy wacky things that are just that are just total madness and it just keeps going and going and going and going you just have you just have time to breathe in this movie and there, there's this you know the, the, this kind of dread in the air of what you know bad things can happen speaking of next scene we have ellie and muldoon have reached this main area where it's broken out and they managed to find malcolm who I thought it was interesting that she notes about him that he's put a tunicate on his leg like with his own belt Yep. And, and he's just gone back to just lying there, I think, which is... Uh... So I'd do. I wouldn't move a fucking muscle. <laughs> <laughs> I'd just lay there. Well, imagine being him. Like, after everything he said, and now this has happened, it's just like, what a fucking joke. <laughs> like, why is this happening? <laughs> this is yeah. uh, not fun. No. But yeah, he's got the belt on and the... Yeah. Remind me to thank John for a lovely weekend. <laughs> yeah, and then... Yeah, uh... A lot of funny things to say. When she says, can we chance moving him? And he says, please chance it. <laughs> because they hear the T-Rex. Yeah. 
Yeah, um, we get the we've already had the cup with the water sort of footstep stuff. But now um, it's the footstep with the footstep. That's what I mean. It's <laughs> like hey, they footprint. managed to up it aesthetically, which is really cool. And yeah, just, no, it's neat. And seeing him uh, reflected in it as well. It's such a he's just terrified, and it really helps to sell the the horror portions of this. So I saw a couple people um fighting over what exactly this qualifies genre wise. It's like, well, I guess it is a couple moving in and around all of each other. Like, uh, people were trying oh, to argue back and forth right. whether it qualifies as sci-fi. It's like, it probably should. Uh, it's just uh, how significant... Because of what people think in their heads about what you'd expect from a sci-fi versus a horror versus a action-adventure versus a mm. thriller. I don't know if you could count portions of this as thriller, but, you know, it doesn't doesn't really matter that much. It's more so just about how well, these things show up all here. All this highlights is uh, genre. We can we can just move past it and yeah. talk about what's happening in the film. But uh, yeah, Malcolm being uh, laid down Dinosaur in the back. Overboard. Uh, as they're driving, right? And it's just like, all you could do is basically be a free meal for it while you're sitting there. Yeah. So it's just terrifying <laughs> for him. Again, those screams and stuff. It's just like, yeah, they made it's just a T Rex chasing them. I say that whenever I say that, you might think like, wait, what do you mean? I mean, oh, sorry, I mean in reference to like where it is now. Like, uh, they if you remember promoting um, Fallen Kingdom and Dominion, I think they kept talking about how they have a record breaking amount of dinosaurs in the films. Huh. It's like, okay, I don't care. Yeah, like what? It's care. like this one has the most dinosaurs. Like, okay. You can do way more with less, guys. It's a commonality with these sorts of things. Well, it's it's a it's one of those uh, euphemisms that is said, but nobody ever listens to it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> ever. Less is more. It's like yes, but less can be more, and more is more. More is more. But more <laughs> is more. Exactly. That's right. And yeah, uh, Alan is just like, fuck it, we'll stay up in this tree, it seems safe enough, and uh, they get to marvel mm -hmm. at the Brachiosaurus having some fun in a big old hood. I don't even know, this. would this be their paddock, or are they free? What is... Uh, I'm not, I don't know actually, but I presume that they're just roaming about the place. Um, well, I was going to say, they, sure. they must spend the majority of their time just eating, right? To sustain a body like that? Well, herbivores, I think so, yeah. yeah. That's what herbivores often do. Like they're cows spend most of their all day all the time. I do love these sharp contrasts of terror and beauty, though, throughout the film. Oh, you yeah. just had that insane encounter with the T Rex to then be contrasted against this just beautiful moment. It's just nature, you know, just observing nature, even if, even though it's you know probably shouldn't be in existence like this. There's still something beautiful about it. Does it not feel a little like we flipped in terms of uh, the beginning was all about the majesty and amazingness of everything, and then they like inject the characters talk about the horror element of it almost the you don't understand what you've done sort of thing. Now we're like exclusively in the horror section of the experience, and we're pulling some nice beautiful things out while we can. You know, it's like a flip. It, it just it keeps oscillating. Yeah, it keeps oscillating between this is horrifying, but still this is really cool, isn't it? But this is terrible. Yeah, but still, yeah, ain't it neat? Um, it's almost like it's on a meta level and it's reflected in the characters. Um, but it's it's great for pacing as well after what was a pretty lengthy, high uh, intensity scene to just bring it back a little bit, you know? Well, and to have Alan chilling out with the kids and they're even telling jokes and uh, asking him for like reassurance uh, you know, about their safety. And it's just like, look at you go, mate. You're almost a dad. Yeah naturally thrust into that role. He's doing a great job. Meanwhile... Um... He's doing a pretty good job, all things considered, yeah. Well, yeah, it's such a horrifying scenario. you got to keep it together for the sake of them. That's the, the job he has right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, the scene... I love the scene with Hammond and Ellie coming up now, and yes. I love as well the panning over all the imagery of the merchandising that's already begun for uh, this park and we mm -hmm. haven't even launched yet. Like of course that's how it works. It's just the it's a reminder of those are very nineties water bottles. Yes, and uh, oh, appreciate the columns in this room that have little uh, fossils in them. I imagine not real ones, just uh, the funnest. What? <laughs> well, hey, maybe they are real ones. He spared no expense. I'm saying that's right. He's like, you guys got to go out and find some fossils and then cut out a chunk 
so that I can use them as pillars in the cafeteria of Jurassic Park. Uh, really gotta sell this thing. And yeah, with uh, the fact they didn't find the kids, he's um he's talking about how like you know it's, it's I'm sure they're fine. They're with Alan, you know, and he's the he's the best yeah, person. Yeah, dinosaur to be with. expert. And he tells us about a little bit of his history to give you a really strong understanding of Hammond as a whole, right? That uh, he when he came down from Scotland, he um would have uh, he ran a flea circus, and uh, he's describing like all of the amazing elements sort of thing. But that from his point of view, it's obviously all fake. The best you can do is temporarily convince people or even just sort of amuse them at the idea. And that he always wanted something more real, something that was you could reach out and touch, something that was actually there. And um, I really appreciate that that's like his big goal and you can finally offer the world that. But then her coming back with like, all of this is still fake. Uh, you've not actually appreciated what these things are or... And I, I can't remember um, who I first heard this from, so I remember it just being an idea, but the Hammond wants to show the world something real, something that's in its, like, originality. It's not, like, a joke or, a, or an illusion or anything. But he simultaneously doesn't want the animals to be bound by their nature. He wants them to conform to what he needs. Not yeah, about it's... And... Um, it's... You understand the track that gets him to this point because, in a sense, it's very, it's very understandable. Like it's it's um it's kind of a misguided appreciation for dinosaurs. I think I mentioned it earlier. Like when people are like, yeah, I want to pet that wild animal. It's like, yeah, you know, I get that there's some earnestness there, but you know, true respect for the animal is to like observe from a distance, leave it be. And in this case, it's like a reverence for dinosaurs means accepting that they don't exist anymore. And to observe them from a distance, or at the very least, if they were going to exist, not to like have them bound by the rules of a theme park. And yeah, just the desperate pleading with him that he's never really moved on from that flea circus. It's all uh, insane to think that you can create this place the way that you envisioned without having insane uh, repercussions in all all manners that they've covered throughout this film. And yeah, uh, and then it comes down to a fundamental that Ellie's just like, we just, we gotta save the people we love. We gotta, gotta get them. Yeah, because like, course, it just focuses in on what matters right now. Yeah, it's, uh, there's just so much to be considering, but ultimately what matters the most is like, well, we gotta get them to safety. That's the actual thing. Fuck the park. And, uh, but it's just, obviously, that's what is on his mind, is that this, this crazy experiment that he spent so much time and all of his life almost led to, it's completely fallen apart exactly yeah and it takes a little while for that to sink in it eventually does but it's understandable that it takes a while yeah and uh he's eating all the ice cream so that it doesn't go so much to waste because of all the power fuckery and the the freezer will have melted a lot of the ice so to speak it's it's a little bit of a clue as to what will be useful for other characters later hmm and then a dinosaur sneezes on the girl, and it's funny. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like the, the the Brachiosaurus is super cool and nice and friendly, and then uh, you know it gives you a bit of reality. Okay, snot comes with these things. They have no. It's noses. not a yeah. It's a few million years behind on social decorum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It is a bit mean. I'm not sure that he did it on purpose, though. No, nah, well, he did. <laughs> time, time. He did. <laughs> did he or did he not? We gotta figure this out. <laughs> nice and gross. But anyway, uh, yeah, uh, Alan finds a bunch of uh, broken eggs. So it looks as if they've found a way. Or they made an omelet. Either. Oh, those must be expensive. Or... A dinosaur omelet. That seems like. Um... Just yet another, you know, piece of information relating to the illusion of control that they had here. You yeah, know, yeah, we control their breeding. <laughs> no, you don't, and you didn't even know. It's um, it's kind of funny. I would even cite the Jurassic World Evolution game that I've uh, played quite a few times. It's, it's all everything you do to make the park function. It's all like it's it's just what Ellie said. It's all like you're pretending as though you really have control when you really don't. Everything you do is an attempt to maintain 
like this long line of just trying to make everything function the way you want, but everything keeps going wrong, everything moves different ways, because ultimately that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to make it exactly the way you want it, but simultaneously for it to be itself. It's completely incompatible. And uh, it's just it's just tough to sort of learn fully. Because of course, if we had hyper technology with intense thick steel on every single cage and like a really good way to view it all, it's like you can definitely get it to that point. Um, but the you know you're you're going to be it's, it reminds me of all that stuff. I don't know if you guys have seen. I think it's called Blackfish, the um, the documentary no. about the worst of what's happened to like orcas throughout the world. Like you can get it so that you fully control them but then you don't get them pretty much yeah exactly like at some point you're changing it so much that you you've lost what it was that you were trying to retain a lot of ships sank until we learned how to sail that's probably a way to put this <laughs> like it's uh, mm. kind of how things can go uh yeah well i have it on good authority that the sea is always right the sea is so. always right that's true that's true yeah who said that again a wise, oh. wise man. Yeah. Wise man. Said the sea is always right. I've totally forgotten who said <laughs> Rings of A man up. who lost his wife to the ocean. Oh. Elendil, isn't it? Elendil, that's right. R Why so we, first, it we first hear it from the uh, the shipmaster who's yes. uh, training uh, Isildur and his two friends. <laughs> the sea is always right. <laughs> mm. Holy shit. Do you think when they wrote that, they were like, people will find meaning in that? <laughs> well, people will find meaning in that. I don't know what it is, but I'll leave it to you. Amazon, they went to the writers and like, so we're looking at this, the sea is always right line. What does it mean? And the writer said, oh, you know. You know. <laughs> you know. And then they just like changed the subject. And carried on. Uh, yeah, so their plan is to, uh, they need to reset the system. Fully to get everything back online from when Nedry took it offline because they can't deal with his, like, I think they say his two billion lines of code they need to sift through to find what he's done. And so instead, if you just reset the system, it'll all wake back up. But to do that, it turns everything off and then everything back on, and it triggers the uh, trip switch in their generator, which means that they've got to trip that back before they can get everything back on. And that, of course, if you've been paying attention, means the Raptor gates are down. Yep. And, oh, I uh, thought when you said Raptor Gate, I was like, there was some scandal happening involving the Velociraptors. And I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> like, oh, right, of course. Um, yeah, the, the, they bump into Gallimimus. Uh, they even highlight that like they might do this kind of activity when being hunted, I think. Yeah, and, uh, yep. <laughs> that it's like, uh-huh. <laughs> like, then you might have a bit of concern, but to be fair, they they seem to feel, at least Alan does, pretty safe. Because I guess the the T-Rex is going to be much more invested in killing them than the, the Gallimimus than them. Well, yeah, what, what food source is, is preferable? Little people That's, or... Uh, it's always bugged me in movies, them. yeah. Like, you have food right there. Why are you chasing some random things that are tinier and running away? It's like, you have food right here to eat. Especially eat when... It animals there, there was a there was a real evolutionary incentive to to minimize how much energy you're using to do this you know you can't be expending too much effort bet you'll never look at birds the same way again maybe that's something they were hoping to achieve like you'll always be scared of water with jaws now you'd be scared of birds because they're kind of like this big spooky t-rex huh like, they're just going to open up bird park next You've seen she Jurassic to Park. Hunt. Now, Bird Park. And yeah, so there's this moment where um, Samuel Jackson's gone to go and sort out the trip switch, and he hasn't come back in time. So now they're uh, they're worried about where he is, and it's kind of mm. weird because he's he's killed. Uh, um, and I think that's more than acceptable. It is the ob. I guess we'll get there that I find to be absolutely hilarious. Sounds a bit silly. Yeah. Um. So anyway, Ellie suggests that they go and do the trip switch themselves, and Muldoon this time is the one that says, I'll go with you. Kind of cool. They've made a, bit, made a good team before, right? And uh, yes, yeah, you got Hammond and Malcolm are going to try and guide them where they need to go to sort out the trip switch. Kind of makes you think, fuck it, should have probably gone with Arnold when he went, right? I guess they figured um, it was safe. Potentially, I guess, yeah, I guess they thought he'd be able to do it. Um, 
but well hmm. and yeah there's this moment where um uh hammond offers that he should go instead of ellie and the implication being because he's the man she's a woman and she says, uh, we'll talk about sexism in survival situations when I get back. And I just thought that was like, it's like, well, give the guy some credit. He's basically offering. Yeah, he's going to be, you know, chivalrous. Because uh, it's obviously the better choice that you go than him. But he's still trying to offer it as like a, a sort of, you know, I want to wanna look after those, uh, those whammons when you're in specific circumstances. You basically should just be like, I appreciate that, but no way you're going to be able to outrun a velociraptor or even have a chance, you know? Yeah, um, but yeah, it, it's uh, it's something that I I guess I appreciate the fact they threw it in for Hammond that he was he would offer it. Yeah, the thing I mean, he's it, not it he's not some like he's not some it. asshole. He's no, a really nice, no friendly way. dude who just wants people to be happy and stuff. It's because uh... you know the lawyer he he doesn't get to stay in the film for very long, but you you wouldn't catch him doing any of this stuff. He would just be cowering in like a closet or whatever. Yeah, and then she'd save him. I would save him. Wait, cowering a closet? I didn't mean to imply he's gay. <gasps> he should be bravely in a closet, proudly. But yeah, uh, it's kind of cool. You have this moment of them just walking towards the destination. Cabra sees uh, Ellie, and then she we, we pat over to Muldoon, and he's fucking frozen and sweating. And it's just like, yeah. you okay? And he's like, no, <laughs> we're being hunted. Yeah. It's like, oh... Yeah, and he basically uh, just tells her very calmly to fucking run. Get into that uh, generator building now. It's all right. Run. Just run. <laughs> <laughs> Get going. I'll stay out of here and... Uh, Be a Chad. Deal with these uh, velociraptors. Yeah, that seems to be the, uh, the angle. Hopefully she can do it. And uh, yeah, I guess Arnold went in there and a Velociraptor followed him in. That's what we would expect to happen, have happened, to make sense of that. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, around about the time they're planning on redoing these uh, fences, our uh, group of Alan and the two kids are getting out of the paddock they were uh, trapped in, I guess. Yeah. Which means there crossing a, over the... Electric fences are currently not operational. Though I like how he checks... Don't check by touching it. Yeah, <laughs> that's know? a good idea. At it. That <laughs> would be that would be wise. You don't check to see if a gun's loaded by pointing it at yourself <laughs> and pulling the trigger. Yes, you do. So, uh, this, <laughs> that's perfectly this, normal. This, uh, this bit of levity here as well. <laughs> yeah, it's such a prick move, but it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> that's and not funny. Shows, that was great. <laughs> shows how the difference, uh, yeah, the difference in the kids and how they react to you know. Yeah, he finds it funny, which is the correct. Uh, yeah. And it's um, also I also good. really appreciate yeah. him trying to pry open the little gaps to see if they can get through, which would be, you know, your natural kind of first attempt is to see, you know, can we fit through here? He and definitely shows can't. gaps that are clearly large enough for the children to go through. Yeah, the um, ones he was playing with, I don't even think a child could get through, but unfortunately the no. ones that are clear, there's some the ones big at the ones. Bottom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the ones at the bottom, they can clearly get through. And he says, you two go through here, I'll go up and over. Yeah, which would have um, solved their uh, incoming issue. Yes. Um, they can fit through there, yeah. Wait, someone said Alan knew the cable was safe because it was in the middle. Because it was in the middle? I don't know what they mean by that. I thought that this whole thing was wired up. Like, uh, touch any part yeah, that's of it why and he looks electrocute at the... you. Well, yeah, he, that's why he looks at the lights. Yeah, I thought that... And even he... then, I have... He knew it was off because of uh, the test with the stick, and then... Yeah, I would imagine the one he touches is normally going to electrocute you. Yeah, and, and plus the sign, the danger oh, sign is right there. Oh, fuck, that's so. an ancient meme, I'm sorry. What? Oh, what are we... Oh, what are Alan we with the middle is... Alan... Uh, Alan... Was Alan! I know that the it wasn't even the Velociraptor, Alan. Behind, There's so then? many Alan... I think so. The biggest... Fan, they were the, they they liked the middle the most, right? Oh, oh man! Oh, middle is that? I remember Mihai Cheek sent me high. I remember and that. How he says, you know, the, you know, the middle is we don't want things to end. Alan in the middle. Yeah, because it was something about Game of Thrones. Like the reason Game of Thrones was bad was because we all loved oh. the middle. We want the middle to go on forever. We don't want an end. Yeah, we don't want an end. Absolutely wrong. Uh, <laughs> but like oh how my stories God. work. Oh man, that is an ancient meme. How far back was that? That's EFAP like... Oh, that, that was the, um... 
What was that? That was the Wisecrack? I think it was Wisecrack. I, I, it's making me... Because for some reason I'm connecting to this is my favorite part. I don't know if that was the same video. Um, I love that meme too. Yeah. Yeah, he's talking about the... Uh, yeah, that was Randy the Goblin. <laughs> yeah, he Randy gold, the Goblin. He wanted his gold ingots. Uh, uh, <laughs> Jesus Christ. Because we covered like... wise, Wisecrack talking about the Disney things, the Disney ruining culture. Uh, I'm that right was nostalgic the where... right now for these things. Uh, Wisecrack on Game of Thrones having a chat with... Uh, I think it was 46? Damn, that is an old... Was that 46? Um, Go in, honey. I, think <laughs> I remember Joe, Joe and honey. That was Joe and honey. <laughs> I love gold. I love honey. Oh, no, I'm in honey. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> but oh, wow. There was several animations made in relation oh, yeah, to Joe and honey. Oh, yeah, it was a Walking honey. Dead mobile game. Yes. It was a Walking Dead mobile game is what it was. Yeah. Gold. Oh, yeah. I'm going to this. <laughs> you found 46. Oh, good times. Wow, um, that was that was three years ago or so. So that is a on point meme reference. She reaches the switches. And this is particularly intense now because we know I love this camera pan, by the way. So cool. But as we know, they are not off the fence yet, and they do believe they are safe. And then when she starts uh charging it up to turn it on. I mean, that's really worth pointing out as an appreciation. A lot of writers wouldn't have done this, is having it so that there's a warning light first to, to let people know these things are turning on. It's like, hey, that yeah. sounds like a reasonable thing that a writer would happily leave out because it will cause uh, issues in terms of raising the tension. But uh, you managed to implement it well enough here that they know it and they now have to descend quickly because you can't just jump off. Um, but the thing is, uh, he's not fast enough. He just ain't, and he's getting all spooked. So it's uh, getting real close, and he actually gets zapparoonied. And it would make me wonder, um, I don't think there's ever any overt reference to exactly how many volts are traveling through those things, but... Uh, 10, I think it's like 10,000. Yeah, on the warning yeah, sign it says 10,000. Oh, in that case, I guess, what happens to a human when they're hit by 10,000 volts? <laughs> What's interesting is that as I go into Google and type in can 10,000 volts, it autofills as can 10,000 volts kill Jurassic Park? Kill Jurassic Park. Um, uh, you see, the electric fences required at least 10,000 volts of voltage to contain the dinosaurs properly. This is an assumption, as mention is made about whether or not direct current or alternating current was used. Also, it should be noted that it is, in fact, amperage, not voltage, that can lead to death by electrocution. Um, let's okay. see. It's, it's possible for something to have 10,000 volts behind it and be relatively harmless. Uh, it can be life-threatening under certain circumstances. And sure enough, here we go. Would Tim from Jurassic Park really have survived the shock? Um, let's see. Uh, it's difference in voltage, which creates large... That's the thing. Yeah, I think it's okay that he uh, survives this. I don't know about him flying back, though, but ultimately that... He does get caught, and matter. obviously people are referencing, it's like, well, his heart does stop. And it's like, no, yeah, of course, I was just curious if that's unusual compared to just dying. I wonder if it was just an insta-kill for people or not. Um, it says, if your body is only touching the fence wires, you wouldn't even feel it, at least not the sustained current. Because I guess it's like, when if you're being grounded or not, or why birds can land on, you know, power lines and not, you know, get exploded. Uh, the cables are lashed together with thinner metal wires, they're conductive... But and while they're thinner, they're much higher resistance per foot. Uh, carry on. I will uh, look and no see. No problem. Well, someone in chat said voltage is the transport, amperage is the payload. So um, hmm. these are not things I'm aware of. So I have to do some googling, clicky in. But um, we've now got the uh, the Muldoon scene, and we kind of did talk about it already. So I'm not sure what else to say about it. It's really fucking good. It, uh, yep, it really is. It it is incredibly tense. I believe this man fully believes that he is uh, completely matched here, and that he has to be careful with every single step. But that he wasn't aware of hunting patterns for velociraptors when they are together, or at the very least, it caught him off guard. And uh, the clever girl thing is just perfect meme format. And I think yep. they have a puppet on him, right? Animatronic potential eating him, quote-unquote, but they put, like, leaves and, and stuff in place so that it uh, it can just... The confusion of what we're seeing is good enough with his screams, basically. 
And I love the shot of the other Velociraptor just watching. Brilliant. Yeah, nice and ominous. So he's out. Even when being careful, you can still fail. Very true. That's right. And he was very close. He got a shot off, but it missed. So it was very close. Um, by the way, this says here, uh, what happens if Tim is shocked and receives the injuries that are shown in the film? Okay, now he's almost certainly dead because his heart apparently stopped. We'll give Grant the benefit of the doubt here and assume that he wouldn't give a small child who you might already have broken ribs from the fall he just sustained chest compressions unnecessarily. Unfortunately, people who need CPR generally don't just go back to normal in a few minutes. CPR keeps you alive long enough to get medical attention, which in this case wasn't available in a reasonable time frame. Oh, okay. Also, it will it will be noted that if someone's heart isn't working, um, it's better that they get broken ribs than have their heart not work. A, B, C. Well, I mean, <laughs> it's that's the... Uh... That's that's what it is with CPR, right? There is a real good risk that you can break someone's ribs doing it, but yeah, I mean, you want to break that a heart rib, is you want more important. Dead. Ribs yeah. can they'll they'll mend, they'll grow back. Your if your heart stops, stupid ribs, uh, get out of the way, get out of the way. Um, I think right when we watched it, you highlighted like uh, Grant comes across Ellie, and when he sees her, she has a very dramatic delivery of run. That she keeps like under her breath, so to speak, almost. Yeah. And then they she says, run. collect up, they hug, and I think you were like, run. <laughs> like that's, yeah, that's yeah. What, the point. what were, are we? Are we not running? Are we okay now? I guess. I guess not. Maybe. She I get was, that she's just, desperate, like, especially panicked. if she knows what happened to Muldoon. But uh, you know, it's just funny. It's like running to the safety of Alan. It's like no, 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 not safe, not safe. <laughs> keep going, keep going. Alan's pretty great, but I don't know if he's like dinosaur resistant. You know? <laughs> So resistant. What does that look like? It I don't know. Eventually, the dinosaur will get you, but you know it'll. it'll yeah. So someone was quite dinosaur proof yet. Do you guys think it was deliberate that they had the lunch scene right after they saw the feeding scene for the Velociraptor, and then they're enjoying, indulging in all the desserts here, like happily eating, so to speak, and then we see the Velociraptors are here as well. Like they're here. It's sort of in a way, it's like they're here for the same reason. That you were there right now eating. It's just the uh, reflections, I guess, of because um, they, they have it quite close together. The ferocious nature of destroying that feeder, and then it cuts to like the meal and the plate being placed for them at lunchtime. And I was like, I wonder if that's on purpose as well. That humans of um, our desires and designs almost separate us from the animal kingdom, happily, but that uh, that is still ultimately what we are. Still doing the exact same thing as the Velociraptors. Maybe, yeah. Because um, something so I don't good. like is when they treat dinosaurs as good or evil in this franchise. Like, um, yeah. those are the good They're hero critters. ones, yeah. and those are the non-hero ones. And gosh darn, do I love it when that hero T-Rex takes out the villain of the film. It's like, what? What is it? What are you, like, 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 yay, he did it, good T-Rex. <laughs> it's just like, no, they're animals. They're just, they're doing what they're doing because they're hungry and they want to survive. And they've been built that way. Like I, I, just, I don't like going further than that. I think it's silly. Yeah. Um. The the whole thing they tried to do with Blue being trained and everything. Oh, was like, fucking that, Blue. That was shit. Because because Blue was like <laughs> it's almost instantly reverted back to a ferocious wild animal and tried to kill. But is like they no you can, is is Blue trained and friendly or not? Quit going back and forth. I hate Blue. <laughs> like it's so I hate annoying blue as well. Blue should have oh so close to fucking dying. Yeah, Had that one chick do like a blood transfusion for the dinosaur. And oh like, my fuck god! Off. Yeah, one gunshot nearly killed it. So fucking close, dude. It's such a like. How did we get here? <laughs> like, what is this disaster? You know what's crazy? By the way, I'm looking at the timeline. It's like, all right, this sequence with the Velociraptor is about to begin, and it's like, wait, we've only got like fifteen, ten yeah, minutes of movie film left. Is, film is real close to being to ending at this. Point. So dense. They get so much shit done because if you had yeah. told me how it much time like passes, you're only halfway into it. How much time passes in from those Velociraptors to the credits? I'd be like, twenty minutes, twenty five. Nope. Like, nope, way less than that. Because well, again, this... you know, the the T Rex, we don't see him until over an hour in, like just over an hour. Oh, and I, I guess I'll I'll, I'll address it because I just I don't know, but apparently these, accurately speaking, are not Velociraptors. They are a different kind of raptor. Um, and Utah the, it's, uh, raptors, or, Utah. Ra it's like um, Utah raptors or Utah raptors. Utah raptors. Utah they raptor. Utah. No, I know. But oh, these or... ones have feathers. 
Uh, it means Utah's predator. Uh, it's one word, Utah Raptor. I thought like it might. So to Utah. clarify, they're not from the state of Utah. Well, I, I don't okay. Know. Well, I guess we'll have to. We're left to speculate on that one then. I don't oh, know. it looks like the it looks like the Utah Raptors. Oh, the here. Let me get you a picture of the 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 Utah Raptor. Okay. He's a he's a cool one. He's one of the bird boys. Look at him. Well, yeah, maybe this is a hot take, but when I see the illustrations of the of like raptors that look more like birds, I prefer those. To... You could easily make these lads terrifying. I don't think we have. There's any no way. Yeah, yeah, look at the look at the claws and the teeth, and yeah, I mean, you, especially well, if it like plumes up or something to make itself look bigger, that can be terrifying. I uh, I do really like the designs of all the dinosaurs in this film. I think they look cool. I will say yes. that I do have a preference personally for the more bird-like illustrations that I've seen of Velociraptors. Um, not because I'm a bird, just because I think they look neat. Mm -hmm. uh... There is there is something about... it's it, there, There's something about things being almost... I don't, I don't know. I'm, I, it's weird how I'm, I'm kind of thinking about how to phrase it. When things don't look perfect or look aesthetic in a way that makes them look better it, because it doesn't seem like you're trying... To make them look a certain way, like that's just it as it is. It's like it's like some how some like Russian rifles and stuff are really ugly, sort of looking, well, but that almost makes so them appealing because they look like in, they're pure utility. In defense of the well, I, I does the film? Did we have a? Did we have this sort of understanding of what they could look like when this film was made? I don't know because I, I don't know if we. I don't know that I we thought... do, which I find interesting is that our perception of dinosaurs and what they look like has just changed the more that we've learned about them. Yeah, I could be um, wrong, but what I thought was when this film was made, this was the presumed science, the, the, uh, the leading theory. That's what theories, I'm saying, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I'm seeing some people say yes and some people say no. Oh, feathers weren't discovered yet? Uh, that's, yeah. because I of, think as that's I what I've heard. The, the imprints of like that on some of the fossils that they found, there's just markings on the bones that have led them to conclude uh, the the whole feather aspect. And then, dude, just I'm sure plenty of people here have watched it. The Curse Kazakh video on what dinosaurs may have actually looked like is uh, super cool. That's a real interesting one in terms of trying to get you to rethink, um, you know, perceptions of, of what dinosaurs may have looked like. Uh, and a few people are saying, watch Prehistoric Planet, which, yeah, I'll have to throw that on the list. <laughs> Dude. Gary sent me a screenshot from that M Power series where it has an image of, uh, Scarlet Witch. You and it looks like Scarlet us? Witch from, uh, Doctor Strange 2 specifically. And the words around okay. her are empowering heroes. Uh... Oh. I, I, what, what does the MCU or Marvel Studios as like a almost stated meta, like the author of the work, what is that? Do they think that she's a hero? I just want to know. I don't know what's going on anymore. <laughs> like, she's insane. She's not even a, a, a villain you can understand. She's just insane. No, she's incomprehensible as a villain. Um, man. Yeah, I don't know. I don't. Not Wait, much do else needs to be watch said. That to see what it is. I'm assuming well, it's going to be just behind the scenes, and then it's going to say some cringe stuff like, you know, women have always needed someone to look up to, and finally they do. You know, stuff like that. By the way, I feel like it's worth talking about here. Ellie is like she's a very active character in this story. Um, yeah, yeah. She gets involved like constantly. She's got a very clearly defined perspective and goals. Um, I find it so fascinating when you go watch a lot of these movies from the 90s and the 80s. It's like, I don't know, man, where are you, have you guys seen movies? <laughs> like, female characters who were active in stories were not invented in, like, 2016, all it right? It feels like pandering. <laughs> I don't get kind it. Of. It's just and not I guess true. people, like, fall for it. They insist on it, and people just, well, like, I, go along I, that's with that's it. That's the question. What are, your, what are your references? Like, how much, how much story have you consumed in your life to where, like, you can't latch onto any... You know, if we the strong, which again, like the fact that that's I don't even get that term. You don't describe characters as strong male characters; they just are characters. I just find it so weird. Just refer to them as characters. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, because I saw the trailer for it on Open Bar, and one of the lines from that, from one of the the women behind the production, I guess, was, um, "We don't want to break glass ceilings here. We want to destroy the wall and rebuild it." 
What, what is holding up the and ceiling? They, literally, they pull, we, we paused and I was like, I have no fucking clue what she means by that at all. Just, I don't. Wall's so holding you, up the you, ceiling, though. But if you break the wall, I guess that breaks the ceiling. That was the too, first I thing guess. Az said. He was like, <laughs> break the wall, ceiling comes down, so I don't know what you yeah. mean. But, Which mean, makes it easier know. to break through it. If it, why why would you I'm ascend when you can bring regardless. the ceiling down? You broke the glass. You just broken other shit too that didn't need to be broken. What is the wall? <laughs> and if you're gonna rebuild it, why are you breaking it? What do you mean? Like what, what, what does the wall represent? Yeah, like because it's the, the glass wall, ceiling is like, a barrier to evil, entry. What is the wall? <laughs> the wall is like evil norms in filmmaking, I guess, and they're rebuilding it. I guess, but I mean, you like that's your industry. <laughs> Whatever. Just, <laughs> I'm sure they're changing it for the better. You know, Captain Marvel, Black Widow, and I'm sure the Marvels are going to be brilliant as a wonderful set of movies in the end. Can you imagine if that film actually makes like less than Ant Man? That will be so funny. I think it might. I I would actually I would wager that it will make less. I so something that I wonder is I think one of the stated reasons for delaying that film was post production pipeline. I would guess that one of the motivations as well is July has like Open. Mission Impossible, uh, Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning. Uh. It's got, uh, it's got. I don't know what the flash is going to look like in terms of making money, but that's in June. Um, like that's, that's a busy time for films. And I mean, guardians will have only come out a couple of months earlier. I wonder if there's like a genuine concern that like the box office for that film would just be demolished by the films it's surrounded by. Um, and that was part of the motivation. Especially following the Tom Cruise's Especially, reputation right now is well, super high. I, th I think, uh, this hyper relevant part is following Ant-Man releasing to no competition uh, and not doing so well. And then, like, the next hey, week... Hey, Cocaine week Bear. That, that, well, Cocaine Bear was a week later. That's what I'm saying. It didn't release to, to any direct competition. Oh, yeah, that's right. And then Creed 3 as well coming in with a massive box office. And apparently Scream as well, right? Has had a big opening weekend. Yeah, um, yeah like 24 million. Dude. I think, that, I think that they are nervous right now at Marvel. Well, I saw, a, I think I, saw a tweet go yeah. viral about it. And I kind of, I'm, I'm getting closer to saying it. A movie's back. Is something happening? What's going on? Uh, it's something happening where like films that at the very least are more original, more driven by filmmakers are starting to make a resurgence. That would be real nice to see because Puss in Boots is still making money. A film still in theaters is still making money. I think it's expected to cross 500 million now. Because this has been an uh, annoyingly nice long drought, but I thought that we'd be getting it for longer, where we get a couple of movies we like, but mostly it's dominated still by superhero MCU stuff. But, uh, it seems... Or, uh, or sequels. Because the, the idea alone... The, I know Scream is a sequel. It's like, so we're still going... We're not like out of the... We're not into the, the best times of cinema. Just is this signs of things are changing, is all I'm saying. Scream like it more is more original. Oh, I mean that might, that film might suck. I don't know. But yeah, like no, it's uh, not a Marvel movie. <laughs> yes. Um and, and that's kind of what We're, I'm getting at. It's nice to see other things rising up the leaderboards again uh, for box compared office. Compared to and I think that's why this is a bit of a tangent, but the th this year uh this is an interesting year for Disney. It's their hundredth, it's their centennial. Yes, centennial. Um I I'm so curious to see what films end up in, like in the top ten because I get the impression a lot of them aren't going to be Disney films. Um, I get the impression that you'd have like the Mario Brothers movie might be real high up there. That new Fast and Furious movie. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um. Uh. The, the, uh, uh. Oh my God! Mission Impossible it took a while to get that one out. Uh, I'm just curious. That's all what this year looks like for Disney and how that manifests in terms of changes they make. Because the changes on the production side for these Marvel movies, I don't think we're going to see that manifest until like 2025. <laughs> and I, don't, I don't think we're going to see it reflected in these new movies that are coming out this year and even some of them from next year. And who knows about the remakes? We we'll just, just have to see. Just hoping there's this sort of growing thirst in the audience for... Like you see, you see, you see Ant Man seventeen, and you see Cocaine Bear, and you're like, Cocaine Bear, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> At the very least, it's something I, you know, it's kind of different. Yeah, like uh, how long can this last? Come on now. Um, and I wouldn't be saying this, by the way, if they were really well written. Still, if if everything oh, yeah, in if Phase were good, Four were more. Like, like, on the yeah. level of like Avengers, is is I, I don't I don't think I'd care that much. I'd be like, it doesn't surprise me. It's still at the top of the box office if they're going to be written this well. But now. You know, hmm. but yeah, uh, I think it time. fast tracked the dreaded fatigue everyone talks about. I've seen people saying 
it, this is interesting, right? Because everyone's calling out what will be the future. And I've seen the take that, like, no, this is just another round of calling out fatigue where it's not even there. Like, all right. Dude, the numbers. It, might lose money. I mean, it, it could might be, lose but money. the numbers. Yeah, this is unprecedented what's happening with Ant Man, potentially. And the Marvels, everyone's waiting, man. <laughs> it's not to see the yeah, movie. Guardian, Guardians will be interesting. How well does Guardians do? That, will, um, that one, I don't think it'll tell us anything. Uh, how well that does. No, because it's it's Guardians. It's like almost yeah, people not see even it separate part from the MCU universe. in a way. Yeah. And it, well, and let's say it flops, I'd be like, what the fuck? That doesn't even make sense to me. Like, why would that, that flop? Right. Yeah, that would and, be odd. And then so, the big thing is, what does it translate to when James Gunn is kind of like of of all the Marvel directors, he's he's more known than a lot of the directors, and he's going to DC. Yeah, you know, how much does Guardians three being great feed into subsequent Marvel films and TV shows? Really. Um, anyway, <laughs> like, yeah, we'll just have to say, but well, we got the Velociraptor scene now. Yes, and I love that uh, she's closed the door on it in that generator room, and he's like, so there's only the two we got to deal with, right? And then she's like, well, yeah, unless they can figure out how to open doors. Yeah. And it's like, uh, about that. <laughs> <laughs> that cuts in, I love him breathing on the glass as well. Yeah, we were talking about these sort of micro interactions with the real world and there are some things you may forget when you're working with an animatronic because you're like i've got it this is the real thing done and then it's like if people on set are there and, and and in the work to be like well i mean if it breathed real hard and it was hot breath and it went onto the glass it would do this let's make it do this yeah it's really cool That'd be neat. um yeah this it's, it looks so good look at that <laughs> the eye and it looking around I love the, the it just looks the so lenses good. Lenses and the 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 lids closing <laughs> the around the narrowing it's... lids. I know yeah. it. Ah, uh, uh, it's so cool to watch. <laughs> way the lips, yeah, pull back a little bit. This is why, the by breath. the way, I refuse to like. I find it interesting when it's fiction, when it's nonsense, like not uh, not nonsense, but not real. Um, meanwhile, like I ask, people get bored of dinosaurs. I just nah. I, I'd nah. love to see these fuckers. Are you kidding me? <laughs> but then I feel bad because I'd be like, oh no. I watched Jurassic Park. I remember the message of that. Oh dear. I'll be having them in little boxes. And then it's now, like, you no. might remember Jurassic Park, but I have a question. Do you remember Disney's 2000 dinosaur? film Dinosaur? Yeah. I saw it I once. Remember it, so, and it's been too long for me to remember it. it anymore. I don't remember anything about it. <laughs> um, we had that shit on, I don't know, VHS, DVD, whatever it was. Uh, growing up, I saw that more than once. I don't know if it's good or not. I don't know if it's good know. or not. It had, a bunch of, it had a bunch of lemurs in it. Well, you know what? That's good. Maybe. <laughs> Why is uh, cracking lemurs in my dinosaur movie? Yeah, the, like move it, move it. we watch the yeah. raptors open up the door and they come. And we're switching between practical and CG quite a bit in this scene. And uh, you know they were trying to make it seamless. And I appreciate every last effort. I think they did a great job. Uh, I love like, them. I think I they're fantastic. So, I was so impressed. And like the lighting on the CG as well. It's like, wow, man. And the details, like it's all some... of the little, you know, uh, like. What can you even say? Like, I, I don't expect to ever see this ever again. I don't expect when we watch any movie crazy. again that I'll see this. It's like, that's really sad. Yeah, How I'll just pass it to the CGI you know? guys and the characters will suck. And I'll be like, when can I go home? Well, the thing is, they'll pass it to the CGI guys. It's like, so can we have four years like James Cameron gave us? <laughs> oh, wait, you're serious? Because, <laughs> <He's> like, <laughs> Cause like the, the, in, in the scene that just showed a moment ago, like the two velociraptors standing in the doorway, like those were CGI. Yeah. But like, they look pretty darn good. Well, it's, mm. It seems to me that they only ever use CGI when they have no option to do... When they can't show the body, practical. yeah. Because they have the feet, they have the heads, they have the little hands. But yeah, when they have to do a full body, yeah. yeah. Well, Rags, you pointed That's out when we were watching it, and I'm the exact same. It's like burned into my memory, the the feet going across the ground and the, the click-clack the taps claw on the... tapping yeah. on the... Yeah. Because it, you, you, we see them... Because the way it's directed and shot, right? You have the big table and a bunch of shit in the table, right? So you can't see through the table. But underneath it, you can see the feet and the claws. Uh, from above, you can see the head. And then you can have the tail kind of wiggling around behind yeah, it. Yeah. So you don't have to see the body to have the scene completely and totally work. You see all the really dangerous bits. Mm -hmm. um, 
and that's like enough to totally sell you on it because moments ago you saw the CGI of the full body. So your mind doesn't even think about, oh yeah, of course there's a body like, well, duh, there's, it's just the, the tables in between us and the body. And so it, it's just, it, it's the direction paired with the good animatronics paired with the, the wise use of CGI. Yeah. Cause there are like some here, shots. You saw the CGI there of them and it's like, what, two seconds. And yeah, here I'm... it's like, what going to be four or five seconds. And then whoop, we're already moving on. And to have done it practically would have been a nightmare when they're like full body. It would have looked, uh, it, they're not that good. You can do, if, if you put a lot of work and effort into making heads, claws, um, you know, a tail, you can do that. But to make the whole thing walk around, that's just, the technology's just not, you know, quite. You know, that would have been something the else. movement that you want um, for them yeah. running around. Yeah, she goes to climb into like a. Uh, Dumb yeah, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Or is it a just a shelf, yeah, or something like that? But it reflects off the, uh, the. The thing is, you're given all the information to know that she is not where it looks like she is, but you can forget that when you see it run into water. <laughs> like, it's uh, so good. It's very much <laughs> described in the seed. Like you can see her getting in. You know that she's not where the, she then looks like she is, but it's enough to like. I think a lot yeah, of yeah, you see her. Yeah, the hole right there. Yeah. Um. But you see, you're like, oh fuck, is she is she fucked? Is she gonna be able to close it in time? And you're like, well, she's fine because it can't actually get her by going that way. And it's just, a, it's cool. Well, there's that element of like, oh, you were fooled as an audience member, which you, you probably were. It's like, yeah, the, the Raptors aren't so dumb, are they? Because it fooled you too. They thought you just thought exactly what they did. How about that, huh? And then, uh, <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> give him a little credit. He runs in to the freezer, immediately chased by the rafter, and he grabs onto, like, I think a pole so he can swing himself to not, like, fling right into the freezer, but of course the rafter can't, and it just slides right in, because, yeah, with the power having gone off for so long, things were melted in there, so it's all slippery. Uh, it's a little setup and payoff, and there's exactly. a lot of those nice little moments in there. There's no, like, big dramatic setup and payoff, which is a lot of small, well, I mean, just setting up, like, you know, several minutes beforehand. For character, there's plenty. I don't know if one would call this... It's it's such a strange environment, right? Basically, he's got it locked in, but he hasn't quite got it full. And she knows that this is incredibly desperate. This is your chance to be able to get the raptor stuck in it. So she's fucking screaming her ass off as she runs to it. And I've always found it a little bit funny. Like It is. <laughs> <laughs> like, get this fucker stuck out. in there. It's yeah, the hands yeah, forward. Yeah, there. yeah, it's not good. <laughs> so, super desperate and tense, because this is your one shot. Gotta get it right. And yeah, so that one's locked in, but of course the third they thought they'd locked in another place is uh, soon to break out. Or well, probably has, actually. I don't think they show that happening. But yeah, you get them running away, and it's just like this shot of the Velociraptor staring at them. It's fucking great again. It's just a... Uh... They, they, oh, it's so good. they spend Jesus. the whole film building up the Velociraptors, and now we've got them, but they're fucking great. And now you're running for your life from them in a kitchen. Yeah, and then uh, they get into the control room. We got to get that system to reboot. And seriously, running out of characters at this point. <laughs> and uh, oh, this shot where he notices the door is locked, pads back up, and the Velociraptor just staring at him. And then they both look <laughs> down at the handle. It's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's fucking terrifying. It's like, wait a minute, this isn't supposed to be a thing. It's 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 scary to see a handle turn from the other side. You know, when you're not touching it, like that's that's scary. That's a especially scary when it's kind of a thing. fucking Walks dinosaur on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like there are dinosaurs chasing us and opening doors. What the fuck? Well, the yeah. is this place it's just so ready to eat them <laughs> it's like you're making me work so hard to eat you i <laughs> heard there was chilean no sea bass bell. in there and you're not sharing i remember the chilean <laughs> sea bass so yeah um i guess the one thing you could say because you did highlight the line rags that she's like uh if i basically if i go to get the gun i can't continue to hold the door but uh, yes. i suppose she could have uh, yeah. uh told timmy to grab it for him um, so what she said before this was, you can't hold it without me, or, like, you need me to, it's like, I gotta hold this with you. Um, so I don't know if Timmy would be strong enough, which does kind of call into question no, no, no. how he was able to... I mean him to pick up the gun and give it to her. Um... Or Alan. I guess, yeah. 
I wonder if she's even thinking about that in the moment. Um, that is I one thing like, I would oh, allow kid... for the panic of it all. Is the, the panic, and the kids are over by the computer trying to it, do the thing. I guess they're working together, and I'm just so focused on keeping this door shut um, that it, it doesn't can... even occur to me to ask Timmy. It's a it's it's a thing that's uh, happened to me in video games sometimes, where it'll be like an intense battle is going back and forth, back and forth, and I'm like about to die, do die, and then it's like, you had a full heal. It's like, oh, shit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it happens. Your character has, like, two abilities, and if you just used them, you would have been okay. And you're like, oh, yeah, that's right. Whoops. Like, but I was just so ingrained in the moment. I wasn't even thinking about, like, using an ability or using an item. And I you can argue so that focused. Ellie believes at that point that the two of them are trying to get the system rebooted. Absolutely. Um, which is quite funny visually, by the way. This insane, like, database is... is Visualized almost like a cartoon motherboard or something. Windows ninety six. What is it? Windows ninety one. Whatever. This I'm, I'm not is. sure. Uh, this is before Windows ninety five. Windows yeah. eighty eight. <laughs> we were talking about before. It's like, oh, look at the three D graphics here as you sort through your files. <laughs> this is fun. Yeah. Can you get me this file? Yeah, sure. Let me fly over here. It'll be three Let me minutes. Fly but yeah. on my very old computer with these three D renders in real time. <laughs> So it's like it's a Unix system. She knows this. She's like, I know this, <laughs> and it's it's funny. I think Rise, you mentioned it's just like the way you show it with the mouse. Like you've never used a mouse before. <laughs> like, you've never used a mouse before. I you are not. You are a fake gamer girl. Like, you've been detected. Retail computers. All right, look, it was early. <laughs> it's just uh, the way she's because uh, yeah, there's just a way people hold. She's like uh, using <laughs> like the thumb know. as a full control over them. Idea. It's so strange. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, the door locks up. It's all good. We made it, folks. And then uh, they call back, and we have some fun lines about, like, you know, Mr. Habit, the phones are working. I think uh, this is probably the most badass he comes across as well, Alan. Like, the, yeah. the blood on his face, the gun in hand. It's just like, get the damn helicopters. But uh, we hear a smash, and I assume that is the Velociraptor they thought was neutralized, or at least in the um the place with near Muldoon the generator, and so it's uh. in. And uh, and I they have this shot of the gun. I meant to look at this again because I wasn't sure if they were trying to tell us it, he's out of shots or if it's jammed. Or jam? Um, I don't. We hear like three or four, and the way that it's on the ground looks like it's kind of deliberately that way, um, because. Yeah, because the, there's a shell. I mean, I, it could be uh, jammed and right, he just I'm... dropped it, or he could be out. Um, but you wouldn't know that you were out. So the way that it looks to me is that it was like a failure to eject. But if you just flip the gun over to the right, that it sort of falls out. And you don't know that you're out until you... Um, I, I, I don't know specifically what you know the SPAS-12 mechanism uses. But, you know, of course, you, you press the... You know, the, the the pull the trigger and the, there's a click and you don't get anything. But um, yeah, the spent casings there, very neatly, all next to the gun. But I don't know. I guess for whatever reason, the gun is either uh, not working or it's out of ammunition. My assessment would be: we saw three holes in the glass. There's two shells on the floor and one stuck in the gun, seemingly, so it didn't eject properly. And he gave up on the gun when that happened. Really, uh, the most relevant part of this scene is 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 Hammond's face. Oh, it's... Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's a shame it, it, that your video has now made that a meme to me. I almost said Spaz-12 semi-automatic. It's, it's both. My it reaction both to Fallen Kingdom. automatic and pump yeah. action. Um, because not all the shells have enough, uh, create enough, generate enough force to feed the next round in in semi-automatic. Because it was made for SWAT teams and police. So, um, if you make a shotgun for, like, police, SWAT teams, that sort of thing, you want to have a shotgun that can do different loads. Whether it's bean bags or... Uh, non-lethal things of that nature and they don't all necessarily generate the amount of energy required to cycle uh, back and forth so if they're using less you know powerful shells you want to have it in pump action so that you could manually make sure that it chambers another shell is a couple people saying it is both. the fact that it's a spaz 12 means it's more than likely a jam because that's something of a known thing with that is that true what do you mean the spaz 12 never jammed when i was playing modern warfare 2 and Very black true. Ops. yeah it has, it shows yeah. what they know but about I, guns, huh? I don't know. Um, it looks like uh, it, that looks like a kind of thing that was deliberately placed because the, the shotgun in the chamber, you could tell that it's been. Um, it's either well, I can't see the end, so I don't know purpose, if it's a dud right? or if you know. 
They put yeah, that in there on purpose. That's where they decided to put it. So, I don't know. Also, interesting, someone just chat, uh, chat about it. I think that's actually... When they show everyone reacting to the Velociraptor coming, I'm not sure if... Let me check again. I don't know if you can see Ellie saying it. But she says, Oh, it's going to cut through the glass. Yeah, you can't see her saying it. I think they would have thrown that in as ADR to, you know, assuage anyone being like, How is it getting through the glass? Like, uh, it's, it, it almost seems like a... kicking it or bashing its head or just... Yeah, it feels like an overcorrection. It's like, don't worry, I can believe it can get through glass, I think. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. A person can get through glass. Um, See if only if only Grant had the model eighteen eighty nine Akimbo, he would have been he would have been, been sorted. Fine, That's yeah. true. Had I can't believe that they put that. I love that game, but like, holy shit! Like <laughs> that you have shotguns as a secondary, and one of your options for your secondary shotgun is Akimbo for the shotgun. So you have two shotguns instead. I mean, of the Spaz twelve was it, in Modern Warfare two. The Spaz twelve um, was insanely good as well as a secondary. Very just long range time. on it, yeah. Oh, well, someone to, said and then black ops. it's bad subtitle, and she actually shouts, "It's coming through the glass," which seems more reasonable, yeah. In terms of like less, it's, that comes across as less overcompensating and more normal. Uh, in terms of making sure people understand how this is happening, sort of thing. And yeah, we get uh, uh, Hammond looks like he believes right now that his grandchildren might die. Yeah, it's uh. The most intense reaction you get out of him in the whole movie, and it's very much appropriate. Yep, he it's not because terrified. his park is failing. It's not because no, the exactly, dinosaurs are loose. Exactly. It's because he thinks his kids are in danger. The more, the longer the film goes on, the more localized his concerns become. Yeah, it's great. Well, Ellie talked to him about saying, who we love is what matters now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then we get the Velociraptor searching for him, and then it pokes up the thing. And like I said, uh, you start with animatronic with his head. It's kicked, and then when we see him again, he's full CG, and uh, we, we were looking at it for a little bit when we watched this, because I was just so thoroughly impressed with it, and it's, it's, it, we came down to it, it's got to be the animation. It's what uh, makes this so believable. Animation, animation is so important. It seems, whenever I really notice CGI when it comes to, like, character, you know, it it's always seems to be, man, you, you seem very light. You don't, you don't seem very weighty. You, I don't feel yeah. like you have I much heft. I mean, the dinosaur is way less dis uh, way less distracting than the stunt double. <laughs> I uh, I think uh, the the kick uh, that was mentioned rags is like it it, it like uh, sort of changes the balance of weight so it can get back up. Like that helps as well. It just looks yeah, fast. It's the, yeah, yeah, it's the it's the movement. Detail. It's the way it moves. It and it moves in a way where it's quick, not too quick. You could tell it has a, an amount of weight to it. Um. Yeah, it, it kicks the, so it could kind of get it back on its feet. It's it's just it just looks so good for it's CG. It's a complete one hundred percent totally CGI dinosaur in a nineteen ninety three movie, and it really looks good and it's terrifying. This is the um almost the opposite of what you get in in Ant Man, where you can tell when really looking into it how detailed the graphics are, right? Which is something I guess you could be critical of, but that's actually where I would bring in, like, this is the most they can do. They literally can't do more. Like, uh, some, can you see how, like, parts of it have to stretch instead of what looks like... It doesn't look quite like skin, it instead looks like a, an image it's like a, uh, stretching. For... Very specific parts of the body, this is what I mean. You have to go... Mainly uh, oh, yeah, you gotta look really yeah. closely. Yeah. Meanwhile, the animations I mean, are so yeah, damn good actually. that it it doesn't even come to mind. And then you have Ant Man, yeah, which will be close, like yeah. they'll have fucking top notch resolution and and high tech fidelity in every way, shape, and form. But the animation is so bad, you'll never believe yeah. it. <laughs> the big problem with the 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 Cassie running is not like the fidelity of the suit; it's the animation. It it just looks goofy. And it's something that's so clearly important for the fact that everyone sees well, it and immediately laughs. And it's like, oh, well, it's, I think it's um the reason why video games often seem as though they look better than they actually because you know like video games being rendered in real time on consumer grade hardware it's it's never going to look as good as the best that you can do with visual effects at the time but yet people will often compare stuff like ant-man to like a playstation 3 game it's like well why is that ps3 games like don't have as, as high quality textures they can't and it's like, well you know you play uncharted 3 it's like the animation's really good like the animation does a lot of work for you 
Like if you you animate a character in a way that like seems convincing, that can overcome like the pure fidelity of it. And yeah, them cycling through the uh the upper levels gets them being able to come down onto the fossil sort of yeah. uh, <laughs> representations of these important dinosaurs in the main hall, which is just like, ah, oh, what a great place for a set piece. Literally hanging onto the fossils for safety. Let Again, me ask this, is it a problem with the movie that the Velociraptor is able to get high enough to stick its head through the panels in the ceiling, but it can't jump high enough to grab her leg? Yeah, that doesn't, I didn't even think of that, that doesn't really make much sense. Yeah. I don't think it has much of a consequence as a problem, though. Maybe it's standing on though. a desk or something. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, maybe. I, uh, if you look around the room, see if there is a potential for that. That could be it. Yeah, I don't know if it's, it's, if it's standing on anything taller or the room has a bunch of tables and stuff it could be on, but... But yeah, uh, I quite love this sequence for just the absolute chaos. All these different pieces are all coming apart. Everyone's trying to hang on to each of them, and then the strings are coming apart gradually as well with the Velociraptors moving around. One has jumped on and one's on the bottom, right? They're all just... Just so much happening all at once. And even the individual pieces are knocking the others. Can't imagine in the, for a Velociraptor's brain how it's processing all this madness. It just wants to eat, on. man. <laughs> it's like, I'm hungry. These hamburgers are weird. Or there's no meat on these big ones. I can eat all these little boys. And yeah, uh, once they're all down, you just get Ellie like staring at the the silhouette of the Velociraptor, and it pokes his head up like, ah, oh, there you are. Hello. <laughs> it's like, oh fuck. Yeah, and then the other one's in, and so it's just game over basically, because there's nowhere else to go. But something to appreciate is that Alan keeps himself in front of everybody. He's a good lad. I'll punch you in the face. And then, right as the raft is about to pounce at him, Hero T-Rex comes in and grabs, uh, <laughs> grabs the Velociraptor, <laughs> which is, uh, timing is perfection, apparently. Like, it, it, I'm, I'm highlighted how uh, lucky they are. And, um... And the, nobody heard it? This is the... <laughs> I was saying to Rags, I don't know why they did it that way. I think it would have been yeah. perfect during the tense scene to have to the building up sound. Up. Not even show him, you know, yeah. but just have those sounds. The doom. Doom. Yeah, while everything's the bones happening, on the floor can rattle just very subtly, and then maybe, maybe they just sort of they turn their heads to look at something off screen, uh, and then as the raptor pounces, you know, it gets grabbed. Like they, are, like the Grant and crew are distracted by the T Rex walking in, that they don't really look at the, uh, they they turn away from the Velociraptor for a moment, just to imply that they just noticed it showed up. Well, and you could even do a different kind of shot where the two Velociraptors are moving in, Grant's looking at both of them, and then we have the shot of him looking to the center almost and up and terrified. Then both the Velociraptors turn and look because they haven't realized it yeah. yet either. And, or uh, the Velociraptors are maybe in front of them, and then the T-Rex comes from behind, and they scurry away from the middle as the dinosaurs like start going after each other or something. Yeah. Something, you know. But yeah, it, it is kind of um, strange. Yeah. How it just well, and this this up. by the way is the origin of Hero T Rex. Uh, I don't I don't particularly mind him attacking raptors. Uh, that's fine, but uh, he ends They're up dangerous. killing yeah. the villain humans in like all the fucking films. Like Lost World starts that up. Yeah, but it's, yeah. It's because of this movie, I think, that they did well, that. Like the villain in uh oh, well, I guess yeah, T Rex killed the the Indominus Rex kind of. Um, I well, so I was yeah, what? Lost World T Rex kills, kills businessman guy. Yeah. Um, I don't think they do it in Jurassic Park 3 because the T-Rex is killed by the Spinosaurus to be like, look, Spinosaurus is scarier. And it's like, okay. I remember if fans were so. very upset by that, by the way. People like the T-Rex. <laughs> they don't really like the T-Rex. He's cool. Well, it's just funny because I don't... If you show a Spinosaurus okay. beating a T-Rex, unless I know different from, like, biology or history or whatever as to which would win the fight, I don't have, like, a stake in T-Rex to the point where I don't want him to see see him lose to anyone. You know, he's, he's just... It's an animal. It can be killed, sure. Um, but I remember people were very much upset to uh, see the T-Rex defeated by the Spinosaurus, especially because I think the goal, filmmaking-wise, was to be like, see? Spinosaurus is scarier. You should be more scared of him. Um, but I haven't seen that movie in so long, like, I can't even say more than that. But yes, the T-Rex is um, summoned, like, Iron Man in Jurassic World to help like an actual superhero type situation where they're dealing with the Indominus Rex. It's like the T Rex and the Mosasaurus essentially team up to kill him, right? You could argue. Mm. And then Fallen Kingdom, the T Rex eats the villain again. It's uh, kind of like Lost World. 
And I don't know about Dominion, but I assume the T-Rex has hero moments in that as well. Uh, I don't know, I just find it lame. It was cool the first time, alright? Well, so this is what I mean. I don't really see the problem. That element isn't here with this. The T-Rex is just eating the Velociraptors. Yeah, ex well, yeah, it's a, it's a hero just from a point of view that it helped you out, but, like, it's not doing it because it wants to help well, you. Well, they need to get the fuck just out because he will eat them next. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, it's exactly. not. It exactly. seems much more neutral in that regard. Um, but, yeah, they get out, and he's like, uh, Mr. Hammond, I've decided not to oh, endorse your park. The iconic start. No, I know, but I wanted to mention the... Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> we, we did kind of talk about uh, the it, banner, right? Oh, I think Robert so mentioned good, it. Though, look at him! Uh -huh, sorry. <laughs> oh, no, you're right. It, it is it is fantastic. Oh, and uh, honorable mention to the second raptor jumping onto the T-Rex. Yeah, that's pretty Chad. It's a shame that it didn't work out. <laughs> that's Chad, but I... it Yeah, there's a Chad move, but I'm not certain how you thought this would end. <laughs> He's hoping for the best, I suppose. Um, and yeah, I... Uh, I like that quote from Alan because it's like we fucking finally Alan. did it after all those efforts and he's just summarizing in a very no. calm and civil way. Yeah, no. Um yeah. but the <laughs> the thing that I think almost makes it even better is the fact that he says uh neither neither am I. Like I'm not endorsing yeah. it either. It's like, hey, we got there. We got his arc. You know what? Nah. <laughs> yeah, this was uh this was a mistake. This was an error. And yeah, that's um I think Pretty much for the rest of the film, it's just they leave. Yeah, that's, that's it. those that's are the, the final words dialogue. of the film, I think. The rest of it is just reactions, uh, them getting on the helicopter and the way that each of them are sort of just, you know, looking as they're reflecting on their experience. And yeah, it's as if it's almost like a recognition of once this guy thinks it's a mistake, that's that, that's, that like that's it. it. There's yeah. not really anything else needs to be said, like that's the end. Well, it's, uh, we Hammond's hopes of... and dreams have all been shattered, and he's had to realize a lot of realities he didn't want or need to be true for him. But it's uh, mm, not undeniable. Look. Yeah, look at him there, looking at the uh, the mosquito in the in the sap. Such a great shot. So many. We didn't even see what Hammond was looking at, but he was just looking out. I mean, in the shot before that, where he's uh, on that landing pad, but you know, he's just looking over at the island. All of it. It's just that was a mess. So much for that sort of thing. We get Ellie looking uh, surprisingly chill, almost happy, and it's because she's seeing Alan with the two kids. Remember, she's she's made a couple comments about how she's hoping to have a kid, and uh, uh, it's just a nice little completion of that arc as well. Yep, and then you've got uh, you've got Malcolm sitting off uh, to the side. Malcolm, pretty, who's uh, not in the middle. No, oh. no, but no, he's uh, he's quite quiet and uh, melancholy as well. Just sort of like, pointed the out, thing is, he no was just is, correct uh, about everything, so you can yeah, just you can sit back, you've done your work. Someone in chat's pointing out that no one is celebrating. It's a somber moment when they escape. They're well, not no, going, because Whoopee, we did it, woohoo. A lot of people died, um, yep. and it's, yeah. it feels like it's reflected, this was, this was a bad day, it's just relief, if anything. It's over. Mm -hmm. And not a word necessary. And then, yes, we got that shot there of the birds flying along, which, uh, yeah, I mean, another instance of something where it's like, that's very deliberate, you can read into that what you want. Just life being life, isn't it? Yeah. That's what all of this was. That's why it went all wrong. I mean, mm -hmm. in references to how dinosaurs are, essentially became birds, you became know, you birds. get these birds, that, yeah. you know, yeah. and they're out there, you know, dinosaurs are still out there in, in, in a way, anyway, you know, in a sense, mm. in a way. Oh, and this last shot of the helicopter riding off into Directed the sunset. Directed by Look Steven Spielberg. Good man. Isn't it crazy how many like of the best films ever made Steven Spielberg has made? Isn't that nuts? He's behind quite a few. Uh, yeah. Well, this is it's funny because um, we were hanging out a bit with Gary as well when we were talking about this movie, and it's it's like my pick for his movies is going to be Saving Private Ryan, but it's that not. Is my number one. Jurassic Park is not far away. I fucking adore this film. And it's funny because uh, uh, Gary was saying like uh, he was talking about Close Encounters of the Third Kind, how much he loves it. And I was like, "Oh, is that your favorite?" And he was like, "No, it's Raiders." And I was just like, "Oh fuck yeah, of course he made Raiders yeah, as well." Yeah, and then of course <laughs> Schindler's List as well. He yep. made um, it's it's uh, Jaws. It's, uh, Last got... Crusade. <laughs> oh, of course, that would be my favorite of those three. Is... That's my favorite, I think. Yeah. yeah. Wait, would that be your favorite Spielberg film? Hmm. Maybe. Maybe. It's definitely not certain, but yeah. definitely pencil it in. Minus saving Private Ryan. 
Um, Chat, what are your favorite? Two, that's a lot harder. What are your favorite Spielberg movie? What are your? That's that's a sentence. It's good enough. I'm tired. <laughs> 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 let, let me. I'm curious what the what the winners are typically. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm actually I'm curious too because I could understand I could understand so many of his films being picks. Jurassic Park, I wouldn't be surprised if showing Seeing up a Seeing a few bit. Raiders and uh, Last Crusade, Jurassic Park. Uh, if you include television shows, Band of Brothers, is a, that's a that's a choice for sure. Oh, yeah. Going with Raiders. I guess we're... Hmm. Saving Private Raptor. <laughs> Seeing some Jaws. Temple of Doom. Not many ETs. No. Um, Which, I, was... I understand that. ET don't... It's been a while since I've watched ET, but the fact that it hasn't made that much of an impression on me. I'd be curious yeah, to see it again to know. I don't know anything about the film anymore. I've seen it like twice or even three mm. times, but it's Someone all gone. It says Hook. <laughs> Hook. Uh, we have Goonies. Shinless. Yeah, yeah. Ready Let's... Player One. Oh. You're you're lying to me. You're memeing. I know it. Kick Crystal Skull. Stop. Stop it, every. The, the, it was it, genuine it answers, and now it's no, meme uh, answers. There were no. I. Uh, there were no. Um. A lot of the choices are the ones because of. He did. Did he direct Super Eight? I thought that was J.J. Abrams. I thought it was J.J. Abrams as well. Yeah, I think he produced it. Maybe. Um, J.J. Abrams was the director. I've seen a couple of different ones though. Someone said West Side Story, which was the recent one. Munich. Um, he did Lincoln, right? I need to see that. I think film. so. Yeah. Um, Vampire um, Slayer. Uh, yes, the Vampire Slayer. No, no. Yeah. I think they came out around about the same time though. Actually. Um. um. And Some then, people yeah. are asking about the post credit scene. Yeah, you do go back to the freezer and the Velociraptor who's trapped in there says, I'll get you, Alan Grant. I'll get you. <laughs> and then it says Velociraptor will return. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> well, you have, it's it's a post credit scene where you have Nick Fury opening up the freezer and telling the <laughs> raptor that he's assembling a team of uh, <laughs> You're part people. of a bigger universe. <laughs> he hasn't got his arm. <laughs> <laughs> And the, and the Velociraptor says, Rah! "Yeah," that's... which we can only assume means yes. Of course, I don't see how. It could yes, be anything else. anyone wants movies. to get into the MCU, you know, you'll get your own movie, maybe in a TV show. Paychecks, man. This is one of the best films of all time. It really is. <laughs> uh, I'm happy to call it a masterpiece, yeah. though it implies this is Spielberg's masterpiece, as though it w there wouldn't be any others. And it's like, no, he has a few. He's got a few. <laughs> He's got a few. He's got a few. <laughs> Um, and yeah, the, uh, hopefully we've made clear over these hours, uh, why we believe this script wise is, it is punchy as fuck. It is, uh, very efficient, very clear cut characters that all behave within their, uh, limits and values. A plot line that as much as it has a couple of stretches, it really relies on them to generate what it believes to be obviously a really potent story. Like, uh, the exchange rate, I would say, for flaws to the power of this script is a very, very good one compared to mm -hmm. something like a modern MCU film where it's just nothing but contrivances for payoffs that you're confused about. Like, like think of MODOK as a payoff. You're like, what was that? <laughs> like, I don't even... <laughs> Yeah, and um, and of course, bearing in mind that this is a this has got a lot of variables. You know, it's a science fiction story. Like, it's got a lot of variables that need to be juggled, um, and it does so very effectively. Well, would... and we have a bunch of very well defined characters, all representing different perspectives on a core theme that's very interesting, and it's just a really entertaining and engaging story as well. It's a fun movie. That's what I mean. Uh, I think as a kid, I would have been able to talk forever about how cool it is that these dinosaurs were like you know, trapped animals, and then they, through accident, get released, and they get to take control of the island almost, and, like, how much, uh, you know, be careful next time, like a, like a more straightforward and simplistic view, but the older I get, the more I end up talking extensively about all of the thematic through lines, like, what does this say about technology and how we understand and control it as it develops, and, of course, what does it mean overall to say man versus nature, what are those categories, and where do they lead, and how careful should we be? We often consider ourselves in a prime position to control and manipulate nature, but there's always so many drawbacks, and I love media that explores it. It's really fun to draw the line, so to speak. Um, yeah, and, and and dinosaurs are fucking cool. Yep. This is, I don't know. This has been the goat dinosaur movie forever, and I th it still is, right? Nothing's beaten it. Probably will stay that way forever. I can't see anything beating it. Like people are talking about that movie, uh, sixty five has dinosaurs in it, but like, it ain't gonna be able to compare, nah, is on. it? <laughs> it's... Probably not. Who's yeah. directing it? I have no idea. 
It is uh, Scott Beck and Brian Woods. Well, the Rotten yeah. Tomatoes is um, 36% from critics, 66% from audiences. They uh, wrote the screenplay for A Quiet Place. Oh. Oh. After a catastrophic a crash on an unknown planet, Pilot Mills quickly discovers he's actually stranded on Earth 65 million years ago. Now with only one chance at rescue, Mills and the only other survivor, Koa, must, must make their way across an unknown terrain riddled with dangerous prehistoric creatures in an epic fight to survive. It's an hour and 33 it's minutes. By, uh, well, it's produced by Sam Raimi. Hope is good. Uh, hope is good, but I don't know. I mean, yeah, um, I don't know. I was almost going to say there's just not much in the dinosaur genre, uh, if one was to count it. Of course, they'd probably be able to make a big list, but I guess I mean in ratio to just everything that gets made. You don't often hear about a movie that's got dinosaurs in it. It's always Jurassic as a you know franchise. Not and it's scenes. interesting to uh, see how uh, it's translated to video games and other media as well, because there's a good amount of Jurassic Park games. Yeah. And uh, I, well, I very much enjoyed the Jurassic World Evolution game, even though that is a lesser version of games that have come before a lot of the park management games that have come out over the years. What about that movie 10,000 BC? Did that have dinosaurs? Or was this uh, like later? I, was this like uh, an Ice Age sort of thing? 10,000, there were no dinosaurs in 10,000 BC. We're separated I know, yeah, like in real life. Million well, I was actually going to well, say... Well, in real life, I meant the movie. To be like fair, the movie might have had it. it. Isn't it? Who, who made that 10, movie? 10,000 BC, that was Roland Emmerich. I could believe he oh. put dinosaurs in there if he wanted. <laughs> yeah. It oh, let me check, the, let me check the Rotten Tomatoes of it. Oh my goodness, 9% from critics, 37% from audiences. There's a big oh, crab in it, apparently, Rags. A big crab? Whoa, a giant a big enemy crab. crab? I'd say so. A giant enemy crab. Yeah. Oh, let me Does it have... Oh my god, are we, gonna... are we allowed that ancient... <laughs> that ancient meme? What a crab. terrible press conference. <laughs> 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 oh my god. Why did he do that? <laughs> um... Really good movie. Yes. Um, 10,000 BC? Sure. No. Yep. No. Jurassic Sorry. Park. Thanks. Great movie. Thanks, Please everyone. don't make any more. Stop it. We're well, coming and, uh, to the EFAP on 10,000 BC by Rowan Emmerich. King Kong movie. Get your Long Kong on. Maybe one day. Well, I was going to say, uh, <laughs> hopefully, this format has some level of interest slash approval. Maybe we'll try and uh, do this every once in a while for different... Delving into movies. older movies, yeah. And not just good movies, but the greats, I think we'll try and save it for, maybe. Cause That'd be nice. Cause we do a lot I mean, of shitting on a lot of bad stuff, so maybe it'd be nice to go for, like, some of the best of the best. When it's nice, this, uh, yeah, this this week was a bit of a, a lull, right? No major new releases that were super interested in looking well, at. It's like, hmm, so we've, go back and watch an old great movie, you know? We have uh, played with the idea of the Jurassic per arc so to speak and so a lot of people i think when this stream booted up were like oh my god we're beginning the arc and it's like actually there's no plans to do all of them now following we've got other stuff no the idea uh, was uh jurassic park specifically but that doesn't mean that you won't get coverage of the rest in future in some format of some kind i'm mm -hmm. i'm invested in the idea that we do eventually check out dominion um <laughs> apparently that's do a good old to? clown movie so i'm sure it'll be fun oh. okay Fingers crossed. No promises. But, uh, you know, I I am interested in perhaps one day, who knows, uh, doing maybe a, a video on on one of the... Or maybe something to do with this. It's such a fascinating franchise. Um, yes, it is, in to, a sense. We talked about it, well, like seven hours ago or whatever, but uh, the, the dramatic missing of everything that was said in this film uh, and how it's, it's foreshadowed its own future in so many ways. As well as the future of the film industry. Mm. Um, they ain't making them like they used to we've talked to this many times but when I was younger and I was seeing shit tons of movies like this I was just like good god imagine how good movies are going to be with the future something went wrong yeah something went wrong and um hey like uh Spielberg recently put out the Fablemans right has anyone got any word on whether or not that's good I've never even heard of it that's a that's a problem for it it's uh I think suffered at the box office and uh, 
you know, it's just something of a concern that you can't be successful as a, a movie that's not of a franchise or um, a superhero at this point. But, uh, you know, Fablemans doesn't sound like something that people were going to be super engaged with anyway, necessarily, like in a super mainstream. But I don't know if it's any good. Fablemans the is Fablemans. Mad. There's a um, giant crayfish in it. I don't know if that's uh, true. 92% from critics, 83% from audiences, so... No, looks like it's well-liked. I've just never heard of it. Well, with that, I suppose that is the... Uh, we've reached the, the end of this stream, this, uh, this coverage. We will definitely do the Super Chats in a catch-up. I'm gonna... I was actually gonna do them today, but not if we'd reach seven hours uh, before reaching the, the conclusion of this portion, so... Um, they're still getting released. It's it's awkward to figure out where I'm putting them when we've got the two EFAP TV episodes coming out side by side. And the funny thing, of course, is by the time The Last of Us ends, which last episode we're watching tomorrow. Tomorrow, <gasps> yeah. Uh, it'll be replaced in two days by the release of the first episode of Gotham Knights. It's going to be a bit of a change. Um... So yeah, uh, uh, they shall be gotten to, and I've I've noted um, something annoying that YouTube does, and uh, I didn't realize it until recently. They get rid of the um, the messages sent in with uh, re membership or membership in general. You can't find them when you go into your supers. It's really fucking dumb if they offer you the chance to send a message through that, and then you can't retrieve it if it's gone. And so what I'll have to do when we're doing the catch up is boot up this episode and look through the literal live chat as it comes through collect the uh the messages not something i prefer to have to do but it's not like it's given me much of a choice and i don't know why but youtube uh hasn't fixed that uh maybe there's another format in which you can read them i will go have a look but that seems incredibly fucking stupid um it's really difficult to collect the messages at that point but i will find a way like i said um so yeah that's uh is there anything you guys wanted to say before we head out Hmm. I was very... It was really good to watch this again. Yes. It gives you a lot of appreciation for movies that, you know, like, you know some movies are good, and then you watch them again, and then you just get this, like, oh, of course not. It, it really is good for all of these reasons, and it was really nice to see that. It wasn't just an enjoyable thing to watch, but it's now something that's a lot more fresh in my memory, full of things to reference, and... It's just like the go-to example of how do you blend CGI and practical stuff together. It's, I mean, it's up there with Lord of the Rings as to how you do that well. Oh, yeah. I, I'd happily consider alongside that. T2 is another one of them. It's like these films yeah, that yeah. come from a magical land that doesn't exist anymore. A magical land where people <laughs> gave a shit. <laughs> you couldn't have chosen yeah, a better I'm, time I'm to say that, Rags, shit. with the guy on the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> well, he didn't give a shit. That's he did not give a shit. He was there yeah. to hide, not to poo. I'm very glad to have rewatched it. It was a uh, yeah. I love this movie. <laughs> Thumbs up. Go watch Jurassic Park. Uh, yeah. Don't watch the rest. <laughs> You're all right. No, you really don't need to be doing that. And um, yeah. So uh, thank you, of course, to Robert Meyer Burnett for joining us for a um, vast chunk of the stream. Um, you may see him on, like I said, Open Bar and Real BBC. I, I can't remember if he's been on Real BBC before, but. Um, he's 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 around on the internet. If you want to find out his stuff, the channel link is in the description. And he's um, he's been on a couple of open bars at least. Um, always nice to have new blood. And uh, yeah, appreciate his time and appreciate all of you guys hanging out with us. Thanks for the comments, the back and forth, the insight, and for the kind donations. But for now, we shall say good night and goodbye. Little pip. Bye, 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 everybody.